The Elements of Memology by William Rushenberger. Lesson 1. Memology, the Natural History of Mammiferous Animals. Lesson 1. Classification of the Animal Kingdom. Comparison of Animals. Their Division into Four Branches. Characteristics of Each of These Branches. And Division of the Vertebrata into Four Classes. Of Classification in General. As we have seen when considering the subject of physiology and animal mechanism, the natural history of animals is termed zoology. For the convenience of study, zoology has been divided into several branches, the highest of which is termed mammology. This embraces the study of the natural history of all mammiferous animals, man included, and is to engage our attention at present. The number of different animals inhabiting the surface of the globe is so great that in order to study them with ease, it is necessary to establish amongst them divisions and subdivisions. Each of the groups thus formed should be characterized in such a manner as to enable us always to recognize with certainty the individuals which belong to it and the group should be designated by a particular name. The assemblage of these divisions and subdivisions constitutes what is called a classification. In the classification of animals, the name species is applied to an assemblage of individuals which bear a strong resemblance to each other, and which are perpetuated with the same essential qualities. Thus man, the dog, the horse constitute, to the eye of the zoologist, so many distinct species. Sometimes one species differs considerably from all the others, but in general there is a number of them, greater or less, which very much resemble each other, being distinguished only by some unimportant differences. The horse and the ass, the dog and the wolf are examples. In the natural classifications, the species which resemble each other we unite into groups, called genera and add to their peculiar or specific name a generic name which is common to them. Thus we say to designate the different species of bears, Ursus arctos, the brown bear of Europe, Ursus americanus, the North American black bear, Ursus maritimus, the polar bear, etc., and Lacerda agilis, Lacerda ocelata, Lacertus viridus, etc., to designate the various species of the genus Lacerda, or lizard. Each animal has, as is seen above, two names which may be compared to the family and baptismal names of men, with the difference that they are inverted in the order in which they are placed. The name of the genus always precedes the name of the species. Those genera which resemble each other most are united into tribes, and the tribes into families. The families are distributed on the same principle into groups of a higher rank to which the name of order is applied. Finally, the orders are in turn united into classes, and the classes themselves are the divisions of the great branches of which the animal kingdom is composed. Thus, to class the various animals, the animal kingdom is divided into branches, the branches into classes, the classes into orders, the orders into families, the families into tribes, the tribes into genera, the genera into species, which designate assemblages of individuals. The following table shows still better the manner in which the animal kingdom is divided into groups, which in turn are subdivided farther and farther, until all the individuals belonging to the different species are separated from each other. Each one of these divisions and subdivisions of the animal kingdom has a particular name. For example, one of the branches is called the branch of the vertebrata, or vertebrated animals. Another, the branch of the molluscous animals, or mollusca, etc. The first of these branches is divided into many classes, one of which is known as the class of birds, another the class of reptiles, etc. To enable the naturalist to know whether the animal which he studies belongs to this or that branch or family, etc., it is necessary that each of the divisions and subdivisions under consideration should be established by characters, easily recognized, and derived from the conformation of the animals themselves. 
Therefore, each branch, each class, each family, etc., should comprise all animals which possess certain peculiarities of organization, which are not found in animals belonging to other branches or other divisions. The branch of vertebrated animals, for example, comprises every animal whose body is sustained by an internal skeleton. The class of fishes comprises all vertebrated animals, which, in place of lungs, have bronchiae. To know whether an animal belongs to a branch of vertebrata, it is sufficient to examine whether it has an internal skeleton, and this character, once ascertained, it cannot possibly be confounded with any animal belonging to the other branches. To know whether a vertebrated animal belongs to the class of fishes or to another class, we must ascertain whether it be provided with bronchiae or lungs. To illustrate the utility of classification, a few examples will suffice. If one would, without resorting to some such means, ascertain the name of an animal that he had killed in the chase, it would be necessary to compare it with a detailed description of all other animals. For if, even when at the very beginning of this inquiry, we should meet with a description which seemed to correspond to the object in question, we could not be sure, until we had run over all the other descriptions, that we should not find one still more exactly applicable to this being. The labor would be, consequently, almost interminable. But if we employ the method of classification, we shall arrive almost at once, and without difficulty, at the end of our search. I will suppose that the animal in question is an eagle. I find at first that it has a skeleton, and hence I know that it belongs to the branch of vertebrata, and it is not necessary to compare it with the animals of other branches. I next look for the characters which distinguish the different classes of vertebrata from each other, and when it is determined in this way that it is an animal of the class of birds, I exclude from the comparison which remains yet to be made all the mammalia, all the reptiles, and all the fishes. I next inquire whether it presents the characters proper to this or that order of the class of birds, this or that family, and when I have ascertained the genus to which it belongs, I have only to compare it with a very small number of animals, from which it differs only in some few not very important particulars. The use of classification permits the abbreviation, to a considerable extent, of the description otherwise necessary to make another recognize any particular animal. For if we say an animal is a vertebrata of the class of reptiles, of the order of sauria, of the family of crocodiles, it requires, in order to distinguish it, only to point out the characters by which it differs, from a very small number of other animals which possess in common with it characters peculiar to the order and family of which it also forms a part. There exists here the same difference as would be found in seeking, by his description and number, a soldier in an army in which all the ranks were mingled, or in a well-regulated army where each division, each brigade, each regiment, each battalion, each company, would be found in the place belonging to them, and carrying with them their distinctive signs. By the assistance of zoological classification, we are enabled to assign to an animal the name which belongs to it, in the same manner as we are enabled to find a person we seek by knowing the direction of his residence. In the latter case, we first inquire his country, then the state, the county, the town, the street, the house, and finally the room in which he dwells. And in the first case, we ask to what grand division of the animal kingdom does the species under consideration belong? then to what class, what order, what family, and to what genus it must be assigned. These questions being solved, the work is almost finished. As we have seen, it is by the differences existing between animals that we are enabled to classify them, and to distinguish them with certainty. But in order that a classification may be as useful as possible, it must serve to point out the resemblances, greater or less, which are remarked amongst them. Also, in the classification called the natural methods or orders, the only really good ones, the characters upon which the divisions and subdivisions of the animal kingdom are based, are selected in such a manner that each group includes only such species as resemble each other the more in proportion, as this group itself is of a less elevated rank in the classification.
The animals of the same genus, for example, will differ much less from each other than those of two genera of the same family, and these latter will resemble each other much more than those belonging to different orders, and in a still stronger degree than those of different classes. The natural classification is, in a manner, a synoptical view of all the variations met within the organization of animals, and in knowing the place which any animal occupies in such a method or classification, we know by it alone the most remarkable features of its organization, and the manner in which its most important functions are performed, that is to say, the most important part of its history, because its habits are always correspondent with its conformation. Division of the Animal Kingdom into Branches in ranging animals according to their different degrees of resemblance, and according to the differences more or less considerable which distinguish them, we first remark that there exists in the animal kingdom four principal types according to which nature seems to have constructed all these beings. They are divided into four great divisions or branches, namely, Animalia vertebrata, vertebrated animals, Animalia mollusca, molluscous animals, Animalia articulata, articulated animals, Animalia radiata, radiated or rayed animals, or zoophytes. The following table presents the principal characters which distinguish these great divisions of the animal kingdom. First branch of the animal kingdom, Animalia vertebrata. General characters of vertebrated animals. The vertebrated animals are, of all animated beings, those whose faculties are most various and most perfect, whose organs are most numerous and most complicated. The existence of a solid frame in the interior of the body enables them to attain a size which the articulated animals, mollusca and zoophytes, never reach, and this skeleton, all the parts which are united one to the other so as to allow of motion, gives their movements a precision and a vigor which are rarely seen in other animals. The portion of the skeleton which is never wanting, which varies least, and which is, at the same time, the most important part of all, is the bony stem that encloses the encephalon, and which is formed by the cranium and vertebral column. The external senses are always five in number, and the organs which are the seat of them, present with slight variation, the same disposition as in man. The apparatus of digestion in this great division of the animal kingdom offers but very slight differences. The blood is always red and circulates in vessels called arteries and veins. It is always set in motion by a fleshy heart, but the conformation of this last organ, as well as the root of the blood in the circulatory system, varies in the different classes of this branch. Respiration always takes place in an apparatus situated in an internal cavity of the body, but it is not always aerial as in man, it is sometimes aquatic, and then the lungs are replaced by bronchiae. Division of the branch of the vertebrated animals into classes. Nature seems to have followed the same general plan in the creation of all vertebrated animals but nevertheless these beings differ from each other and some of the differences which they present are of great importance in the exercise of life therefore that the classification of the vertebrated animals may be in a manner a picture of the modification of their organization it becomes necessary to establish amongst them four grand divisions called classes which are named as follows mammalia birds reptiles fishes the following table presents at a view the principal characters of these classes. End of Lesson 1 Lesson 2 Lesson 2 Mammalia Peculiarities of Organization of Animals of this Class Division into Orders Class of Mammalia General Characters of the Mammalia the class of mammalia is composed of man and all animals which resemble him in the most important parts of their organization. This class is naturally placed at the head of the animal kingdom, 
as comprising those beings whose movements are most varied, whose sensations are most delicate, faculties most numerous, and intelligence most developed. It interests us more than any other class because it includes the most useful animals, either in affording us nourishment, assisting in our labors, or contributing towards our manufactures. The mammalia are born alive, and in the early period of life are nourished by the mother with milk, which is formed in glands called mammae, or teats. Animals of this class alone are provided with these organs, and for this reason they are called mammalia, or mammiferous animals. Circulation and respiration are carried on in the same manner as in man. In all the mammalia the blood is warm. The heart has four distinct cavities, two ventricles and two auricles. The lungs are always composed of a great number of very small cells, and do not permit the air to pass from them into different parts of the body, as is the case in birds. In general, it is easy to distinguish at first sight one of the mammalia from a bird, a reptile, a fish, or any other animal, by simply considering its external form, and the nature of its integuments. The mammalia are in fact the only animals whose bodies are covered with hair. Ordinarily, their general form does not widely differ from that of the quadrupeds, which are constantly before our eyes, and which we naturally take as the type of the group. But sometimes they are not recognized by so superficial an examination, for there are some whose skins are completely bare, and whose bodies, instead of resembling that of a horse, a dog, or any other one of the ordinary mammalia, possess forms proper to fishes, the dolphin and the whale are examples of this kind. The hairs of the mammalia are very analogous to the feathers of birds, and serve in the same manner to protect the skin and preserve the heat developed in the interior of the body. In reptiles, fishes, and other cold-blooded animals which do not manifestly produce internal heat, there does not exist any similar envelope. The hairs are produced like the teeth, by small secreting organs lodged in the thickness of the derma, or immediately beneath it. Each hair is formed in a little pouch or bulb, which communicates externally by a narrow opening. They grow like the teeth at the base, or new matter is added beneath that which is already formed. On examining the hairs with a microscope, we sometimes perceive very distinctly that they are formed of a number of little horns received one into the other like a nest of boxes but in general they have the appearance of a simple horny tube the interior of which seems to be filled with a pulpy matter with most animals they are cylindrical and larger at the base than at the summit they are often more or less flattened there are some which are lamellar and similar to a slip of grass Sometimes their surface seems to be perfectly smooth, at others channeled or armed with slight asperities, or even presenting a necklace-like, maniliform aspect. Finally, their size, form, and elasticity vary very much in different animals and in the different hairs of the same individual. The names by which the different varieties of hairs are distinguished differ according to the nature of these horny filaments and according to the parts whereon they grow. They are called quills or spines when they are very thick, pointed, and stiff, and when they resemble thorns, as in the porcupine, bristles, when not so thick and less resisting, but still very stiff, except towards their extremities. Hairs do not differ much from bristles, except in being somewhat longer and not so thick. Like bristles, they are generally straight, though they are sometimes curly, particularly when very long. Wool is a species of long hair, very fine, and contorted in every direction. And down, or fur, is composed of hairs of extreme fineness and softness, and is generally found beneath a layer or covering of stouter hairs. All the mammalia, except the cetacea, that is, dolphins, porpoises, and etc., have two pairs of extremities or members namely one pair of thoracic or anterior or upper extremities and one pair of posterior inferior or abdominal extremities but in the cetacea this latter pair is absent and consequently there only exists the thoracic members 
The structure of all these animals is nearly the same as that of man, and the differences observed principally depend upon the relative length of the different bones, and the number of fingers, which never exceeds five. The conformation of the extremities varies somewhat according to the uses for which they are designed. They may serve for walking, leaping, etc., for prehension and touch, for burrowing in the earth, for swimming, and for flying. And when they are best adapted to the performance of one of these functions, they are, in a very slight degree, or not at all, suited to the others. When the extremities are designed only to sustain the body and to move it over the surface of the ground, they should possess great solidity, and be at the same time slender towards the end, that they may be the lighter. Now, long and flexible fingers or toes would be injurious to this solidity, and a considerable number of these organs would augment the weight of the foot without any advantage. Therefore, with those animals whose four feet only serve them in moving, walking or running, the fingers or toes are generally but two or three in number, short, slightly flexible, and completely enveloped at their extremity by nails which protect them. When the extremities are designed chiefly for touch and the prehension of objects, it is altogether different. They are then very flexible and terminated by five fingers which are long, well separated from each other, and so movable that one of them, at will, can change position and apply itself against the others. Like a pair of pliers or pincers, the nail is in this case flat and only covers the back of the end of the fingers the lower surface of which resembles a soft cushion, and the whole hand can move upon the forearm, to direct itself inwardly or outwardly, as occasion may require. The hooves of the horse may be taken as an example of the mode of conformation of extremities, which are designed only for moving the animals, and the hand of man as an example of the conformation of these same organs when they are designed for prehension and touch. But between these extremities there are a great many intermediate degrees, and with a great many of mammalia, the paws serve at once the purposes of progression, prehension, and touch, and discharge best either one or other of these functions, according as their conformation most approaches to one or the other of the two modes of structure just spoken of. The mammalia that climb best generally have paws more or less like our hand, and suited for seizing hold of objects. There are some, however, that by the assistance of very sharp nails can climb trees simply by grappling them, although their fingers are neither long, very flexible, nor opposable one to the other. Most animals of this kind have a long tail which serves them as a balance pole, and sometimes this organ is so flexible as to be twisted around branches and take the place of a species of hand. Differences are also observed in the conformation of the extremities, according as the animal is designed to run or leap. In the latter case, the posterior extremities are generally much longer than the anterior. For example, the rabbit and particularly the kangaroo. When the paws are to be used by the animal for burrowing in the earth, they are short, which gives them greater strength, stout of a particular form, and armed with strong nails. Of all the mammalia, the thoracic extremities of the mole possesses the best conformation for this purpose. In order that the extremities be formed in the most favorable manner for swimming, they must be short and broad so as to strike the water with the greater force and act upon a large surface. With those mammalia whose lives are entirely aquatic, these organs are formed like great battle doors closely resembling the fins of fishes. The arm and forearm become so short that the paw seems to be attached immediately to the body, and the fingers are all concealed beneath a common skin. When an animal has to make use of these fins to drag itself on shore, their conformation approaches nearer to that of the paw of an ordinary quadruped, and when the extremities are to be chiefly used in running, without ceasing to be appropriate for swimming, the fingers, toes, are simply united by a loose fold of skin, called web, which is stretched when they are separated, and thus affords the requisite breadth to the paw. 
when the extremities of the mammalia are formed for flying they also present a peculiar disposition the thoracic extremities become very long and the fingers especially are elongated out of proportion and sustain a fold of skin from the sides as the whale bones of an umbrella stretch the silk or cloth bats afford us an example of this kind of organization their hands are in a manner transformed into true wings there are too some mammalia having extremities formed for running or for climbing solely that can also sustain themselves for a short time in the air by the assistance of a fold of skin which extends between the posterior and anterior paws constituting a sort of parachute but this mode of organization does not give them the power of actually flying like those above described of all animals the mammalia have the most intelligence and they also possess the most voluminous brains but in this respect they present very striking differences amongst themselves and it is generally remarked they are less favored in this particular in proportion as they depart in resemblance from man as their forehead is more retreating and the face or snout more projecting there also exists very great differences among the mammalia as respects their teeth and as the conformation of these organs is always in relation to the kind of food upon which the animal is destined to feed we will say a few more words about them some mammalia that feed upon soft insects as ants or on very small fishes which they can swallow whole are destitute of teeth but almost all animals of this class possess teeth designed for the division of food the molar teeth are generally the most useful and their presence is more constant than that of the incisor or canine teeth the latter are necessary to seize and divide a living prey and consequently are not wanting in any carnivorous animal but they are less useful to herbivorous animals and the one or the other kind is absent in most mammalia that live upon vegetable diet sometimes too they afford no assistance in mastication though very much developed and constitute a more or less powerful means of defense the form of the molar teeth varies according to the food of the animal in those animals that live upon flesh the molars are compressed and cutting and so arranged as to act one against the other like the blades of a pair of scissors in those which feed upon insects these teeth are studded with contiguous points which correspond in a manner and are received into the vacuities left between them on the opposing teeth and when the food of the animal consists principally of the tender fruits these teeth are simply armed with blunt tubercles and when destined to grind vegetable substances which are more or less hard they are terminated by a broad surface flattened and rough like that of a millstone division of the class of mammalia into orders the class of mammalia is divided into nine orders which are easily distinguished one from the other by the differences observable in the conformation of their extremities of their teeth and some other organs the chief characteristics of these groups are indicated in the following synoptical table of the classification of the mammalia end of lesson two lesson three order of bimena the only species man anatomical characters which distinguish the body of man from that of the other mammalia hands feet station brain human races order of bimena the order of bimena two-handed easily distinguished from the rest of the class of mammalia by the existence of hands on the thoracic extremities only and by many other anatomical characters is composed of but one genus embracing one species only man homo our organization differs very little from that of a great number of other mammalia the functions of the life of nutrition are carried on in the same manner in them as with us and the structure of the organs of our senses presents only a few peculiarities but still man is placed at an immense distance from all other animals and what especially distinguishes him is that wonderful intelligence with which he is endowed and the possession of an immortal soul 
the principal physical differences which distinguish man are one the great development of his brain which produces the prominence of his forehead two the conformation of his hands the thoracic extremities of man are disposed in the most favorable manner for the exercise of their functions as organs of prehension and touch the fingers are long and flexible they all have the power of moving separately and distinctly one from the other which is not the case in other animals not even with those that possess hands the thumb which is opposable to them is much longer in proportion than in monkeys and consequently more readily applied to the extremity of the palmar face of the other fingers and better enabled to take hold of small objects the nails only cover the dorsal faces of the extremities of the fingers and they are wide and flat thus affording a support to the touch without in the least interfering with its delicacy finally the whole hand is capable of performing extensive rotatory movements three his vertical and biped position in all the mammalia with the exception of men the superior anterior extremities are applied to the same uses as the lower or posterior extremities and are always employed in locomotion even when they are formed so as to be used also as organs of prehension in man on the contrary the lower extremities serve exclusively for station the art of standing and for locomotion while the superior extremities remain free to act as the organs or instruments of prehension and of touch a difference in itself sufficient to render them fit to discharge their function with a degree of perfection far above anything seen in the monkey tribes and other mammalia the vertical position which under every circumstance is so very favorable to man which has been considered by some authors as not being natural to him and as being solely the effect of education but this is an error even if he should wish to do so man could not habitually walk on his four extremities of all the mammalia the lower extremities of man are most favorably formed for sustaining the body and everything in his whole organization is disposed for the vertical position the foot is very large and so fashioned as to rest nearly the whole of its lower surface upon the ground the different bones of which it is formed are solidly united one to the other and the leg rests vertically upon it the heel projects considerably behind this articulation the knee can be completely extended so that the weight of the body is transmitted directly from the femur to the tibia the muscles which extend the foot and the thigh are remarkable for their volume and strength the pelvis is much larger than in other animals which by separating the legs and feet from each other increases the extent of the base of support finally the head is nearly balanced on the trunk because its articulation is placed beneath the centre of its mass and the eyes are directed forward precisely in the direction to be most useful to him the horizontal position on the contrary would be extremely inconvenient for man for then his hind feet short and almost inflexible and his very short thigh would bring his knee against the earth while his anterior superior extremities would be too flexible and too widely separated to afford him a solid support the position of the head its weight and the absence of a cervical ligament which in quadrupeds serves to sustain this part of the body would not permit him to keep it elevated and his eyes being directed downwards to the ground he would not be able to see before him but this position would not be one of restraint only it would be impossible to maintain it for any length of time because the arteries which go to the brain are not subdivided in man as they are in many quadrupeds and their size being very considerable the blood would be carried to this delicate organ with so much force that apoplexy would frequently result man is the only one of the mammalia that is truly bimana and biped two-handed and two-footed the monkey which resembles him in many respects has the superior extremities disposed like his but the foot is very different 
it is strictly a true hand fitted for seizing and climbing while our foot can in no manner serve as an organ of prehension because the toes have but little flexibility and the great toe answering to the thumb is larger than the other toes which correspond to the fingers of the hand and being placed upon the same line is not opposable to them four the perfection of his vocal apparatus he is the only animal of this class that can articulate sounds and it is to this faculty that he is indebted for language but man who is so much favored in regard to his intelligence and skill has not the advantage as regards strength his swiftness in the race is much less than that of animals of his stature and nature has not endowed him with arms either for defense or attack the greater part of his body is unprotected even by hair from the inclemencies of the weather and he is of all animals the longest in acquiring the strength necessary to enable him to supply his own wants if god had not given to man a social instinct a love for society and the powerful intelligence which distinguishes him he would have been one of the most miserable beings that inhabit the surface of the earth and probably his race would have soon disappeared but this instinctive impulse joined to a sense of his weakness has brought him to living in society with his fellow men and now his intellectual faculties have enabled him to derive something from all that surrounds him towards ensuring his subsistence and happiness the detail into which we entered relative to the structure of man in treating on physiology and anatomy in the first of this series see physiology and animal mechanism renders it unnecessary to speak of his organization in this place the human race in the human race as we have said there is but a single species nevertheless all men are far from being alike and the principal differences which they present are transmitted uninterruptedly from generation to generation so that we must admit into this single species several very distinctly marked varieties the people who inhabit the old world appear to belong to three principal varieties designated by naturalists under the names of caucasian race mongolian race and ethiopian race the caucasian variety is distinguished by the beauty of the oval formed by the head by the development of the forehead the horizontal position of the eyes the slight projection of the cheekbones and jaws the smooth hair and white or at least white-ish color of the skin it is also remarkable for its perfectibility for it has given origin to all the most civilized people on earth it occupies all europe the western part of asia and the most northern part of africa but it is believed to have come first from the mountains of caucasia situated between the caspian and black seas and for this reason it has been called caucasian the mongolian variety differs in many respects from the caucasian variety here the face is flattened the forehead low retreating and square the cheekbones projecting the eyes narrow and oblique the chin slightly projecting the beard thin the hair straight and black and the skin of an olive color the languages proper to the mongolian races possess characteristics common to them all which clearly separate them from people of caucasian origin the words of which the mongolian languages are composed are all monosyllabic this variety of the human race is found to the east of those regions which are inhabited by the caucasian races we first meet them in the great desert of central asia where are found the kalmuk and other mongolian tribes that are still wanderers almost all the tribes of the eastern part of siberia belong to them but the most remarkable nation composed of men of this race is the chinese whose vast empire claims to have been civilized before the rest of the world korea japan the marian isles the carolan isles and all other lands which extend to the north of the equator from the first named of these archipelagos to about the one hundred eightieth degree of east longitude are also peopled by the mongolian races also the inhabitants of the aleutian islands and of the neighboring part of the west coast of america 
belong to this great division of the human species. The Malays, who occupy India beyond the Ganges and a great part of the Asiatic archipelago, constitute, according to some naturalists, a variety distinct from the Mongolian and Caucasian, but most authors regard them as the offspring of the two races. Finally, the Mongolian races appear to spread through the northern region of the two hemispheres, for all the mixed or mongrel tribes met with from North Cape in Europe to Greenland, who are known under the name of Laplanders, Samoids, Eskimo, etc., bear a strong resemblance to them. A third and very distinct branch of the human race is the Ethiopian or Negro variety, characterized by the compressed skull, the flattened nose, the projecting muzzle, thick lips, crisped hair, and skin more or less black. It is confined to the south of Mount Atlas, and appears to be composed of several very distinct races or tribes, such as the Mozambique, the Bochisman, and Hottentot. The primitive population of Australia and of the numerous archipelagos of Oceania or Polynesia is also a black race, which bears a considerable resemblance to the Negroes of Mozambique, but their hair, although coarse, is straight, of the barbarous and miserable people to whom the name of Alforians or Alfors has been given, we have very little knowledge. Finally, the Aborigines of America are regarded by some naturalists as belonging to neither of the three varieties of the human race inhabiting the Old World. Some bear a strong resemblance to the Mongolian races of Asia, others, on the contrary, approach somewhat to the European form. The American race, according to Professor Morton, the highest authority on this subject, is marked by a brown complexion, long, black, lank hair, and deficient beard. The eyes are black and deep-set, the brow low, the cheekbones high, the nose large and aquiline, the mouth large and the lips tumid and compressed. The skull is small, wide between the parietal protuberances, prominent at the vertex and flat on the occiput. In their mental character, the Americans are averse to cultivation and slow in acquiring knowledge, restless, vengeful, and fond of war, and wholly destitute of maritime adventure. Crania Americana The American race is divided into two families, the American family, the Toltecan family. For the type of this race, see frontispiece. End of lesson three. Lesson 4. Order of Quadrumana. Zoological Characters. Peculiarities of their organization compared to their habits. Division into three families. Their zoological characters. Family of monkeys. Division into monkeys of the old and new continent. Description and habits of the principal genera. Orangs, gibbous, gunons, magos, cynocephalus. Howling Monkey Family of Wistites Manners Family of Mackies Description and Habits Order of the Quadrumana The order of Quadrumana is composed of a considerable number of animals which resemble man more than any other of the mammalia, and which are chiefly characterized by their having both the thoracic and abdominal extremities terminated by hands. Like the bimana, the quadrumana have incisor, canine, and molar teeth. Their eyes are directed forward, or at least obliquely, and their mammae are situated on the chest. We may also add that their brain resembles that of man very much, and each hemisphere consists of three lobes, the posterior, of which covers the cerebellum, and their abdominal viscera scarcely differ from ours. The order of quadrumana is divided into three families, Monkeys, Wistites, and Mackies. The following table exhibits a synopsis of the most prominent distinctive characters of these three groups. Monkeys have four incisor teeth in each jaw placed very nearly in a vertical position, and flat nails on all the fingers. Wistites have four incisor teeth in each jaw placed very nearly in a vertical position, and nails compressed, arched, and pointed like claws on all the fingers except the posterior thumbs or great toes. 
Mackies have the incisor teeth more numerous than the monkey or Westides, or at least differently disposed. Nails flat except that of the first, or of the two first fingers or toes posteriorly, which is pointed and raised. Monkey family, simia. Monkeys are animals of middle or small stature, whose heads are almost always rounded, the muzzle moderately elongated, the neck short, the body light, and extremities slim. They are covered with long silky hair. Nevertheless, their resemblance to man is very considerable, and there are some which, when very young, have the facial angle not much more oblique than that of negroes, but as they advance in age the muzzle always becomes much more projecting, and with some monkeys this part of the face is so much developed as to resemble that of the dog. The actions and behavior of these animals bear a strong analogy to our own. Many of them assume with ease an almost vertical position, particularly when aided by a stick, as we use a cane, and some walk in this way, but never so firmly as man. On the contrary, they are admirably organized for climbing from branch to branch. The length and flexibility of their limbs, having hands on all four extremities, and the great strength of their muscular system, permit them to display an astonishing agility, and nature has moreover supplied many of these animals with a long prehensile tail, which serves them as a fifth hand, in suspending themselves from branches, to balance themselves in the air, and make their spring when they wish to leap from one tree to another. Monkeys are essentially frugivorous, and their teeth bear a great similitude to those of man. Their molar teeth are tuberculated like ours, but their canine are much longer. Monkeys belong to warm countries. A single species lives wild in Europe, on the rock of Gibraltar, and what is very remarkable, all of those of the New World possess characters which distinguish them from those of the Old Continent. These zoological characteristics, so strictly in harmony with the geographical distribution of monkeys, have caused them to be divided into two tribes, monkeys of the Old World and monkeys of America. They may be distinguished by the following characteristics. Monkeys of the Old Continent have five molars on each side in each jaw, as in man. Almost always possess ischiatic callosities, species of fleshy cushions placed beneath the pelvis, Tail never prehensile. Nares, open beneath the nose and separated by a narrow partition. Cheeks often hollowed into pouches called cheek pouches, which communicate with the mouth and serve as reservoirs of food obtained by the animal. Monkeys of the new continent have six molders on each side and in each jaw. Ischiatic callosities, never present. Tail often prehensile. Nares almost always separated by a broad partition and open at the sides of the nose. Monkeys of the Old Continent These animals are quite numerous, and in their organization seem to form a series which leads by degrees from man to common quadrupeds. The position of their bodies, almost vertical in some, becomes in others entirely horizontal. Their muzzle is elongated, and we remark at the same time their passions become proportionably more and more violent and brutal. The principal genre composing the tribe of monkeys of the Old World may be recognized by the following characters. The orangs are the only monkeys of the Old Continent destitute of ischiatic callosities. The most remarkable species of this genus, the orangutan, which inhabits the interior of Borneo and other large islands of the Indian Ocean, when young, is said to resemble man more than any other animal. The body is covered with coarse reddish hair, and the face is smooth and bluish. He sometimes attains the height of seven feet, and possesses great strength and agility. He dwells in the wildest forests, and habitually keeps himself upon the trees. He climbs with the greatest rapidity, and springs from branch to branch with as much facility and skill as the little monkeys of America, which are often seen in our streets. On the ground, on the contrary, Orangutans walk with difficulty, and are frequently obliged to place their hands upon the earth. We see them using their long arms to raise themselves up, and throw themselves forward, very much as a man would use a pair of crutches. It has been ascertained that these animals build themselves huts in lofty trees. It is very difficult to capture them when they have attained adult age, as they defend themselves in the most courageous manner. But when young, they are easily taken." They then show a good deal of intelligence, attach themselves to those who have care of them, and readily learn to imitate a great many of our actions. 
Another species of the genus Orang is the chimpanzee, which inhabits the interior of Africa and is also named Joko. Its arms are not so long as those of the orangutan, and its forehead is very retreating. Its stature is less than that of man. It lives in troops. The gibbons resemble the orangutans in the length of their arms, but their forehead is very receding. They live in the most distant parts of the continent, and the archipelago of India, and like the orangs, inhabit the densest forests. They are not very susceptible of education, and domesticating them seems to make them lose their faculties. The siamang differs from other gibbons in the manner in which the first phalanges of the second and third toes are united to each other by a membrane. It merits notice from the singularity of its habits. These monkeys live in numerous troops, which seem to be under the direction of chiefs more active and more robust than other individuals of the community. During the day they preserve silence, concealed in the foliage, but at sunrise and sunset they raise the most frightful cries. When on the ground they can scarcely drag themselves along, and they climb slowly and with difficulty. But they possess a vigilance, which is rarely at fault. It is asserted that any sound not understood by them, which is heard even at the distance of a mile, no matter how slight it may be, is sufficient to put them to immediate flight. The Semnopithecus closely resembles the gibbon, and inhabits India. One of these monkeys, called the Entellus, is held in veneration by the Brahmins. The Gunans, commonly known under the name of long-tailed monkeys, inhabit all Africa. They acquire a middle stature, and in leaping from tree to tree display great agility, but they walk very little and with difficulty. The Macacus The macaque resembles ordinary quadrupeds in form, and generally has a short tail. It inhabits the southern parts of Asia. The Mago, Inui of Cuvier, differs from the macaque only in the tail, which is reduced to a mere tubercle. This monkey inhabits Africa, but is found throughout the southern parts of Spain, and has become naturalized on the least accessible parts of the rock of Gibraltar. It is the only animal of the order Quadromana that inhabits Europe. When young, it is easily taught, through fear of chastisement, to perform various tricks, and jugglers avail themselves of this fact, to excite the curiosity of the public. But like the macaque, this monkey is very capricious and deceitful, and when old it becomes mischievous and taciturn. The cynocephalus, or dog-headed monkey, is the most brutal and fierce animal of this family, and next, after the orang and gibbon, it is the largest and strongest. Its extremities are short, and its habitual mode of progression is on all fours. In leaping it displays great agility, and habitually frequents the wildest mountains or wooded coasts. It feeds on fruits and vegetables. And like the gunons, the dog-headed monkeys aid each other in pillaging gardens and cultivated fields. Their strength and ferocity render them dangerous, even to man. They nearly all inhabit Africa. Monkeys of the New Continent The monkeys of the New World are distinguished from those of the Old by the characters which we have already pointed out, but their habits are essentially the same. They inhabit the dense forests of the vast continent, and climb the highest trees with the most surprising agility. They all have a very long tail, which sometimes serves them as a balance pole in maintaining their equilibrium, and some possess the power of wrapping the tail round the objects and seizing them with so much strength that the animal can, in this manner, suspend itself from branches, as it would do with a fifth hand. According to the difference in the conformation of the tail, the monkeys of America are divided into two groups, namely, the sapajous, whose tails are prehensile and for a part of their length without hair, or naked on the inferior surface. The saguans, or sakis, in which the tail is not prehensile and never naked on the inferior surface. The sapajous are more agile than the sakis, and almost always live upon trees. This group is divided into many genera, one of which, designated by the name of saju, or sapaju, properly so called, is recognized by its tail being entirely covered with hair. It is a species of this genus, very common in Guiana and Brazil, which is so frequently brought to Europe and this country to amuse the public by its tricks and agility. Other sapajous, known under the name of Alouettes, or howling monkeys, are equally worthy of our attention on account of their cries and the form of their muzzle. They have a pyramidal head, 
and an oblique visage, the lower jaw is extremely large, and the os hyoides, hyoid bone, is formed in the most singular manner. The body of this bone is very large and consists of an osseous case with thin and elastic parietes, which contains two membranous pouches that communicate with the larynx. The air finds its way into these cavities and gives to the hoarse and disagreeable voice of these animals a tone which has rendered them celebrated and obtained for them the name of howling monkeys. Their howling, as travelers tell us, may be heard for more than a half a league around, and has something so fearful in it that it may be mistaken for the noise occasioned by the sliding away of mountains. It is particularly at the rising or setting of the sun, or the approach of a storm, that they make the forest echo to their frightful cries. And it appears they sometimes have recourse to this howling to alarm their enemies. These monkeys are very common in the great forests of Brazil. The Atelis are the sapajous in which the thumbs are wanting on the interior extremities. Most of the sakis or saguins live in shrubberies and are less active than the preceding. Some species never quit their retreat except about twilight, and there are some that are altogether nocturnal in their habits. Family of Wistites This little group, which is nearly related to the family of monkeys, and which for a long time was confounded with it, is peculiar to the New World, and yet the Wistites differ less from the monkeys of the old continent than from those of America. In fact, like these last, they have but twenty molar teeth. The Wistites are small, agreeable-looking animals with a round head, flat face, lateral nostrils, without either callosities or cheek pouches, and a bushy tail which is not prehensile. On the interior extremities their thumbs are scarcely opposable to the other fingers, and all their fingers, except the thumb of the posterior extremities, are armed with compressed nails, which are pointed like claws. By the aid of these nails they climb trees like squirrels, for the conformation of their hands does not permit them to seize hold of branches like monkeys, to which the name of quadrumana is much more applicable. They live upon trees and are reputed to be gay, capricious, irascible, and always in motion. Family of Maquis The animals which belong to this family have the four thumbs well developed and opposable to the other fingers, but generally they differ from the monkeys and the Wistites in their form, which more resembles that of the Carnaria, and in the disposition or number of their teeth. They are readily distinguished by the presence of a pointed or raised nail on the first, or two first toes, or fingers of the posterior extremities, while the nails of the rest of the fingers are flat. This family is composed of several genera, designated under the names of Mackies properly so called, Lemur of Cuvier, Loris, Tarsius, etc. The Mackies properly so called exclusively inhabit the island of Madagascar, where they seem in a manner to take the place of monkeys. They are called, on account of the pointed shape of their heads, fox-headed, or fox-nosed monkeys. The inhabitants of the southern parts of Madagascar tame and train them for hunting, as we do the dog. End of Lesson 4 Lesson 5 Order Carnaria Zoological Characters Peculiarities of their Organization Division into Families Family of Chiroptera Zoological Characters Tribe of Bats Peculiarities of Organization Habits Frugivorous Bats Example The Rousset Insectivorous Bats Example Vespertilio Oriolard Tribe of Galeopithecus Family of Insectivora Zoological characters, organization and habits of the hedgehog, the shrew, and the mole. Order Carnaria. This great division of the class of mammalia is chiefly composed of predatory animals. Bears and other mammals, which possess nearly the same organization, are ranged under this head. The characters which distinguish the Carnaria are being unguiculated like the bimana and the quadrumana having the mouth armed with three kinds of teeth and like them being born in the ordinary way and in not having a pouch for the lodgment of their young 
and not having the thumb opposable to the other fingers, as in the two preceding orders. From the mode of life followed by most of these animals, it might be anticipated that their intestinal canal would be less voluminous and shorter than it is in those mammiferous animals which are nourished by vegetable substances exclusively. The canaria, to seize and devour their prey, which generally struggles against them, require considerable strength in their jaws. Therefore, the muscles which bring them together are very voluminous, giving to the heads of these animals very considerable size. In general, these organs are very short, and the manner of articulation of their lower jaw bone with the cranium shows that their teeth are designed either to cut flesh or to crush insects, but not to grind herbs or roots. The articulation is transverse in its direction and is compact as a hinge, so as to prevent lateral motion and only permits the mouth to open and shut like a pair of scissors. These animals differ very much from each other in their forms and in their mode of living. They are divided into three great families, to wit, the Chiroptera, the Insectivora, and the Carnivora. The distinctive characters of these are set down in the following table. Order of Canaria. Having a species of wings formed by a fold of skin, which, commencing from the sides of the neck, extends between their four extremities and their fingers. Molar teeth either flat on the crown or armed with points. Chiroptera without wings on the sides of the body, if molar teeth armed with conical points, insectivora, if molar teeth trenchant or cutting, carnivora. Family of Chiroptera Most of the Chiroptera are organized for flying rather than walking. Indeed, in these mammiferous animals, and even in those that do not have true wings, there exists on each side of the body a species of great sail formed by a fold of skin, which extends from the neck to the hind feet, and which extended and set in motion by the limbs of the animal performs the office of a parachute, by the help of which he is enabled to sustain himself in the air when he springs from an elevated point. All these animals are not equally well organized for flight, and on this account they may be divided into tribes as follows family of chiroptera having wings formed by membrane which is sustained by excessively long fingers bat having parachutes formed by a fold of skin on the sides which extends between the limbs but a very little amongst the fingers or toes which are short galeopithecus tribe of bats these singular animals seem at first sight to partake as much of the bird as of mammiferous animal for like the first they are provided with strong wings and are organized for flying in the air rather than walking on the ground but if we examine the structure of their body with more attention we perceive that in reality it differs only in a very slight degree from that of ordinary mammalia and these anomalies chiefly depend upon the extreme elongation of all parts of their interior extremities the wings of the bats are in fact nothing else than these extremities in which all the bones, those of the fingers particularly, have become long and serve to sustain a prolongation of the skin of the flanks, just as the whale bones of an umbrella serve to sustain the silk or cotton of which it is made. These organs are not designed for aerial locomotion alone, like the wings of birds. When folded, they also serve the animal for creeping or suspending itself from some projecting body, and for this purpose they have a free thumb which is short and armed with a hooked nail, like that of most other mammals, while the rest of their fingers, which are elongated beyond measure, lose their last phalanges, as well as the nails, and are enveloped in a fold of skin which extends from the sides of the neck to the posterior extremities, or even the tail. The posterior, or abdominal extremities, preserve their ordinary dimensions and are very feeble. The hind feet are free and provided with five toes of equal size, terminated with hooked nails. The progression or walk of these animals is extremely laborious and is affected by a series of oblique tumbles which fatigues them very much. They never have recourse to this mode of progression except when they are forced. When they wish to change place, they affect it by flying, and when they wish to repose, they hook themselves to some projecting body from which they can readily make their spring. Bats belong to those nocturnal animals that avoid the light. 
during the day they sleep concealed in caverns or some other obscure place and do not sally forth till the dusk of the evening in winter they fall into a lethargic sleep which often lasts during the cold season their eyes are exceedingly small but their ears are often very large and the species of tact which they exercise through the medium of the membranous surface of their wings is so exquisite that they can direct their course through all the nooks of their labyrinths even after their eyes have been removed and simply by the different impressions received from the air the diet of these animals is various all do not feed on animal substances as might be believed from the name of the class to which they belong some are frugivorous and others are insectivorous the frugivorous bats have molar teeth with flat crowns the second finger of the forepaw armed with a nail like the thumb as yet they have only been found in india and are designated under the generic name of roussettes one species of these bats the black roussette has wings which when expanded extend about four feet and to protect the fruits from its devastations they are sometimes obliged to cover the trees with nets the insectivorous bats on the contrary have the crown of the molar teeth studded with conical points which dovetail into each other they also differ from the preceding in many other characteristic particulars such as the absence of the nail on the index finger of these animals a great many species are known among those of france we may cite first the vespertilios or ordinary bats which have ears separated and of moderate size and the nose without foliaceous or leaf appendix by which several species are distinguished namely the common bat the serotinus pipistrellus etc second the long-eared bats aureolards vespertilio aureolus whose immense ears are united together upon the cranium the common species found in kitchens houses etc in france third the rhinophilus or horseshoe bats which may be easily distinguished by the foliaceous membranes and crests which are fixed on the nose altogether presenting the figure of a horseshoe are found in quarries in south america there is a bat a foot long which has the habit of sucking the blood of other animals while they are asleep it is known under the name of vampire and placed in the genus philostoma there are also several species in the united states tribe of galeopithecus these animals are mentioned by travelers under the names of flying monkeys and flying foxes flying cats etc they inhabit the indian archipelago and have the four extremities formed in the ordinary manner but united by a prolongation of skin which extends from the sides of the neck to the tail forming a great parachute by the assistance of which these chiroptera sustain themselves for a short time in the air when they spring from one branch to another they live upon trees and feed upon fruits family of insectivora this family is composed of canaria whose molar teeth are studded with conical points like those of most of the chiroptera but the skin of their flanks is not prolonged so as to form either wings or parachutes these are feeble animals of small stature which during the day conceal themselves in burrows or holes from which they sally forth only at night many of them pass the winter in a state of lethargy as their name indicates they live chiefly upon insects the principal genera composing this family are the hedgehogs shrews and moles which are recognizable by the following characters family of insectivora walkers anterior paws of the ordinary form and armed with small nails if body covered with spines hedgehogs if body covered with hair shrews diggers posterior paws of a peculiar form and armed with very long nails suitable for excavating or digging the earth moles the hedgehogs aeronachus are small animals which without having the instinct to excavate burrows inaccessible to their enemies without the activity necessary to escape their pursuit or strength to contend against them are nevertheless capable of advantageously protecting themselves and punishing any imprudent attack of their adversaries but to give them this power nature has formed for them no new organs but has merely modified the hairs with which their backs are covered and given a greater extent to certain of their movement than is common in other quadrupeds by flexing the head and paws beneath the belly the hedgehog can roll itself into a ball and it also has a faculty of drawing the skin of the back in such a manner 
to envelop itself as in a purse. Now the hairs with which this part of the tegumentary envelope is furnished, instead of being flexible and silky, are stout, stiff, and sharp, and when the skin is thus drawn, the spines are raised up, crossing each other in every direction, bristling all parts of the animal's surface like so many spines or spears, ready to lacerate and tear the mouth and paws of the aggressor. This powerfully defensive armor protects the hedgehogs from the attacks of most of the canaria, of which, without it, they would become the ready victims. Foxes, however, are not deterred by these obstacles, and are often successful in seizing this dangerous prey. Their mouths are armed with twenty teeth in the upper jaw and sixteen in the lower jaw. They live in the woods and keep themselves concealed during the day amongst the roots of old trees. They are frequently met with in France and in various parts of the world. It is said they mouse like a cat. Shrews, Sorex, are very small animals whose appearance reminds us of the mouse. Their body is covered with hairs, and on each flank there is found a small strip of stiff bristles between which there exudes an odorous humor. They have eighteen teeth in the upper and twelve in the lower jaw. They keep themselves in holes, which they excavate in the earth and feed on worms and insects. The common shrew, Sorex arenaeus, has been accused, but very wrongfully, of causing a disease in horses and mules by its bite. Shrews are found in Asia, the north of Europe, etc. The moles, talpa, are essentially subterraneous and burrowing animals. Their body is squat, their muzzle elongated and terminated by a movable snout, serving to penetrate the earth, and their anterior extremities, very short but extremely strong and thick, are directed outwardly and terminate by enormous nails suitable for digging. By the assistance of these organs, moles dig with great rapidity and admirable skill long galleries in the soil in the midst of which they establish their abode. The small elevations we often see upon the earth of the soil, called mole hills, are formed by the riddance which these animals throw out when executing their subterranean labors. They very rarely leave their labyrinths and feed on the worms and larvae of insects found there. They are destined, as we have seen, to live in total darkness. Hence their eyes are scarcely perceptible, and there is one species of mole which is entirely blind. They have twenty-two teeth in each jaw. The common mole of the fields of France, which is of a beautiful black, is found in all the fertile countries of Europe. It is said they do not exist in Ireland, and are rarely met with in Greece. There are varieties of moles, which are brown, white, ash-colored, and spotted. End of Lesson 5 Lesson number six, part one. Continuation of the order Carnaria. Family of Carnivora. In its most general acceptation, the word carnivorous belongs to all animals that feed upon flesh, but naturalists give to this word a more limited signification, and only apply it to this family of mammalia of the order Carnaria, which includes bats, hyenas, martens, dogs, etc., and which is easily distinguished by the existence of teeth for tearing and cutting flesh. In these animals, which generally possess great strength, the jaws are stout, and each one is armed with two long, stout, separated canine teeth, and between these are placed six incisors. Sometimes the molar teeth are all trenchant. Sometimes they are mingled, some having blunt tubercles, but they never have conical points, as in the insectivora. One of the great molars is ordinarily much larger and more trenchant than the others, and bears the name of carnivorous tooth. Behind it are one or two, almost flat, which are called tuberculos. And between it and the canines, a variable number of false molars. The form and disposition of these teeth are in relation to the more or less carnivorous habits of these animals. Those that live most exclusively on prey have the teeth most trenchant, and the jaws shortest, which increases their power, while those that feed on vegetable substances, as well as on flesh, have the molars for the most part tuberculous. By the proportion of these trenchant and tuberculous teeth, we can judge of the more or less carnivorous nature of their diet. Animals of this family generally have the paws armed with hooked nails, suitable for holding or even tearing their prey. It is to be remarked also that they are almost entirely without clavicles. But the form of their extremities varies a great deal, and is in relation to the difference in their mode of progression, which is not less great. 
According to these characters, the carnivora are divided into the three following tribes, plantigrata, digitigrata, and amphibia. Tribe of plantigrata. It is the zoological character of this tribe to have five toes on all the feet, and, when the animal walks or stands, to rest the entire sole upon the earth, which affords him a broad base of support and greater facility of standing up on his hind feet. All the motions of the plantigrades are dull. Like the insectivora, they are subterraneous and nocturnal in their habits, and in cold countries pass the winter in a state of lethargy, or hibernation. The most remarkable genera of this tribe are the bears, raccoons, badgers, and gluttons, which may be recognized by the following characters. Bears are large animals with stout bodies, thick extremities, and short tail. Their gait is very dull, but they possess prodigious strength and considerable intelligence. The formation of their extremities, little adapted for running, enables them to keep erect on their hind feet and quickly climb trees which they embrace between their paws. Some of them are also very good swimmers, and they are indebted for this quality, in a measure, to the quantity of fat with which their bodies are loaded. Of all the carnivora, their organization least requires them to feed on flesh, and their diet is least carnivorous. In fact, the structure of their teeth, almost entirely tuberculous, is more favorable for grinding roots and fruits than for tearing and cutting flesh. Hence, they are omnivorous. They eat both animal and vegetable substances, but the last constitute their habitual food. They love roots and fruits, but have a most decided preference for honey, which they will seek in the midst of a hive without much regarding the sting of the bees, being protected by the hard skin and thick hair with which they are covered. Most of the bears live in great forests, but there is one species that inhabits the coasts and ice of the polar seas. The first establish their abodes in caverns or in dens, which they dig with their strong and hooked nails. In winter they sleep in their retreats, and when the cold is severe, pass the whole of this season in a profound lethargy. During the period of hibernation they take no nourishment, but seem to depend upon the fat with which they abound in the autumn for their existence, so that when they leave their retreats they are extremely thin. Prudence is the chief feature in the character of the bear. Whenever he can, he retires from what he is unacquainted with, and when forced to approach it, he does so very slowly and with great circumspection. Yet he does not want courage and does not seem to be susceptible of fear. He is never known to run. He opposes strength to strength, and when his life is threatened, or his young in danger, his fury and his efforts become terrible. The fur of these animals is thick and composed of long, shining hair, it is much sought and forms an important article of commerce. In the winter, and in the coldest countries, it is most beautiful. Therefore, it is at this season they are most actively hunted. Most of the bearskins used are from the north of Russia and America. Since they have been employed for making or adorning military caps, three or four thousand are annually consumed in France. Bears are found in all parts of the world, and in every latitude, except South Africa and Australia. There are several species, the chief of which are First, the brown bear, Ursus arctos. It is this species that the mountebanks in France train for their exhibitions. This animal may attain a length of four or five feet. His height, when standing on all his feet, does not exceed three feet. His hair, thick and tufted, except on the muzzle and paws where it is black, is chestnut brown on the shoulders, back, thighs, and legs, yellowish on the sides of the head, ears, and flanks. It is common in the Alps, and is found in all the high mountains and great forests of Europe. It lives solitary, and ordinarily does not attack man except when provoked. But then he becomes very formidable, and strives to crush his antagonist beneath his feet, or strangle him in the embrace of his paws. Second, the white bear. Ursus maritimus is easily distinguished by his form and by the color of his coat. He is low on his legs. His body, his neck, and especially his head are more elongated than in any other species of this genus. Lastly, 
the interior of his mouth is entirely black. This animal inhabits the glacial regions of the northern hemisphere. It feeds on fishes, young amphibia, and young cetacea. Nevertheless, he is not essentially carnivorous, and can very well be brought to live on bread alone. He swims and dives with astonishing facility. White bears are sometimes met in numerous troops, which also distinguishes them from the other bears, which are always solitary. But these animals resemble each other in requiring a retreat in winter. For this purpose, they content themselves with some cleft in the rocks, or even a mass of ice. And without preparing any bed, they there lie down, and permit themselves to be buried under enormous masses of ice. They pass in this way, the months of January and February, in a true lethargy. Third, the black bear, Ursus americanus, lives in forests, feeds on fruits and flesh, is skillful in fishing, and dwells in the hollows of living trees. It is found in all the northern parts of America. In the Rocky Mountains and elevated regions of the Missouri, there is another species, which is much larger, stronger, and fiercer. It is called the grizzly bear, and its fur, which is grayish, is much esteemed. The raccoons, Procyon, very much resemble bears, except that they have a long tail. They have very nearly the same habits as those animals, but are better climbers and more carnivorous. They are of moderate size and inhabit the forests of America. There is one species which is curious from its singular habit of never eating anything without previously plunging it into water. The badgers, males, are nocturnal animals having a cringing gait, a very short tail, the toes very much enveloped in the skin, and are particularly distinguished by having a pouch situate beneath the tail, from which exudes a fatty, fetid oil. The nails on their forepaws being very long, enables them to dig with great effect. Their hair is long and silky. The common badger, Malus europea, which inhabits the temperate regions of Europe and Asia, and keeps at the bottom of an oblique, tortuous hole, is of the stature of a middle-sized dog. The length of its hair veils its legs, so that its body seems to be raised but little above the earth. Formerly, the hunting of this animal was more followed than in present day, and now it has become very rare in France. It was pursued by terrier dogs, but its jaws, armed with very strong teeth, and its long, powerful nails, enabled it to resist their attacks. It inflicted deep wounds, and defended itself with all its arms, lying on its back. Its skin is employed as coarse fur, and its hair, which cannot be used in the manufacture of felt, is employed for making shaving and other brushes. The gluttons, gulo, resemble the badgers very much, but are more carnivorous. Their name has been derived from an exaggerated notion of the voracity of one species of this genus, the glutton of the north, Ursus gulo, which is said to be very cruel, and to lie in ambush upon a tree, to leap on the backs of large animals upon which it preys. Tribe of Digitagrada The animals of this tribe are distinguished by the conformation of their paws. In place of resting the entire sole of the foot on the ground, and consequently having this part free of hair, they walk on the ends of their toes, with the tarsus raised, and hence their gait is lighter, and their speed greater. They are more exclusively carnivorous than the plantigrades, and their taste for flesh, joined with their fleetness, makes them essentially hunting animals. Their paws are almost always armed with powerful nails or talons, and their jaws are stout, and their molar teeth almost entirely trenchant. The number of small tuberculous teeth, which are found in the back of the mouth, varies, and as these differences correspond with their more or less sanguinary disposition, they are taken as the basis of the classification of the digitigrada. These different genera may be distinguished from each other by other characters, which are less important than those furnished by the teeth, but which are more easily remembered. The digitigrades provided with a single tuberculous tooth in each jaw form a small natural group designated under the name of vermiform carnivora, on account of their long, lank bodies and short legs. They have five toes on all the feet, 
and exhale an odor more or less strong, caused by a liquid which is secreted by two glands situated near the anus. Although of small stature, these animals are very sanguinary, and from their lank form they can pass through the smallest apertures. They are divided, as we have already seen, into polecats, martens, skunks, and otters. The polecats, putorius, are the most sanguinary of all. Their head is round, and the short muzzle extends beyond the mouth. The ears are rounded, and much wider than long. The tongue is covered with rough papillae. The coat is well furnished, shining and soft. Their tail is long, and they have glands on each side of the anus, which secrete a viscid and fetid matter. Their mode of life is solitary and nocturnal. They are found in both the Old and New World. The common polecat, Mustela putorius, is brown with yellowish flanks and white spots on the head, and is from 15 to 18 inches in length, without including the tail, which is 6 inches long. It is the terror of hen roosts and rabbit warrens. It approaches dwellings, mounts on the roof, and establishes itself in haylofts, in barns, and in places seldom visited, from which it goes forth only at night in search of its prey. It glides into poultry yards, mounts into dovecots, where without making as much noise as the beech marten, weasel, it commits more havoc. It cuts or crushes the heads of all the poultry, then carries them off one by one and stores them away. If, as it often happens, the animal cannot carry them off entire, on account of the hole by which he entered being too small, he eats the brains and bears off the heads. It is also very fond of honey. It attacks hives in winter and forces the bees to abandon them. Polecats live on prey in towns and on game in the country. They establish themselves in rabbit burrows, in clefts in rocks, in the trunks of hollow trees, from which they sally only at night to spread over the fields. In the woods, they seek the nests of partridges, of larks, and quails. They also climb trees to prey. They watch for rats, moles, and field mice, and they wage a continual war against rabbits, who cannot escape because they can readily enter their holes. The polecat is found in all the temperate parts of Europe. The ferret, Mustela furo, also belongs to the genus of the polecats, and very much resembles the common polecat. Its coat is clear brown or yellowish, its body is more elongated, more delicate, its head narrower, its muzzle more pointed than the polecat. The female is smaller than the male. It is originally from Barbary, it is naturalized in Spain, but in France it is only met with domesticated, and is employed to hunt rabbits in their burrows. This animal, says Buffon, is naturally the mortal enemy of the rabbit. When a rabbit, even dead, is shown to a young ferret that has never seen one, he throws himself upon it, and bites with fury. If living, he seizes it by the neck or the nose and sucks its blood. When let into a rabbit hole, it is muzzled, that it may not kill the rabbits at the bottom of the burrow, but only compel them to sally forth and be caught in a net with which it is usual to cover the entrance. The weasel, Mostola vulgaris, is another species of the genus polecat. It is of a chestnut color above, white below, in length about six inches, with an addition of fifteen or eighteen lines for the tail. This animal is very common in temperate climates, and is terrible to hen roosts, into which its small size enables it to insinuate itself through very narrow openings. When a weasel enters a hen roost, it does not attack the cocks or old hens, but selects the young hens and chicks, kills them by a simple wound inflicted on the head, and then carries them off one after the other. It also breaks the eggs and sucks their contents with incredible avidity. In winter, it generally dwells in granaries or in barns, frequently remaining there till the spring, to give birth to its young on the hay or straw. During all this time, it wages war, more successfully than a cat, against rats and mice, because they cannot escape, as it follows them into their holes. It climbs into dovecots and destroys pigeons, sparrows, etc. In the spring, it goes to some distance from habitations, particularly in low places, about mills, along the banks of streams and rivers, and conceals itself in thickets to surprise birds, and often establishes itself in the hollow of an old willow to bring forth its young. 
We will mention still another species of the genus polecat, called the ermine, Mustela erminea. Its body is about nine inches in length, and the tail about four. This little animal has two coats. In winter, it is white, with the tail tipped with black, and bears the name of ermine. During the spring, it is of a beautiful brown above, and yellowish white below, with the end of the tail always black. It is then the rosalette. It is found in the northern parts of the old and new continent, and though not so common as the weasel in France, it is not rare. It seeks stony countries, and avoids the neighborhood of habitations. The winter skins of this species are very much sought after as fur, and form a very considerable article of commerce. But the ermine of the most northern countries is most esteemed, because it is so brilliantly white, while that of temperate climates always retains a yellowish tint. The martens, Mustela, the true weasel, properly so called, resemble the polecats very much, but differ from them in having a muzzle more elongated and a tongue covered with soft pepillae. The numerous species of this genus are scattered over both continents. Among them, we will mention the common marten, Mustela martes, brown with a yellow spot on the throat and of a stature rather larger than that of the beech marten. It lives in the woods of northern Europe, avoiding inhabited places and the open fields. It destroys a great many small quadrupeds and birds. It takes possession of eggs and climbs to the highest branches of trees to dislodge them. It is said to be found also in South America. The beech marten, Mustelafoina, brown, with all the under part of the throat and neck whitish, about 16 inches in length, besides the tail, which measures 8. It is found in European forests, and often approaches habitations, where it even establishes its abode. But it is a dangerous guest. When it succeeds in obtaining an entrance into a henroost, or a pheasant walk, it commences by putting everything to death in its reach, and then bearing all off, piece by piece, to its retreat. It is also voraciously fond of eggs. It seizes rats, mice, moles, and birds in their nests. It is also fond of honey and hemp seed. The Sable Martin Mustela zebelina resembles the preceding species in size and color. It differs from the other martens in having hair growing on the undersurface of the toes, which protects them from the cold. Its fur is a valuable article of commerce. It inhabits the most northern parts of Europe and Asia, and abounds most in the mountains of frozen countries, the intense cold of which renders them uninhabitable. As it is the winter coat that is most highly appreciated, the pursuit of the sable is, of all kinds of hunting, the most arduous and perilous. The skunks, Mephitis, are celebrated for the intolerable stench which they diffuse to a great distance. Most of them inhabit America. The otters, Lutra, possess a peculiar physiognomy which prevents them from being confounded with any of the neighboring genera. The head is large and compressed, the body squat, and tongue semi-aspirate. Their toes are armed with short nails and are united in their whole length by a wide and strong membrane which renders these animals good swimmers. The tail is flattened horizontally. Their coat is very thick, formed by two kinds of hairs, the silky, quite long, stout, hard, shining, and thicker at the point than at the base. The woolly, which are shorter and generally more numerous, forming a thick and extremely soft fur. These animals live chiefly upon fish, and inhabit by-places or nooks, which they line with dry grass, on the banks or in the neighborhood of water. They remain concealed during the day, and sally in search of food only at night. Some species are known in almost all parts of the world. The common otter, Lutra vulgaris. About two feet long, tail about one foot in length, brown above, grayish below, and sometimes marked with white spots, lives on the margins of ponds and rivers in different parts of Europe. The sea otter, Mustela lutris, is twice the size of the common otter, and its black coat of the vivid brightness of velvet, forms one of the most precious of the furs. The English and the Russians hunt this animal in all parts of the Pacific Ocean, and annually convey a great number of skins to China and Japan. 
This species inhabits Kamchatka, the most northern parts of America, and the neighboring islands. Most generally, it keeps on the sea coast, and not within reach of fresh water, like the other species. It is said to live in couples. End of Lesson 6 Part 1 Lesson number 6, Part 2 The second group of digitigrade carnivora, characterized by the existence of two tuberculous teeth behind the carnivorous tooth of the upper jaw, is composed of the least sanguinary animals of this tribe. They are of pretty large stature, but their courage does not correspond to their strength, and they most generally feed on carrion. Amongst the genera of this group, the first that will be the object of our study is the genus of dogs. It is composed of the species which resemble each other in the principal parts of their organization, which, nevertheless, are separated into two very distinct subgenera, dogs and foxes. All these animals have three false molars above and four below, and two tuberculous teeth behind each carnivorous tooth. Their tongue is soft, their forefeet have five toes, and the hind ones four. Their nails are adapted for digging, their vision is excellent, their hearing fine, and their sense of smell prodigious. They mix vegetable with their animal food, and are fond of putrid meat. Generally, they are animals of moderate stature, and their proportions are indicative of their strength and activity. The subgenus of dogs, properly so called, is composed of common dogs, and different species of wolves. It is distinguished from that of the foxes by the tail, which, in the latter, is longer and more tufted, by the form of the muzzle, and particularly by the disposition of the pupil. In dogs, as well as in other diurnal animals, this opening is circular, while in foxes it takes, when contracting under the influence of light, the form of a slit, a peculiarity which is characteristic of nocturnal animals. The domestic dog, Canis familiaris, is distinguished from other species of this genus by his recurved tail, otherwise varying infinitely in size, form, color, and quality of hair. This animal is born with his eyes closed, and does not open them till the tenth or twelfth day. The female brings forth from six to seven, and sometimes twelve, young at birth. The life of the dog is commonly limited to fourteen or fifteen years, though some have been known to live twenty years. Its age is known by the teeth becoming blunt, unequal, and dark-colored as the animal grows old. When young, they are white, trenchant, and pointed. Dogs are voracious and gluttonous. Nevertheless, they can fast for a long time. They readily accustom themselves to all kinds of food, although they have a special fondness for meat, and particularly for carrion. Their stomach, which is endowed with great energy, digests very readily the hardest and most compact bones. The dog runs with great rapidity for a long distance. The pores of his skin being very much closed, he never sweats, even in the very hottest weather. But when he is very warm, he lolls out his tongue and frequently draws it in. He plunges into the water without being incommoded. He drinks by lapping, so that with his tongue he lifts the water which, being in this way introduced little by little into the stomach, is gradually warmed, and he therefore experiences no inconvenience by the sudden cold that a considerable quantity of water swallowed at once produces in the interior of the body when very warm. The acuteness of the sense of smell, in some races of dogs, gives them a perception that is not to be found in any other species of animals, not even excepting man. This sagacity is particularly manifested in the discovery and pursuit of game. The dog perceives the odorous traces with which the soil is impregnated for twenty-four hours after game has passed over it, and in this way guides himself to the cover where the animal hides. There are two principal races of dogs suited for hunting, one of which is trained to pursue animals, and the other to stand at the place where they are discovered. The dog is the most complete and one of the most useful conquests that man has achieved over nature. The whole species has become our property, and even the trace of his primitive state has been lost. Wild dogs, which are found in many countries, 
belong to the domestic races that have regained their independence, after having lost it for a certain number of generations, and in this way have resumed some of the traits of their primitive species. Causes, as powerful as those which result from the influence of difference of climate, of food, etc., are not enough to explain the numerous modifications that the domestic dog has undergone, giving rise to his different races. It has been supposed that our dogs have not been derived from a single species, but that they came from different species, which cannot now be recognized on account of the mixture of their races. Some think the dog is a wolf, and others again that he is a tamed jackal. Dogs that have become wild on desert islands do not, however, resemble either one or the other. Wild dogs, and those belonging to demi-civilized people, such as the nations of New Holland, have straight ears, which has led to belief that the European races which approach nearest to the original type are the shepherd's dog and wolf dog. We will now mention the principal races of dogs that are scattered over the surface of the earth. Their almost infinite mixture, joined to the influence of climate, of food, and education, has produced very many varieties in their species. The Shepherd's Dog, Canis domesticus, is one of moderate size, the ears short and straight. His whole body, with the exception of the muzzle, is covered with long hairs. His color is black or dark brown. Of all the species of dogs, this one possesses most instinct for guarding flocks. The Lapland Dog, Dog of the Eskimo, Canis borealis, resembles the shepherd's dog and inhabits the most northern parts of Europe, Asia, and America, where he is employed as a beast of burden. They are geared from five to ten together, sometimes more, to very light sledges constructed of osier, and forced to run so rapidly that they sometimes accomplish in a single day a journey on the ice of twenty-five leagues. The Newfoundland Dog, Canis terranovae, the proportions of his body are nearly the same as those of the shepherd's dog. His body is thickly covered with long, soft hair, and his tail recurved and tufted. His color is ordinarily white, with patches of black. He is tall, and has an elongated body. He is very active, and possesses strength superior to that of any other dogs of the same size. He attaches himself strongly to his master, but is shy of strangers. He is remarkable for his toes being united for about one half their length by a membrane, and for the facility with which he takes to the water, which seems to him a second element. This quality has caused him to be taken to places where men are in danger of being drowned in order to rescue them. The wolf dog, Canis pomeranus, is distinguished from the shepherd's dog by the hairs that cover all parts of the head, and by his highly raised tail. His color is generally white or black or pale red. In some countries he is employed to watch the flocks. The Hound Canis Gallicus There are several varieties remarkable for the length of, the, of their pendant ears. They have very strong limbs, short hair, tail recurved. They are white or black or pale red, fawn, or spotted with these different colors. It is the best race for pursuing game, such as the hare, deer, or wild boar, etc. The Spanish pointer and setter belong to this variety. The turnspit, Canis vertegus. In this race, the legs are always very short, sometimes straight, and often crooked. The ears are large, long, and pendant. The turnspits are prized for hunting in the company with the hound. The setting dog, Canis avicularis differs little from the preceding and the ordinary hound. The muzzle is not so long, the ears are shorter, the limbs longer, and the body thicker. The Terrier Canis terrarius This race, of which they form packs in England for chasing the fox, hare, and rabbits, is black, having the eyes, the lower part of the body, and the paws of a deep yellowish red. It possesses a great deal of vivacity and intelligence, and great ardor in the chase. It watches for mice, and catches them with as much adroitness as a cat. The Spaniel, Canis extrarius, is covered with long silky hair. His ears are pendant like those of the hound, and his limbs short. 
He is white or chestnut, or marked with these two colors, or black. It varies in size and is valued in hunting, as a watchdog, and as a companion. The Greyhound, Canis Graya. This animal possesses an elegant form, and was so much esteemed formerly that he was the ordinary companion of gentlemen, who in those days were distinguished by their charger, their falcon, and greyhound. It has a long body, a long delicate head, large eyes, a long mouth, teeth sharp and very white, and a deep chest. Both his fore and hind legs are long and straight, his haunches round and strong, his loins brawny, and his belly thin. He is the most nimble of the dogs, and is fit for the chase from twelve months old. He hunts by the eye, and not by the sense of smell, and it is pretended that he surpasses them all. The Danish Dog Canis Danicus This dog possesses great beauty. He is white and spotted, with an elegant profusion of small round black spots. His sense of smell is not acute. The Mastiff Canis Mastivus the dogs of this race are large, vigorous, and nimble. Their ears are demi-pendant. They are gray, white, brown, and black. They carry the tail high. They are chiefly employed as watchdogs. The Water Dog Canis Aquaticus Water Spaniel This variety is one of the most intelligent and one of the most common in France. It is remarkable for its long curly hair. Its color is black, or white, or mixed. These animals are strongly attached to their masters, and perform many curious tricks. They are very fond of going into the water. The Bulldog Canis Molossus The dogs of this race are characterized by a short muzzle and by a stout body. Of all the races, this is the least intelligent. It is divided into the English Bulldog, Canis Anglicus, is easily recognized by the large head and body. The ears are small and demi-pendant. His thick lips fall on each side of his mouth. His legs are short and strong. His coat is smooth, white, and black. This dog is employed in preference to others for baiting bulls and wild beasts. The common bulldog resembles the last and differs from it in being smaller. It often has the nostrils separated by a deep fissure or cleft. The pug dog, Canis fricator, resembles the two last, but the lips are less pendant and it is smaller. Its coat is smooth and generally light-colored, except the face, which is black. It does not possess much intelligence and is very heedless. The common wolf, Canis lupus, is another species of, of the subgenus dog. It is easily distinguished from the domestic dog by its tail, which is straight, in place of being recurved, as in the last. Its ears are also straight, and its coat is of a pale red or fawn color. This animal is the size of a large dog, and it has the physiognomy of a mastiff. But far from being like the dog, eminently social, he lives almost entirely solitary, in great forests, nor does he unite with his fellows to form troops, except when pressed by hunger. He is very strong, active, adroit, and provided with everything that is necessary to fit him for the pursuit, attack, and conquest of his prey. Nevertheless, he is naturally sluggish and cowardly, and it is only when pressed by hunger that he braves danger and dares to attack animals which are under the protection of man, as lambs, sheep, and even dogs. Under the influence of excessive hunger, he commits great ravages. He attacks women and children, and sometimes he is bold enough to fall upon man. He inhabits all of Europe. The Jackal, or Golden Wolf Canis Orcus Which is found in the hot parts of Asia and Africa, in its habits and conformation more strongly resembles the domestic dog than the common wolf it permits itself to be tamed. Many naturalists consider the jackal as the original stock of the dog, and many commentators suppose that it is the fox of Samson. The second group of the genus dog includes the foxes. 
These animals have the same dental system as the dog, but possess a larger head, a more pointed muscle, a longer and more bushy tail, and by day their pupils present the form of a vertical slit. They are nocturnal, burrow in the earth, exhale a fetid odor, and only attack feeble animals. Species are found in all parts of the world. Those of cold countries afford a valuable fur. The Common Fox Canis vulpes which is spread over all Europe, has a red coat. Everybody knows this famous animal through his tricks and cunning. He generally establishes his abode in the edge of a wood, in the neighborhood of a farm. If he gains entrance into a poultry yard, he slaughters all the poultry, and loading himself with a part of the spoils, he hastens to deposit it at some distance, then returns and carries off another part, which he disposes of in the same way taking the precaution, however, to change the place of deposit. This he repeats several times. When he finds birds caught in a snare, he adroitly frees them from their bonds and carries them off to his hole. His gluttony accommodates itself to everything. When pressed by hunger, he eats rats, mice, snakes, toads, lizards, insects, and even contents himself with vegetables. Foxes that live near sea coasts feed upon all kinds of shellfish. The genus civet, vivera, includes not only the civet properly so called, but also the genet, or wild cat, the mongoose, and several other carnaria, which seem to fill up the chain of relationship between the dogs and cats. Like the last, their tongue is rough and their nails are more or less retracted when walking, so that their extremities are always kept very sharp. All of them have a pouch placed more or less deeply under the tail containing a greasy matter which frequently exhales a very strong odor. The civet, properly so called, civetta, has been improperly called the musk cat. It is ordinarily of an ash color, spotted white, sometimes striped like certain species of cats. Its perfume, which consists of the greasy matter formed in the pouch we have just mentioned, is so strong that it penetrates all parts of the body and the skin preserves the odor for a long time after it has been stripped from the animal. Although originally from hot countries, Guinea and the central parts of Africa, the civet can live in temperate and in cold climates if protected from the injurious influences of the air. It has been acclimated in Holland, where the inhabitants carry on a considerable trade in its perfume. The quantity afforded by each animal depends on its keeping and diet. The more abundant its food, the more perfume it yields. It is said to be the most abundant after the animal has been irritated. The genet, genetta, bears considerable resemblance to the civet. Its color is gray, spotted brown, and black with a blackish muzzle, white spots on the brow, on the cheek, and on each side of the end of the nose. The tail is ringed white and black, it is met with from the south of France to the Cape of Good Hope. It frequents along brooks, near springs, etc. Its skin is an important article of peltry. Like the civet, it has a pouch containing a species of perfume. It clears the houses of rats and mice, which cannot endure its odor. The Manguste of Egypt, or Pharaoh's Rat. Ichnumon Pharaonis, Vivera Ichnumon, also belongs to the genus of civets. It resembles the civet, but is distinguished by its large eyes, with the pupils elongated transversely, which are susceptible of being almost entirely covered by a large winking eyelid, called membrana nictitans. It is larger than our cats, slender like the weasel, and of a grayish color. This animal is the famous Ichnumon of the ancients, which was worshipped by the Egyptians. All that the ancients have said in relation to its fights with the crocodile is fabulous. The manguste is naturally mild and timid, and renders very important service to Egypt, for it destroys a great number of crocodile eggs. It also feeds on small animals of all kinds. When domesticated, it hunts mice and the small reptiles which are so common in that country. The third group of carnivorous digitigrades includes those animals of this tribe which have no small teeth behind the great molar of the lower jaw. In this group are found the most cruel, the most carnivorous, and on account of their strength, the most formidable animals. 
they have been separated into two genera, the hyenas and cats. Hyenas are distinguished from animals of the genus cat by the number of their fingers, which is four throughout, by their nails which are adapted for digging, and which are never drawn in or retracted when on the march, and by the position of their teeth, whose strength is so great that they can crush the bones of the strongest of their prey. Their tongue is rough, their sense of smell acute, their tail short and pendant, and below the anus there is a deep pouch in which a glandular apparatus secretes a viscous matter which diffuses a very disagreeable odor. The coat is rough, not thick, composed of long hairs, which form a mane along the back. Their gait is most singular. They keep the step of the hind legs always lower than that of the fore. These animals are nocturnal, live in caverns, and are extremely voracious. They feed especially on dead bodies, and seek them even in burial places. They possess a reputation for ferocity which they do not merit. The Common Hyena Hyena vulgaris is originally from Asiatic Turkey, Syria, and some countries of Africa. It is of the size of a wolf, and at first sight somewhat resembles him. His coat is of a brownish gray, and marked with white stripes. His head is commonly carried low. The back seems elevated like that of the hog. He has long bristles, which fall from each side. The cry of this animal is peculiar. It begins with a sound that one might take for the groans of a man, and ends precisely as if a person were making efforts to vomit. The Cats Felis A name under which naturalists comprehend not only common cats, but also tigers, lions, etc., of all the carnivora, are the most completely armed. Their short jaws are moved by prodigiously strong muscles. They have two false molar teeth in the upper and two in the lower jaw, followed by a very large carnivorous tooth. Their retractile nails, which are hidden amongst the toes, when in a state of repose, by the action of elastic ligaments, never lose either their point or edge. The number of their toes is five on the four feet, and four on the hind. They possess a sense of hearing which is exceedingly fine, and it is the best developed of their senses. Their sight does not seem to have a very long range, but they see well both by day and by night. Their pupil dilates and closes according to the quantity of light. With some, it is elongated vertically, and with others it is round. They make great use of their sense of smell. They exercise it before eating, and always when they apprehend disturbance from any cause. Their tongue is clothed with very rough, horny points. Their coat is generally soft and fine, and the whole surface of their body is very sensible to the touch. Their mustaches, particularly, seem to be the seat of very delicate impressions. Animals of the genus cat are spread almost everywhere over the surface of the globe. They everywhere possess similar habits. Though endowed with prodigious strength, they never openly attack other animals. Stratagem and cunning direct all their movements. They never force their prey into flight, but most frequently concealed in a bushy covert, near the source of running water, they await the animal they design attacking, and at a single bound alight upon their victim. At the head of this genus is placed the lion, Felis leo, which is five or six feet in length from the end of the muzzle to the origin of the tail, three feet high, distinguished by a square head, the brush of hair which terminates his long tail, and the mane that covers the head, neck, and shoulders in the male. It is the strongest of the carnivorous animals. It has an imposing air, a proud look, and a noble gait. Such is his power that a single blow of his foot is enough to crush the sides of a horse, and to knock down the strongest man with a blow of his tail. He can clear at a single bound a space of thirty feet, and he drags with ease to great distances the largest bullocks. Formerly he was spread over three-fourths of the old world, but at present he appears to be almost confined to Africa, and some of the neighboring parts of Asia. The roar of the lion is such that when it resounds in the mountains, it resembles distant thunder. This roar is hollow and deep. In his paroxysms of rage, he utters another cry, not less frightful, but short, broken, and reiterated. Nothing is more dreadful than this animal when he prepares for combat. He lashes his flanks with his long tail, 
His mane becomes erect, bristling, and envelops his whole head. All his muscles are in motion. His enormous eyebrows half conceal his pupils. He shows his teeth and frightful tongue, and he protrudes his claws, which are almost as long as the finger. His approach would freeze with terror the boldest of men. With the exception of the elephant, rhinoceros, and hippopotamus, no other animal dares to contend with him. The flesh of the lion is eaten by the Hottentots, and a tribe of Arabs, between Tunis and Algiers, live almost entirely upon it. The animal which some authors call the American lion is another species of the genus cat, named cougar, Felis concolor, which belongs to the New World. The royal tiger, or eastern tiger, Felis tigris, is a still more formidable animal than the lion, for he equals him in size and strength, and exceeds him in ferocity. His hair is rough and yellow above, with transverse black stripes. He inhabits India, and there commits the greatest ravages. The jaguar, Felis onca, the ounce, which is almost as large as the royal tiger, and almost as dangerous, inhabits the great forests of America. His coat is yellow above, with black spots in the form of eyes or rings, arranged in four rows along the flanks, and white striped with black below. He is sometimes distinguished under the name of American Tiger, and furriers call him the Great Panther. The Panther, Felis Pardus, so remarkable for the beauty of his yellow coat with black spots in the form of roses, is found throughout Africa and in the warm parts of Asia. Very much resembles the leopard, which inhabits the same regions. The name Lynx, Felis Lynx, the mountain cat, is given to another species of cat, remarkable for the brush of hair that tips the ears. It is about two feet and a half long to the origin of the tail, which is from four to five inches in length. Its coat is red, spotted with brownish red. It is indigenous to temperate Europe, but has almost entirely disappeared from populous countries. It is still met with in the Pyrenees, in the mountains of the kingdom of Naples, and in Africa. It climbs the highest of trees of the forest, and there lies concealed among the branches, to watch the weasel, ermine, squirrel, etc. It commits great havoc amongst flocks, and destroys a great number of hares and game. Its sight is so piercing that the ancients attributed to it the faculty of seeing through stone walls, but we can say that it distinguishes its prey at a much greater distance than any other carnivorous animal. The common or domestic cat, Felis catus, is originally from the forests of Europe. In its wild state, it is grayish-brown, with transverse undulating stripes of a deeper color above and pale below. The inside of the thighs and the forepaws yellowish, and the tail annulated with black. When domesticated, it varies in color, fineness, and length of its hairs, as everybody knows. Tribe of Amphibia The third tribe of the family of Carnivora comprises animals which, capable of being submerged for a long time and having a body favorably organized for nat natination, keep themselves most generally in the sea, although they have a constant necessity for respiring the air. These animals have been named amphibia on account of their mode of life. Their feet are so short and so enveloped in the skin that they serve them on land only for crawling, but as the spaces between their fingers are filled up by membranes, they form excellent oars. They only land to bask in the sun, to sleep, and to suckle their young. Their elongated body, their very movable spine, provided with muscles which flex it with great force, their narrow pelvis, their rough hair lying close to the skin, concur to render them good swimmers. They form two families, the seal and the morse. Seals, phoca, have a rounded head, resembling that of a dog, a mild, intelligent look, the canine teeth of moderate size, the forepaws armed with hooked nails, the posterior extremities directed backwards and in the form of fins. These animals live in numerous troops near coasts and feed principally on fishes. They always eat in the water. They swim with great ease and dive very well. The ancients knew these animals 
and introduced them into their fables. The flocks of Neptune that Proteus tended were composed of seals, and the poetic mythology of the Greeks has transformed these amphibia into tritons and sirens to escort their god of the sea. Modern voyagers often designate them under the names of sea calves, sea cows, sea bears, etc. This little family is divided into several genera. Seals are found on the coasts of the South Shetland Islands and the western coasts of America and in the northern seas. They are much hunted for the sake of their skins. These animals are of great importance to the Finnish islanders and the Kamchatka Dales, and particularly the Greenlanders, and to the Eskimo of Labrador. The two latter people live on their flesh, clothe themselves, build their summer huts, make their canoes, etc., of their skins. The chase of the seal forms their principal business, and their success in this forms at once their fortune and glory. The morse, trichecus, the walrus, is easily distinguished from the seal by its enormous canine teeth, which, planted in the upper jaw, are directed downwards, like tusks, and sometimes attain two feet in length. The necessarily large size of the alveoli, for the accommodation of such immense canine teeth, raises up the whole front of the upper jaw into the form of a swelled jowl, and the nostrils open upwards, instead of terminating the muzzle. There are neither incisor nor canine teeth in the lower jaw which is compressed anteriorly, to pass between the enormous canine teeth, or tusks, of the upper one. The chief use of these tusks seems to be to aid the morse to detach from the ground and rocks the substances upon which he feeds. They also serve to secure him to the rocks before he trusts himself to sleep. In other respects, the morse resembles the seal. The only species known inhabits the icy ocean, and is sometimes twenty feet in length. End of Lesson 6, Part 2 Lesson 7, Rodents, Part 1 The marsupialia are unguiculate mammals whose different organs, at the time of birth, are very imperfectly formed, and they adhere by some means to the teat of the mother until their development is accomplished. In the majority of these animals, the skin of the belly forms, in the front of the teats, a pouch which serves to lodge the young while they are suckled. It is from this peculiarity of organization they have obtained the name of marsupialia, or pouched animals. The young, incapable of motion and almost without a distinct form, remain for a certain time fixed to the teats of the mother and concealed in the mammary pouch of which we have just spoken. They do not detach themselves until they are covered with hair, open their eyes, and are able to live on other food than milk. For a long time after they have left this pouch, they fly to it as a place of refuge, when threatened by any danger. In those species that have no pouch, but a prehensile tail, the young are pendant from the belly of the mother for a certain time, then they mount upon her back, and, for the sake of support, wrap their tails around hers. All these animals which are so intimately linked to each other, by the manner in which their young are developed, differ very much in other respects. In some, the dental system is precisely like that of the Insectivoria, and accordingly, they feed upon similar food. In others, that still possess the three sorts of teeth, the molars are tuberculous, in place of being studded with points, and hence their frugivorous diet. And there are some that want the canine teeth, which, if we take this circumstance into consideration, should be placed among the rodentia. These animals also differ from each other in general form and habits. The marsupialia have only been found in America, on some of the islands of the South Sea, and particularly in New Holland, which, with some exceptions, contains only mammiferous animals of this order. The order of marsupialia is divided into six tribes, as follows. First tribe, two long canines in each jaw, several small incisors, molars studded with points, opossum. Second tribe, the superior canines long and pointed, but the inferior rudimentary, or entirely wanting, six small incisors above, but only two large ones below, thumb large and directed backwards, the two next fingers joined as far as the nails. 
phalangers. Third tribe, two large incisors above, with some small ones adjoining, and two small canines, no thumb behind, paws very short, koala. Fourth tribe, dental system nearly the same as in the preceding tribe, no thumb on the posterior extremities which, as well as the tail, are very long, potoroos. Fifth tribe, without canines, a long vacant space between the incisors and molars, several incisors in the upper jaw, posterior extremities and tail very long. Kangaroos. Sixth tribe, no canines, two long, enclosed incisors in each jaw, molars studded with transverse ridges, tail short. Face colomis. The first tribe of marsupials is composed of animals that are essentially insectivorous, some of them belong to New Holland, but the greatest number inhabit America. The last constitute the genus opossum, saragu. The opossums have the hind thumb perfectly opposable to the other fingers, which arrangement has obtained for them the name of pedamana. They have ten incisors above, eight below, and fourteen molars in each jaw, which, with four canines, make fifty teeth a greater number than is possessed by any other mammiferous quadruped. They are nocturnal animals and nestle on trees. They feed on fruits, dead meat, and weaker animals. There are from 15 to 18 species, all belonging to America. The common opossum, Didelphus virginiana, is about the size of a cat, but its coat gives it the appearance of greater size. Its head bears some resemblance to that of a fox, with long inanimate eyes, and broad translucent ears like those of the rat. The tail is round and nearly a foot long. It is lightly covered with hair near its root, but at the extremity is entirely naked. On the ground the opossum is slow and without resources, but he climbs trees with the greatest dexterity. His food consists of birds, which he watches for, and surprises in the foliage. He suspends himself by his tail, which is muscular and flexible, and in this position, he awaits his prey for several hours at a time. All the other marsupialia inhabit New Holland, or the neighboring islands. Among these animals, we will mention the phalangers, potoroos, koalas, and kangaroos. The phalangers, phalangista, are climbers that have a large, opposable thumb, and in their general form, somewhat resemble squirrels. Some of these marsupials have received the name of flying phalangers on account of the prolongation of the skin of their flanks between their extremities, forming on each side of the body, a sort of parachute, by which it is in a degree sustained in the air when he leaps from one tree to another. The koalas. Of this tribe only one species is known, koala cenaria which inhabits New Holland. It has a short, stout body, short legs, and no tail. The toes of the forefeet, five in number, when about to seize an object, separate into two groups, the thumb and index on one side, and the remaining three on the other. It passes one part of its life in trees, and the other in burrows at their foot. The Podoroos, Hypsoprimuus. Of this tribe, only one species is known, it inhabits New Holland, and is described by most authors under the name of the kangaroo rat. It has a long powerful tail, and the two first toes of the hind feet are united as in the kangaroos. It is frugivorous. The kangaroos, Halmalurus, are herbivorous animals, very remarkable for the smallness of their forepaws, the length of their hind legs and tail, upon which they sit vertically as on a tripod. By the assistance of these great paws, they leap very well, and there is one species known that can clear a space of twenty feet at a single bound. The disposition of the nail of the middle toe of the hind feet makes them somewhat resemble ungulate mammals, for it is very large and almost in the form of a hoof. They inhabit New Holland and the neighboring islands. One species called the giant kangaroo stands about six feet high. Order Rodentia. The Rodentia, or Nars, are easily distinguished from all other unguiculate mammals without mammary pouches by the arrangement of their teeth, 
which correspond to the nature of their food. These animals have no canine teeth, and there is a vacant space between the incisor and molar teeth. The first are remarkable for their strength, their length, their arched form, and the lozenge shape of their cutting edge. Their number is almost always two in each jaw, and their anterior surface is ordinarily tinged of a more or less deep yellow color. The molar teeth have a large flat crown, traversed by raised lines, which renders their surface like that of a millstone. Finally, the lower jaw of these animals, in place of being articulated with the cranium by a transverse condyle, like that in the carnaria, is joined to it by a longitudinal condyle, which only permits motion forwards and backwards. On this account, these animals cannot use their teeth either for tearing flesh or even cutting the substances upon which they feed, and they are forced, therefore, to file them, as it were, in order to reduce them by continual labor to very delicate particles, and it is from this circumstance they have obtained the name of gnawers or rodentia. In conformity to this mode of organization, the gnawers must necessarily be designed to feed chiefly upon vegetable substances. Some of them are omnivorous, rats for example, but for the most part, they live upon fruits, herbs, barks, or roots. Most of these animals are of small stature, and in general, their hind paws are much longer than the fore, so that they rather leap than walk. The hare affords us an example of this arrangement, which, in some other gnawers, the gerboas, is carried so far that the animal only uses his hind paws to leap with and to rest upon. As regards intelligence, the rodentia are, in general, less favored by nature than the quadrumana and carnaria, and it is remarked that their brain is less developed and presents scarcely any convolutions. Nevertheless, we find in this order those mammalia whose instinctive faculties are most admirable, as we shall see when we treat of the castors and squirrels. This order is composed of several small tribes, the most important of which, with their distinctive characters, are indicated in the following table, in which it will be perceived, they are all arranged in two principal sections, according as they possess a perfect or an imperfect clavicle. The first section has been called rodentia with clavicles, and the second rodentia with imperfect clavicles. Tribe of Squirrels The squirrels are recognized by their long bushy tail and by their lower incisor teeth, which are very much compressed. Their head is large, their eyes projecting and animated, and their form light. Their anterior extremities, which often serve them for conveying food to the mouth, are sustained by strong clavicles, and are provided with only four fingers, which are armed with hooked nails, while the posterior extremities have five. These animals, which are remarkable for their agility, live on trees and feed upon fruits. They are divided into squirrels properly so called, flying squirrels, etc. Squirrels properly so called, sciurus, have the hairs of the tail directed from the sides, giving it some resemblance to a large feather. There are many species on both continents. In France, the common squirrel, sciurus vulgaris, is met with in great numbers, and the climate of that region preserves its colors, a lively red on the black and white on the belly. But in the north during the winter, it acquires a beautiful bluish ash color, producing the fur called miniver, when taken from the back only, and ver by the French, when it consists of the whole skin. Sometimes there are black squirrels, less frequently snow white with red eyes, and more rarely still, spotted with black and white. These lively, graceful little animals inhabit the forests and make their nests upon the highest parts of the loftiest trees. They build them in a spherical form of flexible twigs and moss and leave an opening in the upper part, taking the precaution to cover it with a sort of conical roof, which prevents the ingress of rain. In this nest they pass a part of the day. They sally forth in the evening, at which time they are gay, jumping from branch to branch, and uttering a pretty sharp whistle. During the summer, squirrels are occupied in making provision for the winter. It is remarkable that they have a great propensity to hide whatever food may remain after feeding. The trunk of a hollow tree is their usual storehouse, to which they recur when the fruits upon which they feed grow scarce. 
They know how to discover their depot when under the snow, which they remove with their paws, and their instinct teaches them not to put all they gather into the same place. Ordinarily, they make several storehouses, and when one is discovered and robbed or exhausted, they recur to the others. By their address and agility alone, they succeed in eluding their enemies. The moment they are apprised of their approach by any extraordinary noise, they leave their nest, and through the assistance of their nails, which enables them to adhere to the bark of trees, we see them, in order to escape from the object of their dread, place the thickness of a branch between it and themselves, which makes it difficult to see them, if one is perceived by them. When we go around the tree to get to the same side upon which they are, they at once pass to the opposite, and if their fear becomes still greater, they cover themselves betwixt two branches and lie motionless. These animals are extremely clean in their habits, they never soil their nests, and they are continually polishing their hairs with their four paws, which they employ for many other purposes. It is with these, they convey food to the mouth, and pluck the moss with which they build their nests. In some instances, they can oppose their rudimentary thumb, with which they are provided to their fingers, so that their paws perform the offices of hands. The great length of their hind legs makes them excellent leapers. On the ground their progress is effected altogether by leaping, and to rest, they sit upon their hind legs, elevating the tail and spreading it over their head as a kind of canopy. It is said that they avail themselves of a piece of bark for a boat, and use the tail as a sail when they wish to cross a stream. But we may be permitted to believe that a stream, even for a free squirrel, when uninfluenced by the fear of danger, will always be a barrier that he will never attempt to pass. And if he were forced through fear to plunge into the water, swimming would be his only resource. The voice of the squirrel is a sharp cry, and sometimes he utters a feeble sound, although his mouth be shut, which is said to be a sign of impatience or anger. The flying squirrels, pteromys, winged rat, have on each side of the body a prolongation of the skin, which extends between the fore and hind legs, and forms a sort of parachute, by the aid of which these animals can sustain themselves in the air for a few seconds and make extended leaps. One species is found in the forests of Poland and Russia, and one in North America. Tribe of Rats The tribe of rats is composed of a great number of small rodentia, which resemble our common rats in the most important parts of their organization, and are the most carnivorous animals of this order. Their forepaws are, in general, terminated by four toes, which are well developed, and a tubercle representing a rudimentary thumb, on the posterior extremities there are five complete toes. Most of them live in holes. The principal genera of this group are the marmot, the dormouse, the rat properly so called, and the hamster. The marmot, arctomus, bear rat, or mountain rats, differ in many respects from the other gnawers of the tribe of rats. Like the squirrels, they have five molar teeth above and four below, all studded with points. Some of these animals feed on insects as well as herbs. Their form is heavy and squat. The head is flat and thick, the ears round, the limbs short and stout, the tail small, and their coat thick and coarse. Their walk is clumsy and they run badly, but they can flatten themselves so as to pass through narrow openings. They dig with readiness a deep hole into which many individuals retire during winter a season which they pass in profound lethargy, covered in a bed of hay. On the approach of cold weather, they close their hole by heaping up earth at its entrance. They are then very fat, and their fat serves for their nutrition during their lethargy. They do not store provisions, and never wander far from this hole. They live socially, and when the troop is out, they place a sentinel upon some elevated point, to give notice of the approach of danger. The common marmot, Arctomus alpinus is found in the Alps, just below the region of perpetual snow. The mountaineers go in the winter to take them in their holes. They eat them and sell their skins at a low price for common fur. It is this fur which the little Savoyards who beg their way in some European towns often carry with them. It is about the size of a hair and its coat is yellowish gray. Dormice, myoxus, 
rat with a pointed nose, are pretty little animals with soft fur, a hairy or even tufted tail, an animated look, which like squirrels, live on trees and feed on fruits. Like the marmots, they pass the cold season in a deep lethargic sleep, rolled up in a ball. They may be recognized by the number of their molar teeth, which is four on both sides of each jaw. The common dormouse, myoxus gliss, the fat dormouse, which is about the size of the common rat, inhabits the southern parts of Europe. It lives in great forests, and in the hollows of trees and rocks, constructs a retreat which it lines with moss, and in which it deposits provisions to be ready when it awakes in the spring. In some parts of Italy, it feeds on small animals. The Romans raised and fatted this species for the table. The Garden Dormouse Myoxus nutella is another species which is common in the neighborhood of Paris. It frequents espaliers, hedgerows of fruit trees, and retires into cavities in orchard walls. Its food consists of fruits, and it sometimes commits great ravishes. Another species of dormouse, Myoxus avellanarius, is of the size of a small mouse, and inhabits the borders of woods, hedges, etc. Like the squirrel, it prepares a bed of moss for the winter. Rats, properly so called, are distinguished by the disposition of their molar teeth, which are three throughout, and by the long, hard tail. These animals are of small size, and feed chiefly on vegetable substances, such as grains and roots, but they also eat animal matter, and when forced by hunger, they mingle in fierce battle and devour each other. There are three species which are common in houses, the domestic rat, the surmolot, and the mouse. The domestic rat, Mus ratus, was not known to the ancients and appears to be originally from America. The time of its introduction into Europe is not known, but it is ascertained that it existed in great numbers in the places which the surmolot now occupies after having almost entirely destroyed its species. The domestic rat has become quite rare in Paris and is not often found except on farms where it feeds on grain, meal, fruits, and vegetables of all kinds that it meets. The taste for animal matter is very decided and it pursues small animals. In country houses where it propagates, it is really a scourge by the damage it occasions by eating linen, leather harness, bacon, in a word, everything that falls in its way. The Sermolot, Mus decumanus, the Norway or brown rat, is the largest of the rats. It is seven inches long without including the tail and its coat is reddish brown. Though very abundant in Europe at the present day, it was not introduced there till sometime in the 18th century. Vessels trading to India carried it to England, whence it found its way into France and all other parts of Europe, America, and wherever Europeans have settled colonies. About the environs of Paris, brown rats are very numerous on the commons, and particularly on the voyer of Mount Faucon, where, towards evening, they may be seen entirely covering the carcasses of horses that have succumbed during the day. They are also found in the sewers in the neighborhoods of markets, and in all places where animal substances in a state of decomposition are accumulated in any quantity, and where grain is abundant. They dig holes scarcely deep enough to hold their bodies. The mouse, Mus musculus, is the smallest species of rat that inhabits our dwellings, and it is the only one that was known to the ancients. In the woodwork of their houses, and in old walls, where the plaster is easily detached, these little animals excavate galleries of greater or less length, in which they habitually dwell. They feed on all articles, whether animal or vegetable, that fall in their way, and are particularly fond of tallow, bacon, and other fat substances. Sometimes they are found wild in the woods, where they feed chiefly on acorns and beech nuts. The mulot or field mouse, Mus sylvaticus, is a species of the same genus as the preceding, which is intermediate in size between the rat and the mouse, but it does not visit the habitations of man. Its ordinary dwelling place is in forests, where it often commits considerable havoc, either in digging up the acorns or beech nuts that have been planted, or by gnawing the bark of young trees. It also does considerable damage to the harvest, in company with the true field mouse, 
by cutting the stalks of the corn, wheat, etc., to eat a few grains and waste the rest. These animals also store provisions, acorns, filberts, chestnuts, etc., which they deposit in holes in the ground about a foot deep, concealed by some bushes. The hamsters have nearly the same teeth as the rats, but their tail is short and hairy, and both sides of the mouth are hollowed into sacks or cheek pouches, like certain monkeys, in which they carry the grain upon which they feed. The common hamster, Crescitus vulgaris, is larger than the rat, reddish-gray above, black on the flanks and underneath, with three whitish spots on each side. It feeds on roots and all the cereal grains cultivated by man. It can, however, live on flesh, and when pressed by hunger, does not even spare its own species. It digs a hole with two galleries, an oblique one, to carry out the riddance of the earth, and a perpendicular one, for the entrance and exit of the animal. These channels lead to different circular excavations, which communicate with each other by horizontal tunnels or galleries. One of these chambers is furnished with a bed of dry herbs, which serves for the retreat of the animal, and the others are designed to contain provisions which are collected in the warm season for the winter's use. This animal lives solitary, but is numerous in Germany and different sandy parts of Europe and Asia. It is injurious to farmers on account of the quantity of grain it collects. End of Lesson 7, Part 1 Lesson 7, Part 2 Tribe of Field Mice This little group is nearly related to that of the rats. Their external form is nearly the same, but their molar teeth possess a peculiar conformation which approaches to that of essentially herbivorous animals. In this tribe are placed field mice, properly so called, lemmings, etc. Field mice, properly so called, arvicola, have a squat form, the same number of toes as rats, armed with hooked nails fit for digging, and the tail is hairy and about the length of the body. There are several species known in France, the Campagnol, Arvicola arvalis, Mus arvalis, or little field rat, is improperly called Mulo in some provinces. It is of the size of the mouse, and inhabits holes which it digs in the fields. Sometimes it is excessively multiplied and commits, as well as the Mulo, great ravages. The water rat, Mus amphibius, is also a species of Arvicola. It is rather larger than the common rat, and inhabits the banks of streams, but it neither swims nor dives well. The lemmings, Georicus, Mus lemus of Linnaeus, another species of field mouse which is found in Siberia, are celebrated for the distant migrations they make every year in numerous troops. They are small rodentia that inhabit the shores of the icy ocean, and travel in numerous bands, laying waste everything that comes in their way. They are of the size of the rat, and their colour varies from yellow to black. Tribe of Gerboas This tribe consists of a small number of noras that considerably resemble the rats. The tail is long and tufted at the end, but they are most remarkable in their posterior extremities, which in comparison with the anterior are of a most immoderate length. They are met with from Barbary to the shores of the Caspian Sea. Tribe of Rat Moles The Rodentia included in this division, Spalax, resemble the moles both in their habits and external form. They are essentially diggers and live underground. They feed on roots only. Tribe of Chinchillas The Chinchillas are small Rodentia of South America, that afford a most beautiful and much esteemed fur, which were nevertheless unknown to naturalists until modern times. In many respects they are intermediate between the field mice and hares. Several species are known. The chinchilla lanigra is the only one whose fur is esteemed. It inhabits the mountains of Peru and Chile. This animal is smaller than the rabbit, and its head, which is ornamented with long moustaches, resembles that of the squirrel. Its ears are large, its paws are delicate, 
and differ little in length. Its coat, which is of a beautiful grey, undulated with white above, and of a bright grey underneath, is composed of extremely fine soft hair, and its tail is blackish, particularly at its end. It lives in burrows and feeds principally on bulbous roots. It is hunted with dogs trained to drag it from its hole without injuring its coat. It is found, especially in the neighborhood of Coquimbo and Copiapo, and its fur is sent to Santiago and Valparaiso, whence it is exported to Europe and the United States. But it has been hunted so actively that for some time it has been scarcely seen, and in order to prevent the total destruction of the race, the pursuit of the animal has been prohibited. Tribe of Castors the rodentia which form this tribe are distinguished by the conformation of their teeth, by their essentially aquatic mode of life, by their feet having five toes, and the hind ones being palmate. They are divided into two genera, the most important of which is that of castors properly so called. Beavers, of castors properly so called, are distinguished from all other rodentia by their horizontally flattened tail, which is nearly of an oval form and covered with scales. Beavers are large animals whose mode of life is entirely aquatic, their feet and tail enabling them to swim well. They feed chiefly on bark and other hard substances, and they make use of their strong incisor teeth for cutting all kinds of trees. The beaver, castor fiber, of all quadrupeds, bestows most time and labor on the construction of his dwelling, at which he works in company, in the most solitary parts of North America, from the thirtieth to the sixtieth degree of north latitude. He is also met with in Siberia, Norway, Germany, and in France on the banks of the Rhone and Garonne. These animals are always found in the vicinity of rivers and lakes. In the summer they inhabit burrows which they dig along the shores, but in winter they retire into huts constructed with the greatest care on the banks or in the midst of waters. In general, they select situations where the waters are so deep that they do not freeze to the bottom, and prefer running water, because they cut the wood necessary for their building above the spot where they work, and then the current carries it where it is required. If the water is stagnant, they at once commence their houses, but if it is running, they assemble often two or three hundred in a gang, and first form a shelving dam or dike to maintain the water at an equal height. This dam is formed of branches interlaced with each other, the intervals of which are filled with stones and mud, and plastered over with a thick solid coat. It is commonly ten or twelve feet thick at the base, and is sometimes of very considerable extent. At the expiration of a few years it is usually covered with vegetation, and thus converted into a substantial hedge. The dam being finished, they separate into small parties of two or three families, and set about constructing their huts, which are built against the dam in the same manner, but with less solidity. Each hut accommodates two or three families. It has two stories, the upper one being dry for the residence of the animals, and the lower one under water for the store of bark upon which they feed. Only the latter opens externally, and the entrance is entirely under water. Their work is carried on in the night only, but with astonishing rapidity. When the season of snow approaches, the casters assemble in great numbers and set about repairing the huts which they had abandoned in the spring, or construct new ones. Beavers, whose coat is ordinarily of a uniform reddish-brown, but sometimes of a beautiful black, and at others white, are provided with a great abundance of a greyish soft down of extreme fineness, which is concealed beneath long silky hairs, which, resisting the water, or not becoming wet, protects them against cold and humidity, but this fur which is so useful to them often becomes the cause of their destruction, because it is of great use to man, and to procure it these animals are actively pursued. Beaver skins are an important article of commerce. They are used as fur and in the manufacture of hats. The most beautiful are from those animals that are killed in winter in the coldest parts of North America. A single skin furnishes about a pound and a half of down, 
which in France is worth from thirty-five to forty dollars the pound. As many as one hundred and fifty thousand of these skins have been imported into Europe in a single year. Castorium, an article of commerce also furnished by these animals, is a solid, fragile substance of a strong, nauseous odour. It is sold in the pouch in which it is naturally formed. A castor furnishes about two ounces. The women of some savage tribes use it to grease their hair, and in Europe and the United States it is employed as a medicine. About three thousand pounds are annually imported into France. Tribe of Porcupines Animals of the tribe of porcupines are recognized at first sight by the stiff and pointed quills or spines with which their back is armed and from this peculiarity they somewhat resemble the hedgehogs. Their grunting voice and thick truncated muzzle have caused them to be compared to the hog, and hence their French name, Porx Epique. Porcupines proper, Hystrix, have an arched or more or less convex head. They have four toes before and five behind, all armed with stout nails. There are many species known. The European porcupine, Hystrix cristata, has very long spines annulated black and white. A mane composed of long hairs occupies the head and back of the neck. The tail is short and furnished with hollow truncated tubes or bristles, suspended to slender tubercles which make a noise when shaken by the animal. This animal avoids inhabited places and selects for its retreat stony arid hillocks with a southern or southeastern exposure in the declivities of which it excavates deep holes with many outlets, where it lives in profound solitude and great security. It passes the day concealed at the bottom of its burrow, and provides for its wants during the night only. Its chief food consists of berries, fruits, buds, roots, etc. For the porcupine winter is a time of sleep but its lethargy does not seem to be very profound, because it makes its appearance on the first bright days of spring. It was believed for a long time that porcupines had the faculty of discharging or shooting off their spines, but it is ascertained that they are at times accidentally detached, and also by the shock they receive when the animal raises them for its own defence. This species is chiefly met within the kingdom of Naples, and the southern parts of the Roman states. Other rodentia that have a prehensile tail, like that of the sapajous, and climb trees, are ranged at the side of porcupines. Tribe of Hares The rodentia of which this tribe is composed differ from other animals of the same order by the arrangement of their incisor teeth, which are double, each one of them having a smaller one behind it, they have five toes before and four behind, and the soles of their feet, as well as the outside of their mouth, are furnished with hairs like the rest of the body. The hairs proper, lepus, are recognized by their long ears, their short tail, and the length of their hind feet. They are nocturnal animals, and of all their senses that of hearing appears to be the most perfect. They are extremely timid and fly from the slightest danger. Their walk consists in a succession of leaps, and their run only differs in rapidity. They inhabit woods, copses, rocks, and sometimes plains, and feed on vegetable substances, which modify the taste of their flesh, according as these may be more or less aromatic. It is known, indeed, that such is the cause of the difference between the taste of the wild and domestic hare. Some provide for their individual security and that of their young by excavating deep holes, or by inhabiting rents and hollows in rocks, while others content themselves with a furrow, a stump, a copse, or the trunk of a hollow tree. The common hare, Lepus timidus, is recognized by a yellowish-gray coat, having ears a tenth longer than its head tipped with black, and the tail white with a black line above and of the length of its thigh. It lives alone and cannot be domesticated. It differs from the rabbit in not digging a burrow, but is contented with a hole, the situation of which it changes according to the season. The rabbit, Lepus cuniculus, is smaller than the hare, 
and has ears shorter than the head and without the black tip. Its tail is also shorter than the thigh and brown above. It appears to be originally from Spain, but now abounds throughout Europe. It lives in troops and burrows in dry soils. It accustoms itself to the domestic condition, and in time assumes very various colors. Tribes of Cabayes and Pacas The Rodentia that constitute these two tribes belong to America, and generally resemble each other in form. Many of them, however, are higher on their legs than most animals of the same order. The guinea pig, Mus porcellus, of Linnaeus, belongs to the tribe of Cabayes. This small animal, which is originally from South America, where it is still found in its wild state, is extensively multiplied throughout Europe, where in some houses it is kept under the impression that its odour drives away rats. General Remarks on Peltries Almost all the peltries, or furs, in use are derived from animals of the two orders, the description of which we have just concluded, namely the Carnaria and Rodentia. The furs most esteemed are those in which the long, silky, thick hairs cover a considerable quantity of down. They all come from cold countries. The only peltries from warm regions are those with smooth hair. Climate has very great influence upon the fur of animals. When nature has designed them to live in cold countries, they have a thick, warm fur, while in hot climates they only possess short, dry hairs not very closely set, and there is no soft down growing up between these hairs, as is the case in the first. The seasons also exercise an influence on furs. In the summer the ordinary hairs are not so long nor so abundant as in winter and it is only in this latter season that there exists any large quantity of fur at their base. Sometimes very considerable changes take place in the colour of their hairs at different seasons. At a certain time of the year the mammiferous animals lose their hair, which is replaced by a new growth. This change usually occurs in spring and autumn. Sometimes it occurs without the colour of the coat being modified while at others the new hair bears no resemblance whatever to the old. Thus it is that in the north the squirrel, instead of always preserving its reddish colour, assumes in winter a pretty grey. The Isartis, or blue fox, of Siberia undergoes changes of colour not less considerable, and hence its winter fur is very much sought, while its summer coat is almost valueless. Some furs are supplied by animals that inhabit France and the neighbouring countries, but the majority of them come from North America or Siberia. The peltries, which are called in France sauvagine, are furnished by the fox, the beech martin, the polecat, the river otter, the domestic cat, the hare, and the rabbit. Most of these skins are dyed in imitation of the more precious furs. This mode of imparting artificial colours, known in manufactures under the name of lustering, is generally affected by the successive application of different coats of colouring matter, by the aid of a brush rather than by immersion, because it is easier in this way to imitate nature, by giving the different tints to the base and point of the hair. This business is extensively carried on in Paris and Lyon, with the greatest degree of perfection. In the Empire of Russia, the pursuit of animals for their fur is chiefly carried on in that vast extent of country between the east of the Volga and Kamschatka, and also on the northwest coast of America, where a great number of sea otters are taken, the fur of which is highly esteemed and is principally sold to the Chinese. Siberia furnishes different species of foxes, the skins of which are often of great value, note, such as that of the Isartis or blue fox the black fox, etc., end note, the martin, the sable, the ermine, etc. Bears also furnish a good proportion of peltries. The immense forests of the north, east, and west of America furnish beaver, martin, river otter, bear, skins, etc. The annual sale of peltries on an average of four years in London is nearly 500,000 skins of various kinds, which affords some general notion of the value of the fur trade. Of the manufacture of felt, 
The skins of many animals of the order of Rodentia not only serve for peltry, but are also employed in the manufacture of fur hats. Hairs have the property of mixing and matting so closely together when worked that very substantial tissues may be formed of them, and it is in this way that what is termed felt is produced. Fur hats are manufactured principally from the down of the rabbit and hare. Formerly a great deal of the hair of casters was employed, but its high price has driven it almost entirely out of use. The manufacture of hats of felt is quite simple, consisting of a series of three operations, namely the cutting and preparation of the hair, pressing and dressing. In France, women are usually employed in the first part of the work. They first remove the hair that covers the fur, and then pass the skin to a workman whose business it is to wet the fur or down with a liquid composed of quicksilver dissolved in weak nitric acid. The object of this operation is to increase the felting property of the hair. When this is done, the skins are dried by a stove, and then handed to the cutters or shearers, who, provided with a cutting instrument of a particular form, detach the down from the back and flanks of the skin. The hair thus prepared is delivered to the hatter, who proceeds to felting. For this purpose he places on a table a quantity of down sufficient to make a hat, and begins the work by an operation called bowing. He is provided with a sort of large bow, which is suspended from the ceiling, the string of which he passes into the heap of hair, and causes it to vibrate. By this means he throws into the air all the delicate filaments which constitute the down, separates, and mixes them in every way. The light mass thus obtained is then spread on a cloth or leather, and pressed in every direction. By this process the hair is by degrees more intimately mixed, and begins to felt. When this is over we have a large, slightly consistent cake, which is then kneaded or worked, taking the precaution to dip it from time to time in hot water, slightly sharpened with sulphuric acid. This kneading or working is performed on an inclined table or board placed around the boiler, and is executed by the hand, a wooden roller, or a brush. In proportion as the hair felts, the cake becomes more and more dense, and by working it in one direction more than another, it is made to assume an oval shape. Generally, a cake or foundation of common hair is first prepared, and afterwards gilded. That is to say, there is incorporated upon its surface a coat of finer hairs, which are kneaded much less, so they remain partially free, and constitute a bed or layer of soft down, which hatters call the feather or nap. For the gilding, they use about an ounce of the fine fur of the Russian hair. One half of this quantity of beaver hair covers as much and produces a much handsomer effect, but from its great price it is seldom used except in mixture with other hair. Finally, to complete the manufacture of a hat, the felt is softened by steam and formed on wooden blocks. Then it is dyed, and its interior surface glued to impart to it greater firmness. This branch of manufacture is carried on almost everywhere in France, but is most extensive in Paris and Lyon. There are about 1,100 hat manufactories in France, in which 17,000 workmen find employment, and the annual product of their labour is estimated at 19 millions of francs, or more than three and a half millions of dollars. But the business has decreased in importance of late, owing to the general use of silk hats. After the hair and fur have been removed from them, these skins are converted into glue. The skin is insoluble in water under ordinary circumstances, but if it be boiled for a long time in that liquid, it softens, dissolves, and is transformed into a particular product called gelatin, which on cooling forms a jelly more or less solid. The same is true of the tendons and various other tissues of the animal economy, and the gelatin thus obtained constitutes common glue. End of Lesson 7, Part 2 Lesson 8 Order of Edentata, Zoological Characters, Division into Three Families, Family of Tardigrada, Organization, Habits, Eye or Sloth, Family of Ordinary Edentata, Armadillos, Anteaters, Manis, Family of Monotremata, Peculiarities of their Organization, Ornithorhynchus, 
Echidna, Order of Pachydermata, Zoological Characters, Peculiarities of their Organization, Division into Three Families, Family of Proboscidiana, Genus Elephant, Organization, Habits, Use, Ivory, Elephants of Asia, Africa, and Siberia. Order of Edentata. Under this head is placed a considerable number of animals remarkable for a certain slowness and a want of agility owing to the position of their extremities. In general, their toes are enveloped in stout nails upon which they walk with difficulty. Their common distinctive character is the wanting of teeth in the anterior part of the jaws, that is, the incisor teeth. Sometimes the canine and molar teeth are also wanting, so that the animal is then entirely edentate. This order is divided into three families, which may be recognized by the characters enumerated in the following table. Edentata, without a cloaca and having the face very short. Family, tardigrada. Edentata, without a cloaca and having the muzzle long and pointed. Family, ordinary edentata. Edentata, provided with a cloaca, family, monotremata. Note, that is to say, having the rectum and duct for the passage of the urine opening into a common cavity called cloaca, which has a single outlet, as is the case in birds and reptiles. Family of tardigrada, or sloths. The sloths, bradipus, bear some resemblance to deformed and stupefied monkeys, and they have in their whole being something so disproportioned and strange that at first sight they might be taken as the product of some fantastic freak of nature. But when these anomalies are closely studied, we find they have their use, and that they all tend, however grotesque they seem, to adapt the organs of the animal to the purposes for which its kind of life has designed them. When on the ground, nothing is more awkward, more ungraceful and powerless than the sloths. Their short, stout body is borne on extremities so unequal in length that in order to walk, the animal is obliged to tread on its elbows. The pelvis is broad and the thighs are directed so much outwards that they cannot bring the knees together. At the same time, their hind feet are articulated so obliquely upon the legs that they only touch the ground by their external edge, and the toes, joined together by the skin, do not show except by their enormous hooked nails, which are flexed when at rest, and they possess so little movability that at a certain age the first phalanges become soldered to the bones of the metacarpus and metatarsus. The sitting and vertical position is least inconvenient to them, but their head being in a line with the axis of the body, their mouth then looks upwards, rendering it very difficult for them to graze upon the ground. Add to this that their flexor muscles are much more powerful than their extensors, the latter being those which sustain the weight of the body when walking, and that their motions are extremely slow, and we can then form an idea of the restraint to which the mode of conformation of these animals must subject them when placed under the same circumstances in which most quadrupeds live and move without inconvenience. But it would be wrong to believe that nature has made any imperfect or grotesque beings. It is altogether otherwise. She has designed the sloths to live hooked to branches of trees, and in this position, in which the most ordinary quadrupeds would be quickly fatigued, the anomalies of structure we have just pointed out become so many happy provisions to enable these edentata to climb and cling with the least possible muscular effort and to facilitate the prehension of their food suspended over their heads. The dental system of these animals also possesses distinctive peculiarities. Their canines are long and sharp, and their molars are cylindrical. Their stomach is divided into four pouches analogous to the four stomachs of the ruminantia. They have two mammae on the chest and only give birth to one young one at a time, which is carried on the back. They feed on leaves. They inhabit the forests in the interior of South America. The most remarkable species of the many that are known is the eye or the three-fingered sloth, Bradipus tridactylus. It is the only mammal that has more than seven cervical vertebrae. 
It has nine. It is about the size of a cat. Its arms are twice as long as its legs, and the hair which covers its back is long, coarse, without elasticity, and resembles withered grass. Its name is derived from its cry. Family of Ordinary Edentata Animals of this family are recognized by their pointed muzzle. Of the genera composing this family, the first, Armadillos, Dasypus, are very singular animals, having the head, the body, and very often the tail covered by a hard, scaly coat composed of compartments like mosaic. This substance, which may be considered as agglutinated hair, forms one shield on the front, a second very large and convex one on the shoulders, a third similar to the preceding on the croup, and between these two shields several movable parallel bands which give the body the faculty of bending. The tail is sometimes covered with a succession of rings, and sometimes, like the legs, only with different tubercles. A few scattering hairs grow between the scales, or on parts of the body that are not covered by these plates. These animals have large ears and large nails. The number of the latter is always five behind, and sometimes four, and at others five before. The armadillos vary in size from that of a badger to that of a hedgehog. They are stout in the body and low on their legs. They are all originally from the hot or temperate parts of America. They burrow and feed partly on insects, partly on vegetables, and in part on the dead bodies. Second, the anteaters, Myrmecophaga, inhabit the same countries as the armadillos, but are readily distinguished from them because their body is hairy like that of most mammals, and their muzzle, drawn out in a long cylindrical tube, is terminated by a small mouth which is entirely without teeth. Their jaws, which are very long, they can scarcely separate from each other, nor can they use them to seize or compress their food, but they are provided with a very long filiform tongue, which they can project to a considerable distance beyond the mouth, and which always being covered by a viscid gluey humour, serves them to seize the ants and other insects upon which they feed. By the assistance of their strong, trenchant nails, which vary in number according to the species, the anteaters tear up the nests of the termites, or white ants, and at the moment these little insects sally forth in crowds from their retreat, to form a rampart and defend themselves, they protrude upon them their viscid tongue, and drawing it in again, suddenly convey them into their mouth. When at rest, these nails, which serve also as defensive arms, are folded back against a callosity on the wrist, and the animal only rests its foot on the side, and its gait is slow. Some species have a prehensile tail, by which they suspend themselves from branches of trees. The largest species, called Tamanoir, does not possess this faculty. It is four feet long, and inhabits low, humid places. Third, the manis, or pangolins, are without teeth, have a very extensible tongue, and live on ants and termites like the preceding. But their body, extremities, and tail are covered with large, trenchant scales, disposed like tiles, and which are raised when they roll themselves into a ball to avoid danger. A few long bristles grow at the base of these scales. They all belong to the old continent, Asia or Africa. Family of Monotremata It includes animals of a strange construction, which unite the characters of their mammal with those of the oviparous animals, and whose place in the classification of mammalia is still a subject of controversy with some naturalists. The monotremata, like birds, have but one opening for the escape of excrement and urine, but there is found under the belly two glandular masses, which most naturalists consider to be mamma. Besides the five nails on all the feet, the males have, on the hind legs, a peculiar spur traversed by a canal, from which issues a liquid which is secreted by a gland adhering to the thigh. It is asserted that wounds inflicted by them are poisonous. The accounts of travellers and of the natives of the countries which they inhabit seem to establish that they lay eggs like birds, but this is still doubtful. They are peculiar to New Holland and Van Diemen's land. This singular family contains two genera. 
first the echidna resemble the hedgehogs because they are covered above with numerous spines mingled with hairs and below they have hair only the body is stout and short the neck is scarcely perceptible the tail is merely a tubercle covered with spines their long muzzle terminated by a small mouth contains a very long tongue which they protrude to seize insects upon which they feed they have no teeth but their palate is armed with several ranges of little spines directed backwards they have short feet armed with nails for digging these animals readily excavate the earth and form subterraneous abodes near to trees like the hedgehogs they roll themselves into a ball second the ornithorhynchus has a small elongated body a small head a very strong tail which is short flattened and at its root as wide as the body of the animal like that of the beaver it is covered with hair and the extremities are very short and the anterior widely separated from the posterior ones the muzzle is terminated by a horny beak like that of a duck and like it the edges are provided with small transverse plates in the back part of the mouth only it has two teeth without roots and flat crowns on each side of both jaws the tongue is large and soft the nares are round situate towards the superior extremity of the horny beak the neck is short and the general form of the body is nearly cylindrical the fore feet have a membrane which not only unites the toes but is carried considerably beyond the nails on the hind feet the membrane terminates at the root of the nails as might be anticipated from what we have said of their conformation the ornithorynchi are aquatic animals they inhabit the marshes and rivers in the interior of new holland and live like ducks if we may thus apply the word by sifting the mud to separate from it insects and larvae the species best known is the ornithorynchus paradoxus order of pachydermata the animals comprised in this order are remarkable for the hard thick hide with which most of them are covered they are ungulate mammals that is the extremity of the foot is enveloped in a very large nail constituting a hoof they have generally a simple stomach and do not ruminate their teeth present great varieties in form and structure in some the incisors are trenchant in others they are wanting and in others again they are replaced by tusks the same is true of the canines while some resemble ordinary canines others become powerful and dangerous defensive weapons and others again want them altogether the molars have wide irregular surfaces suited for grinding they are entirely without a clavicle and are incapable of bending the fingers toes which are in number either five or three or only one and rarely two the order of pachydermata includes the largest terrestrial mammals known except the horse they are all clumsy and have a heavy indolent gait are very dirty and particularly fond of wallowing in the mud they continually dwell in troops in warm covered places in marshy situations where they find aquatic stalks and roots suited to their wants sometimes the neck is very short but then as in the case of the elephant they are provided with a trunk capable of raising from the ground all objects which they wish to convey to the mouth or remaining almost constantly in the water they can without stooping catch the leaves and stalks floating on its surface these animals which resemble each other in the general features of their organization are still distinguishable by important particulars which has made it necessary to divide them into three families the proboscidiana the ordinary pachydermata and the solipeds which may be recognized by the following characters pachydermata having tusks a prehensile trunk and five toes on all its feet family proboscidiana pachydermata not having a prehensile trunk and not having five toes on all the feet having at least two toes and at most four family pachydermata ordinaria pachydermata not having a prehensile trunk and not having five toes on all the feet a single toe apparent family solipeds family of proboscidiana these are pachydermata with a trunk and tusks they have five toes on all the feet 
but encrusted in a sort of hoof of callous skin. Their nails only are apparent. They have neither canine or incisor teeth, but they have in the upper jaw two tusks of enormous size. The mammae, two in number, are placed upon the chest. This family includes one living genus only, the genus elephant, elephas. This genus comprises animals of gigantic size, naturally mild and docile in disposition, which enables them readily to bear the domestic condition. The amplitude required by the alveoli of the upper jaw to contain the two tusks elevates it so much and at the same time shortens the bones of the nose that the nares in the skeleton are found near the top of the face. But in the living animal they are prolonged into a cylindrical trunk consisting of a double tube composed of fibers and many small muscles variously interlaced which is movable in every direction and terminates above by an appendix in the form of a finger. This trunk, which communicates with the nasal fossa, serves the elephant to seize hold of everything he wishes to convey to the mouth, to pump up his drink, and then pour it into his throat. It thus compensates for the shortness of his neck. By means of this curious instrument, the elephant can uproot trees, untie knots, open a lock, and even ride with a pen. The eyes are small and the pupil round. The ears are wide and lie close against the head, but quite movable. The parietes of the cranium contain great vacuities, which augment the size of the head and render the front projecting. The skin is thick, hard and wrinkled, and almost without hair. The tail is small. These animals have sharp sight. Their hearing is quick, their sense of smell delicate their intelligence developed, their perception ready, their prudence extreme. They remember kindness as well as harshness. Their gait is heavy, but the length of their steps gives rapidity to their march. Although the elephant is the most vigorous and most powerful of quadrupeds, in a state of nature he is neither cruel nor formidable. Peaceful as he is brave, he never abuses his power or exerts his strength, except in his own defense. He is rarely seen alone in the desert. The herds usually consist of from forty to one hundred elephants. The oldest marches at the head of the troop, and the next in age watches the rear. It has been said the elephant never lies down, but this is an error. He lies on his side and sleeps profoundly. Elephants are tamed when taken young. They may be employed for the purpose of transport. They carry about two thousand pounds weight and will travel without being very much fatigued a distance of from fifteen to twenty leagues. These animals swim well. They live to the age of nearly two hundred years. Two species of elephants are known. First, the Indian or Asiatic elephant, Elephas indicus, has an oblong head, concave front, ears of middling size, and four nails on the hind feet. It is met with in all the warm parts of India, where the natives pursue, take, tame, and employ it as a beast of burden and draught. Its tasks often remain very short. Second, the African elephant, Elephas africanus, has a round head, a convex front. The ears are large, and there are but three nails on the hind feet. It inhabits Africa from Senegal to the Cape of Good Hope. It is more fierce than that of India, and its tusks are much longer. The female has them as long as the male. They have not yet succeeded in taming this species. In Siam, there is a variety of elephant which is white and held in religious veneration. The tusks of elephants furnish true ivory. It is known by the curved lozenge-formed lines its cut surface exhibits when polished. That which is obtained from the animal immediately after its death is called green ivory. It is more esteemed than the other, which comes from tusks found a long time after they have been separated from the animal. It is said the first is least liable to become yellow. An elephant found some years ago in the ice on the coast of Siberia appears to have been covered with a coat of thick hair and fur, which leads to the supposition that this species, which has long since disappeared from the earth, lived in cold climates. The mammoth and mastodon are extinct species belonging to the family of proboscideans. 
End of Lesson 8 Lesson 9 Family of Pachydermata ordinaria Genus of Hippopotamus Genus of Hogs Wild Hog Domestic Hog Genus of Rhinoceros Family of Solipedes Horse Habits Signs of the Age of Horses Principal Races Ass Zebra Kawaga Onaga Family of Pachydermata ordinaria this family is distinguished from the preceding because the animals belonging to it have no trunk, or at least no prehensile trunk, and from the family which follows because the animals composing it have several distinct toes. They are more or less omnivorous. It is divided into several genera, amongst which we will mention the following. Pachydermata ordinaria, having toes in number equal, and the foot having the appearance of being forked, having on all the feet four equal toes. Genus Hippopotamus. Pachydermata ordinaria, having toes in number equal, and the foot having the appearance of being forked, having on all the feet two large middle toes, armed with strong hoofs, while the lateral toes are too short to rest on the ground. Genus Hog. Pachydermata ordinaria, having toes in number unequal, and the foot not forked. Three toes on all the feet. Genus Rhinoceros. Pachydermata ordinaria, having toes in number unequal, and the foot not forked. Four toes before and three behind. Genus Tapir. The Hippopotamus, the river horse. Animals of this genus have a massive body, short legs and tail, inflated muzzle, and the skin almost free of hair. These animals, whose belly almost reaches the ground, so short are their extremities, live in the rivers of southern Africa, and feed on vegetable substances. They are brownish-black, and are from ten to eleven feet long, and from four to five feet in height. They seek their food in the water as well as on land. Sometimes three or four of them are seen together in a river, or near a cataract, forming a sort of line, and rushing upon the fishes which the rapidity of the current brings towards them. They swim with great vigour, and remain a long time under water without any necessity of breathing the air. They conduct themselves with so much precaution, rising so little above the surface of the water, that they can scarcely be seen. During the night they leave the rivers to visit plantations of sugar, millet, or rice, which they devour with avidity. They are so impetuous in their march that they break down everything that comes in their way. Their fierce character renders them very formidable. Hogs, sus, also have four toes on all the feet, but two of them are very large, directed forwards, and two which are very small and external scarcely touch the ground. Their incisors vary in number, and the canines protrude from the mouth and are all recurved like true tasks. Their muzzle is terminated by a truncated, fleshy button suitable for rooting the ground. Their sense of smell is very fine, and their tongue is soft. They live in troops in forests, where they feed on roots and fruits, although they manifest no repugnance to animal food. To this genus belongs the wild hog, Sus scrofa, which is the parent stock of our domestic hog, has a thick, short body, straight ears, prismatic tusks, which curve outwards, hair bristled and blackish. It is smaller than the hog, and it does not vary in its color. It is always a dark iron gray, with black ears, feet, and tail. Its muzzle is longer than that of the hog, and its tusks, which arise from the two jaws, are much larger. They sometimes grow to be a foot long, the inferior ones are most formidable and inflict serious wounds. It produces six or eight young ones in a birth every year, which are striped black and white. The domestic hog varies in size in the length of its extremities, in the direction of the ears, and in color. It is white or black or reddish or variegated. Its fecundity is much increased by domestication. The sow producing two litters every year off from twelve to fifteen pigs each. The hog continues to grow for five or six years and may live twenty. 
It is very voracious and does not even spare its own young. This is one of the most useful of animals on account of the quality of its flesh and lard and from the facility of feeding and multiplying it. There are many varieties. The rhinoceros is a large, dull animal remarkable for the great thickness of its skin and the solid horn it carries on its nose, the bones of which are very thick and united in the form of an arch to sustain it. This horn, which is of a fibrous horny nature, adheres to the skin and seems to be composed of agglutinated hairs. It has no bony axis in its center like the horns of the ruminants. Animals of this genus inhabit the warmest parts of the old continent and are generally found in places where elephants are met with. They seek shade and humid situations and wallow like the hippopotamus and hog to supple their hide. Their intelligence is very limited and their nature is fierce and indomitable. Several species are known, some of which belong to India and the others to Africa. Tapirs are animals which very much resemble the hog, but are distinguished from it at first sight by the small fleshy trunk formed by the prolongation of their nose, which is susceptible of being elongated and shortened, but it is not an organ of prehension like that of the elephant. The American tapir, Tapir americanus, which is common in humid places in the warm countries of South America, is about the size of a small ass. Its skin, which is nearly bare, is brown. Its flesh is eaten. A second species inhabits the most elevated regions of the Cordilleras of the Andes, and has long black hair. It seems to have given rise to a great many fabulous stories among the Indians. A third species is found in the forests of Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula. The griffin of the Asians, which is generally regarded altogether as a fabulous animal, might have been this latter, a little disfigured by voyagers, and to which artists have added wings and a tail in architectural style. Family of Solipeds The family of solipeds comprises all quadrupeds that have but a single toe apparent, and consequently a single hoof. This family includes but one genus. The genus horse, Equus, comprises the horse properly so called, the ass, the zebra, and several other species. These animals have six trenchant incisors in each jaw, which, in the earlier years of life, have a hollow or depression on the crown, and on each side of them six molars. The males have besides in the upper jaw and sometimes in both two small canines, which are almost always wanting in the female. Between these canines and the first molar there is a vacant space, called bar in French, in which rests the bit by the means of which man overcomes and controls this animal. They have a projecting eye with a pupil in the form of a long square, the ear is long and movable, the nares without muzzle, the tongue very soft, the sense of hearing acute, the upper lip is very movable and serves them as an instrument of prehension. The whole body is covered in a thick coat of hair with a mane on the neck. Their tail is of moderate size but often adorned with long hair. Horses are essentially herbivorous, though their stomach is simple in form and moderate in size. The horse is contented with the commonest grass when accustomed to it from an early period. He is fond of dry pasturages. In the stable he feeds on hay, luzerne, trefoil, veggies, oats. Wheat, barley, and oat straw also agree with him when he gets at the same time a portion of good hay and grain. The horse, properly so called, is distinguished from other species of this genus by the uniform color of his robe and by his tail being ornamented with long hair from its origin. He exceeds them also in height as well as in the beauty of his form. The horse, the noble companion of man in war and the labors of the field, the arts and commerce, is the most important and most carefully attended of all the animals which we have brought under our control. It is originally from the great plains of Central Asia, but is now spread in great numbers throughout almost all parts of the world, and no longer exists in the wild state, except in places where horses previously domesticated have been left at liberty, as in Tartary and America. The importation of these animals into the latter country dates only about three hundred years back, and nevertheless wild horses exist there in immense numbers. It is asserted 
that troops consisting of more than ten thousand individuals are occasionally met with the horse may live about thirty years but when old he loses nearly all his estimable qualities before he attains four or five years he cannot be mounted or employed in draught for this reason it will be perceived it is very important to be able to ascertain the age of horses up to the age of about eight years it may be known with certainty by the successive changes which occur in the dental system but beyond this period there is no positive sign of their age and they say they mark no longer because at that time the hollows on the surface of their incisors have been effaced horses vary very much from each other in size the beauty of their form and in their speed and several different races are distinguished amongst them the most celebrated is the arabian which is small in size but admirable in form and extremely swift the english horses owe their good qualities in a great measure to their mixture with the arabian in france there are several races which are more or less prized the horses of limousin are most esteemed for the saddle the norman race is equally prized but is not so fine the race of bretagne is principally employed in posting and the race of boulogne for draught and similar service the ass echus asinus is known by his size which is generally smaller than that of the horse by his long ears by the black cross over his shoulders and by the tuft of hair which terminates the tail though not so powerful as the horse but being more patient and quiet he is not less valuable to the inhabitants of the country comparatively he is stronger and hardier than his happy rival subject to fewer diseases his life is sustained at little cost he is only particular in his drink and requires pure limpid water he is three or four years before he attains his full growth and lives from twenty to twenty-five years he sleeps less than the horse when young the ass is animated and sprightly but bad treatment soon destroys his vivacity he becomes slow stupid and headstrong the milk of the ass which very closely resembles that of woman is considered to be a wholesome diet and even a remedy in some diseases such as thysis the zebra ecus zebra which is very like the ass in form and proportions is one of the most elegant and most intractable of animals his skin has the softness of satin and is adorned with beautiful ribbon-like stripes in the female these stripes are alternately black and white and in the male brown and yellow the body is round and full the limbs are remarkably slender his voice resembles the sound of a hunter's horn the zebra is found principally in the southern parts of africa numerous troops are often seen grazing on the extensive plains of the cape of good hope the kawaga ecus kuacha which resembles the horse more than the zebra is striped only on the shoulders and back his name is derived from his cry which resembles the barking of a dog the colonists of the vicinity of the cape of good hope have accustomed it to harness and keep it with their herds which they say it protects from hyenas and other ferocious animals of the same size the onaga ecus montanus or mountain horse which has not been very long known to naturalists is smaller than the ass and is marked on the head neck and trunk by alternately wide and narrow black stripes upon an isabella or bay ground his legs and tail are white End of lesson nine lesson ten ruminants order of ruminantia all the animals belonging to this order seem to have been constructed on the same model their name is derived from the circumstance of chewing the cud they all have incisors only in the lower jaw always eight in number they have on each foot two toes enveloped in two hoofs which apply one to the other by their internal sides so that their feet have the appearance of being cleft or cloven the two bones of the metacarpus and of the metatarsus are joined in a single one which is called the cannon bone they are all herbivorous and have four stomachs the first and largest is called the paunch or rumen the second is named honeycomb or bonnet the reticulum the third the leaflet the many plies or the omasum saltarium and the fourth the colette abomasa or rennet bag when these animals feed they swallow their aliments at first without having chewed them 
These substances then enter into the paunch and there accumulate. Thence they pass into the second stomach, the reticulum, but after having remained there for a certain time, they are carried back again into the mouth to be chewed and afterwards swallowed again. And when they descend again into the stomach, they no more enter the paunch or reticulum, but go directly to the many plies or the third stomach, from which they pass into the fourth stomach or rennet bag where they are digested. At first, one is astonished to see food pass at one time into the paunch and reticulum, at another time into the many plies, or third stomach, according as it has been swallowed for the first time, and after it has been regurgitated, and one is tempted to attribute this phenomenon to a sort of tact with which the openings of these different digestive pouches seem to be endowed. But there is nothing of the kind, this result being the necessary consequence of the anatomical arrangement of the parts. The esophagus terminates below in a species of gutter or longitudinal slit, which occupies the upper part of the reticulum or second stomach and the paunch, and it is continued to the many plies. Ordinarily, the edges of the slit, of which we have just spoken, lie close together, and then this gutter constitutes a perfect tube which leads from the esophagus into the many plies or third stomach. But if the alimentary ball swallowed by the animal is solid and somewhat large, it distends this tube and separates the edges of the opening through which the esophagus communicates with the two first stomachs. The food falls into these pouches. But if the alimentary ball be soft and pulpy, as is the case when mastication has been completed, the matter swallowed enters into this same tube without separating the edges of the slit and reaches the third stomach. It is by this mechanism that unchewed food, which the animal swallows for the first time, stops in the paunch and reticulum, while, after it has been chewed a second time, and well mixed with saliva, it penetrates directly into the many plies. The mechanism by which the aliment accumulated in the first stomach is carried back to the mouth is very simple. When regurgitation begins, the reticulum contracts and presses the alimentary mass, against the slit-like opening which terminates the esophagus. Then this opening enlarges so as to seize a pinch or portion of the alimentary mass, compresses it, and forms it into a small pellet, which engages in the esophagus, the fibers of which contract successively from below upwards to push forward the new alimentary ball into the mouth. Ruminants are large animals without much intelligence, but which, nevertheless, render immense service to man. They furnish him with nearly all the meat that he eats. Their milk furnishes us excellent food. Their fat, which is harder than that of other quadrupeds, and named tallow, is applied to many purposes in the arts and domestic economy. Their skin, prepared by tanning, constitutes nearly all the leather we use. Finally, their horns, their bones, their blood, and even their intestines, which are manufactured into cords, are useful to us. When living, many of these animals, employed as beasts of burden, are equally valuable in both commerce and agriculture. This order may be divided into two sections. The first comprises ruminants without horns, and the second, ruminants with horns, either in both sexes or in the male only. Ruminants without horns. Ruminants, which are entirely without horns, also differ from other ruminants in their teeth, and somewhat resemble the pachydermata. They are divided into two small tribes, which may be recognized by the following characters. Ruminants without horns. The lower jaw provided with six incisor teeth, the camels. The lower jaw provided with eight incisor teeth, musk. The tribe of camels is composed of camels, properly so called, and llamas. These animals differ from all other ruminants in the number of their incisors, which is eight in all the rest of this order, and in their molars, of which we count from twenty to twenty-two instead of twenty-four. The conformation of their extremities is equally characteristic, for their feet are not cloven, and they have very small hoofs. The neck is very long, their limbs badly proportioned, and their upper lip, inflated and cleft. Their gentleness is remarkable. Camels, properly so called, camellas, are distinguished by the enormous humps of fat they have on the back, 
which makes them appear humpbacked, and by the structure of their feet, which are admirably adapted for traveling on the sand, so common in the regions inhabited by these animals. In fact, their two toes are joined underneath, nearly to their ends by a thick, flexible sole. These animals belong to the warm parts of the old continent. They are celebrated for their docility, for the faculty which they possess of sustaining long journeys, though heavily laden, and particularly for their great gentleness. Camels, without which, perhaps man never could have traversed the vast, sandy deserts which are found in Asia and Africa, have the faculty of passing several days without drinking, which is probably owing to the presence of a number of cells in the parietals of the paunch, where the water is retained or continually produced. On this account, they have been called ships of the desert. The two principal species of the genus of camels are the Bactrian camel, or camel with two humps, and Arabian camel, or camel with one hump, which is called the dromedary, Camellus dromedarius. The variety to which the name dromedary properly belongs, with the weight of a man only, can perform very lengthened journeys and at a very rapid pace. Several of these attend the caravans when crossing any of the African deserts, performing the offices of scout and keeping a lookout both for danger from the wandering tribes and for the approach of the water stations. These will travel from 70 to 120 miles in the 24 hours. It is related by a modern traveler that one of these animals will in one night and through a level country traverse as much ground as any simple horse can perform in 10. It was often affirmed to him by the Arabs and Moors that it makes nothing of holding its rapid pace, which is a most violent hard trot for four and 20 hours upon a stretch without showing the least sign of weariness or inclination to bait, and that having been swallowed a ball or two of a sort of paste, made up of barley, and perhaps a little powder of dates among it, with a bowl of water or camel's milk, if it be had, and which the courier seldom fails to be provided with in skins, as well as for the sustenance of himself as of his pegasus. The indefatigable animal will seem as fresh as at first setting out, and ready to continue running at the same scarce credible rate for as many hours longer, and so on from one extremity of the African desert to the other. The Bactrian camel, Camellus Bactrianus, is about seven feet high to the shoulders. He is much more powerful than the dromedary in proportion to his size. The llamas, Achenia, are the camels of the new world, but if they are less ugly than those of Asia, they possess neither their size nor strength. Their proportions are lighter, they have no humps, and their toes not being joined, they retain their mobility which enables them to climb rocks and mountains with the agility of goats. Two species are known, the guanaco and the vicunia. The guanaco, camellus llama, is met with in the high mountains of South America, it is the size of a stag, and its coat is thick, and of a chestnut color. A variety of this species, very long since domesticated, is known under the name of llama, or llama. At the time of the conquest of Peru by the Spaniards, it was the only beast of burden of that country, and in our day, it is still employed for the same purpose. It carries a load of about 150 pounds, but makes very short journeys. Another variety of the domestic guanaco is the alpaca, or paco, the fleece of which is composed of long woolly hair, which, in fineness and elasticity, is not much inferior to the most beautiful wool of the goats of Tibet. The vicunia, camellus vicuna, which is rather larger than a sheep, is also remarkable for its beautifully soft, yellowish-brown wool, it inhabits along the line of perpetual snow of the Andes of Chile and Peru. It is actively hunted on account of its wool, which is manufactured into valuable stuffs and hats. The tribe of musks, moscas, includes only one genus. These are charming animals from their elegance and lightness. All belong to Central or Southern Asia. They have no incisors in the upper jaw, nor canines in the lower but are distinguished by a long canine on each side of the upper jaw, which, in the male, descends upon the lower lip and protrudes from the mouth. To this genus belongs the species named the musk, 
Moscus moscaferus, which is found in Tibet. It is the size of a goat. It furnishes musk, which substance is found with the male in the pouch beneath the belly. Ruminants with horns. All the animals comprised in this section, of the male sex at least, have two horns, the center of which is formed by projections of greater or less length of the frontal bone. Three kinds of horns are distinguished in ruminants. Sometimes, as in the giraffe, they are enveloped in a hairy skin, which is continuous with that of the head, and do not perish or shed. At other times, as is seen in the genus of stags, the above-mentioned projections or processes, covered for a time by hairy skin, like that of the rest of the head, have at their base a ring of bony tubercles which, by enlarging, compress and obliterate the nutritious vessels of this skin. It dries and is removed. The bony prominence, thus laid bare, separates at the end of a certain time from the cranium and falls, leaving the animal without horns. But he replaces them with new ones, which become still more developed than those they have replaced, and in turn they also fall from the influence of the same causes. Those bony horns which are liable to periodical changes bear the name of deciduous horns or antlers. Again, the bony part of the horns is covered in a case of elastic substance, which grows by layers through the whole period of life. The horns of the ox are of this kind. They never fall. Those ruminants which have similar prominences or projections are named ruminants with hollow horns. In the family of ruminants with horns, the incisor teeth of the lower jaw are always eight in number, and the total number of molars is twenty-four. The feet are cleft or cloven. The genus stag, Cervus, includes all ruminants that, in the male sex, have deciduous horns on the head. These horns are always wanting in the female, with the single exception of the species named reindeer. All these animals inhabit forests and are fleet in the chase. Their limbs are long and slender, the body light and round, the coat clean and shining. In general, they are remarkable for the beauty and elegance of their forms. Ordinarily, they shed their horns in the spring. A great number of different species are known, among which we will mention the common stag, the fallow deer, the roebuck, the reindeer, and the elk. The stag, properly so called the common stag, Cervus alephus, is found in forests. The female is named a hind or doe, and the young is called a fawn. The male only has horns. At about six months old, there is perceived on the head two tubercles. At this time, the animal is called a knobber. At one year old, these tubercles are lengthened, and though simple, they are from five to ten inches long. At this period, the animal loses the skin that covers them. The horns remain naked for some time before they fall, and the knobber takes the name of picket, brock, or staggered. When the fawn reaches his third year, he loses the spikes or spears, and the horns which replace them ordinarily have three branches and are called antlers. During each succeeding year to the seventh, the horns, on being reproduced, have an additional antler, so that the horns of old stags are commonly composed of seven branches, which spring from a common stalk. This animal is very delicate in his choice of food, which usually consists of herbs or young buds and roots of different trees. When his hunger is satisfied, he retires to the shade of some dense foliage and ruminates, but with more difficulty than the cow or sheep. He makes a hiccough sort of noise the whole time. His hearing and sense of smell are very fine. The fallow deer, Cervus dama, is not so large as the stag. He has a longer tail, black above and white below. His horns, in place of being branched and round, are flattened and palmate. The two species dislike each other and never dwell or pasture in the same places. Fallow deers ordinarily live twenty years and attain their full growth at the end of three. They are rarely found wild, they are reared in parks, and are kept for the amusement and luxury of the great. They browse more closely than the stag, and feeds on many vegetables that stags refuse to eat. They are very injurious to young trees, which they despoil of their bark. The roebuck, Cervus capriolus, is of a more or less deep yellowish-gray, white buttock, and almost without tail. 
he lives in the tall forests of temperate europe his horns are six or eight inches long they are strong straight and divided at the extremity into three branches the length of the roebuck rarely exceeds three feet and his height two and a half he is very animated and his sense of smell is very acute the duration of his life is from twelve to fifteen years roebucks differ from all other deer in their habits they do not live in troops but in families the female manifests the highest degree of maternal solicitude and affection she brings forth two fawns at birth ordinarily a male and a female the reindeer cervus tyrandus is of the size of the stag but has shorter legs the female like the male has horns which at a certain age are branched in the form of enlarged denticulate palms the people of the northern nations employ them in drawing sledges and carrying burdens and eat their flesh and milk their activity is such that two reindeer harnessed to a sledge will travel from forty to fifty leagues in a single day the elk cervus alsus or moose deer is the largest of all the animals of this genus his stature sometimes exceeds that of a horse his horns which stand out from the sides of the head form two flattened plates deeply denticulated on the anterior edge their weight sometimes reaches fifty pounds and to support them nature has given this animal a shorter and stouter neck than any other deer he is nevertheless taller than most of them which forces him when grazing on the ground either to kneel or spread his feet but he feeds principally on leaves and high grass he delights in low forests and swamps and inhabits the north of europe asia and america he is a heavy animal and is far from possessing the grace and beauty that generally belong to the deers the genus giraffe camelopardalis is distinguished from all others by the horns which are conical and always covered with hairy skin they are never shed and exist in both sexes only one species is known the giraffe whose height when full grown from the top of the head to the forefeet is about seventeen feet has the skin beautifully spotted brown on a white ground his walk is neither clumsy nor disagreeable but there is something in his trot that is ridiculous his favorite food is the leaf of acacia and ash trees when he browses on the ground the length of his legs forces him to spread them in order to reach his pasture the giraffe inhabits africa the one whose head is copied in the plate was taken at senar the genus of antelopes is placed at the head of the group of ruminants with hollow horns or horns with sheaths these animals for the most part resemble stags in their light forms and swiftness amongst the numerous species which are spread throughout both continents we will mention the gazelle antelope dorcas is of the size of the roebuck and possesses an elegant form the horns are black round and thick the eye beautiful and its look very soft it lives in very numerous troops and inhabits the north of africa the chamois antelope rupicapra is of the size of a large goat but has shorter legs and a stouter body than common antelopes a deep brown coat with a black stripe descending from the eye along the muzzle these animals are never contented except among the rocks on precipices where they can be sheltered from the rays of the sun their agility is surprising they venture upon almost perpendicular rocks from twenty to thirty feet in height without any means of ensuring their footing they fly rather than run animals of the genus of goats capra have the horns directed upwards and backwards the chin is generally furnished with a long beard and the chamfrin is concave all the species of this genus belong to europe or asia and live in small families on steep mountains where they display astonishing agility the agagre or wild goat capra agagris seems to be the original stock of all the varieties of our domestic goats it is distinguished by having horns which are trenchant in front and very large in the male while they are short and sometimes entirely wanting in the female it lives in troops on the mountains of persia and perhaps also of the alps the oriental bezoar is a concretion which is found in its intestines the bouquetin or ibex capra ibex is another species of wild goat 
the male has large horns which are square in front and marked by transverse and projecting knots they are short or wanting in the female his color is yellow above white below and he has a black stripe upon the back he inhabits the summits of lofty mountains in the old world the domestic goat capra hercus which seems to have descended from the wild goat or from a mixture of that species and the ibex is found throughout europe and indeed is met with in almost all parts of the earth for it is an animal that costs little for maintenance and yields large profits it seems however to be more fond of the mountains and steep rocks than cultivated fields its favorite food is the buds of young trees it is capable of enduring the greatest degree of atmospheric heat the tempest does not alarm nor rain incommode it the milk of the goat is rich nourishing and medicinal the young is called a kid the flesh of which is as much esteemed by some persons as that of a lamb certain exotic races furnish a most valuable down or fur those of tibet called cashmere goats are the most remarkable in this respect it is from their wool that the beautiful shawls of the east are manufactured which are so much used by the turks and the imitation of which for some years past has become an important branch of industry in france the goats of angora also a great number of which are raised in asia minor have an extremely fine fleece and those of the table land of kyrgyz almost rival the goats of tibet unsuccessful attempts have been made to introduce them into europe gloves of a fine kind are made of goat skins prepared by maceration and it is from these skins that real moroccan leather is manufactured being supposed to take the dye better than those of sheep cordovan another kind of leather is prepared from goat skins a manufacture that is extensively carried on in peru end of lesson ten lesson eleven part one genus of sheep order of cetaceae the genus sheep ovis is composed of animals whose horns are directed at first backwards and then incline spirally more or less forwards they are without a beard and have a convex chanfrin in other respects they do not differ very much from goats of the different species of the genus sheep we will mention the argali of siberia ovis ammon the male of this species has very large horns which are triangular at the base rounded at the angles flattened in front striated behind the female has compressed horns in the form of a scythe the spring coat is smooth of a grayish fawn color while that of winter is hard thick and reddish gray with a white or whitish muzzle throat and belly the tail is very short this animal which it seems should be considered as the parent and stock of all varieties of the domestic sheep is found in great numbers in kamchatka in all the mountainous regions of central asia and on the highest mountains of barbary of corsica and of greece it grows to be as large as a deer it is an agile active animal with a very delicate sense of smell and is taken with very great difficulty its flesh is very much esteemed by the natives of kamchatka the mouflon of sardinia ovis musamon which is found in europe africa and america differs from the argali in never growing to the same size the female rarely has horns and when they do exist they are very small there are varieties of the mouflon which are partly or entirely black and others that are more or less white this animal lives in troops the domestic sheep ovis aries when young it is called a lamb, the female a sheep, and the male a ram. This animal is too well known to require us to enter into details upon its habits or zoological characters. It is reared in numerous flocks for the sake of the fleece, which consists of crisped hair called wool, and is sheared every year. It is manufactured into stuffs, clothing, etc. The fat of these animals, which is white and brittle, is made into candles. The intestines twisted and dried form catgut, and their excrement affords a warm compost which contributes powerfully to increase the fertility of the soil. The skin, freed of its wool, is manufactured into various sorts of soft leather used for making gloves, lining shoes, etc., 
and prepared by other processes. It is known as chamois leather, parchment, vellum, etc. Merino sheep are remarkable for the fineness of their wool. Formerly, their exportation from Spain was prohibited, but they are now carried to all parts of Europe and the United States. The first merinos were imported into France in 1776, and there are now in that country about 500,000 without counting the mixed breeds. The shearing of sheep takes place every year about the month of May, June, or July, when, on separating the locks of wool, a new growth is perceived. Sometimes the wool is washed on the back of the animal before it is cut, but more frequently it is cut without washing, because the greasiness which it possesses protects it from the attacks of insects. It is estimated that there are in France 30 millions of sheep, which yield annually about 50 millions of pounds of wool, besides which about 15 or 20 millions of pounds are imported from Germany to supply the manufactories of woolen goods. England also imports from Germany about 25 millions of pounds annually, the produce of that country not being sufficient, though very large, to meet the demand of the manufacturers. The genus of the ox, Bost, comprises those animals, the horns of which are directed from the side and turn upwards or forwards in the form of a crescent. They are large animals with a broad muzzle, short stature, and stout limbs, and are found on both continents. They are also distinguished by a fold of skin that hangs beneath the neck, which is called dewlap. They delight in humid and marshy situations. They are slower and heavier than other ruminants. The principal species are the common ox, the auroch, both originally of Europe, the buffalo, the yak, which belong to Asia, the bison and musk ox, which are indigenous to North America. The common ox, bos taurus, which when young is called a calf, is characterized by a flat forehead which is longer than it is broad, round horns placed at the extremities of a ridge which separates the forehead from the occiput, and four mammae which are arranged in pairs. The male is called a bull and the female a cow. As powerful as he is docile, the ox is of great use in domestic economy. He draws wagons, plows, etc. His flesh, which is very succulent, is eaten both fresh and salted. By boiling, his skin forms glue. By tanning, it is converted into leather, which is chiefly manufactured into shoes. The hair enters into the composition of certain mortars. The horns are manufactured into toys, combs, and other utensils. His fat is burned, his blood makes good manure, and is used to manufacture a precious blue color known under the name of Prussian blue. It is also employed in refining sugars and fish oils. The membrane that covers the intestines when dried forms what is called goldbeater skin and is used for covering balloons, for beating gold into extremely thin leaves, and the milk of the cow yields cream, cheese, and butter. There are oxen in all parts of the world, but they are originally from Europe and Asia. The auroch, bos urus, is the largest quadruped proper to Europe. It is distinguished from the domestic ox by its arched forehead, which is broader than it is high, by the horns being attached below the occipital crest, by a sort of curly wool that covers the head and neck of the male, forming a short beard under the throat, and by an additional pair of ribs. It is therefore plain that it is wrong to suppose that the oryx form the original stock of our horned cattle. The oryx formerly inhabited all temperate Europe. Now the race is almost extinct, and only a few individuals are found that have taken refuge in the great marshy forests of Lithuania, of the Krapax, and of the Caucasus. The buffalo, Bos bubulus, originally from India and naturalized in Italy and Greece, has a convex forehead, higher than wide, and the horns marked in front by a longitudinal ridge. It is less docile than the ox, but is more robust and more easily fed. Its skin is converted into a strong, durable kind of leather. The horns are of a very fine grain and are susceptible of a high polish. The buffalo loves to wallow in the mud. He is an excellent swimmer and sometimes dives to a depth of 10 or 12 feet. 
to tear up with his horns certain aquatic plants that he eats while swimming. The yak, also called the horse-tailed buffalo and grunting cow of Tartary, Bos grunians, is a species originally from Tibet and is of small size. The yak has a long mane and his back and his tail is covered with long hairs like that of a horse. This tail constitutes the standards still used among the Turks to distinguish the superior officers. The musk ox of America, Bas Mushatus, inhabits the most northern parts of America under the polar circle and climbs rocks almost as well as a goat. The horns meet at their base in front of the forehead, almost on a straight line, and are directed outwards and downwards. It stands low and is covered with tufted hair that reaches to the ground. The tail is very short. It diffuses a strong smell of musk, with which its flesh is also impregnated. The Eskimo make caps of the tail, the hairs of which, falling over their face, defend them from mosquitoes. The bison, or American buffalo, Bos bison, Bos americanus, also inhabits North America, but not to so high a latitude as the preceding. He is met with from Louisiana to within a few degrees of the polar circle. He lives in great herds, pell-mell with deer and stags, on the vast open savannas or prairies, and abounds in the vicinity of the sources of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, and is always found near salt licks. He is smaller than the auroch, but larger than the domestic bull. His limbs and tail are short. The anterior part of his body is very thick and strong, but the croup is comparatively more feeble. A fleshy hump rises on the withers behind the two shoulders. This wen, the distinctive characteristic of the bison, is regarded by the Indians as a luscious morsel. His head is large, his horns round, short, almost straight, and set wide apart at the base. A thick, curly wool of a brownish-black color, which in winter grows very long, covers his head, neck, and shoulders, while the rest of his body is furnished with smooth black hair. His skin is very thick and spongy, like that of the buffalo. Although heavy in appearance, he is swift of foot. He is savage, but may be tamed if taken young. The flesh is juicy and well-flavored. The skin makes an excellent blanket when dressed, and the wool has in England been manufactured into a fine cloth. Pemmican is made of the flesh and fat of the American buffalo. The bison wanders constantly from place to place, either from being disturbed by hunters or in quest of food. They are much attracted by the soft, tender grass which springs up after a fire has spread over the prairie. In winter, they scrape away the snow with their feet to reach the grass. The bison is, in general, a shy animal and takes to flight immediately on winding an enemy, which the acuteness of its sense of smell enables it to do from a great distance. They are less wary when they are assembled together in numbers and will often blindly follow their leaders regardless of or trampling down the hunters posted in their way. It is dangerous for the hunter to shoe himself after having wounded one, for it will pursue him, and although its gait may appear heavy and awkward, it will have no great difficulty in overtaking the fleetest runner. One of the Hudson Bay Company's clerks was descending the Saskatchewan in a boat and having one evening pitched his tent for the night, he went out in the dusk to look for game. It had become nearly dark when he fired at a bison bull, which was galloping over a small eminence, and as he was hastening forward to see if his shot had taken effect, the wounded beast made a rush at him. He had the presence of mind to seize the animal by the long hair on its forehead as it struck him on the side with its horns, and being a remarkably tall and powerful man, a struggle ensued, which continued till his wrist was severely sprained and his arm rendered powerless. He then fell, and after receiving two or three blows, became senseless. Shortly after, he was found by his companions lying bathed in blood, being gored in several places, and the bison was couched beside him, apparently waiting to renew the attack, had he shown any signs of life. The favorite Indian method of killing the bison is by riding to the fattest of the herd on horseback and shooting it with an arrow. 
When a large party of hunters are engaged in this way on an extensive plain, the spectacle is very imposing, and the young men have many opportunities of displaying their skill and agility. Taken from Richardson's Travels Order of Cetacea Whales, dolphins, porpoises, and other animals of analogous structure, designated by naturalists under the name of cetacea, so closely resemble fishes in their external form, as well as in their mode of living, that the ignorant always regard them as belonging to this class. But if we do not confine ourselves to a superficial examination of these singular beings, and study their organization and the mechanism of their functions, we shall at once be convinced that, in every important particular, they depart from fishes to approach the ordinary mammalia. Like the first, they have the trunk seemingly confounded with the head and continued without interruption into a thick tail, terminated by a broad fin, and the anterior extremities transformed into fins. They want the posterior extremities, and their skin is not furnished with hair like that of ordinary mammals. But although they keep constantly in the water, they have no bronchii, and respire through the medium of lungs, which obliges them to rise frequently to the surface, to breathe the air which is necessary to the maintenance of their life. Their blood is warm, the heart has two ventricles and two auricles, their young are born alive, and they are provided with a mammary apparatus for suckling them. Consequently, cetacea are true mammals, but in place of being organized for living on land, like quadrupeds of this class, they possess important modifications in their structure which renders these animals essentially aquatic, and the density of the element which they inhabit permits them to acquire dimensions which would have been incompatible with the manner of living and moving proper to other mammalia. It is in this group that the giants of the creation are found. The very largest quadrupeds are small in comparison to many of the cetacea, and notwithstanding these latter are so immeasurably large, they swim with great rapidity. The air enclosed in their chest, and the enormous quantity of fat on their body, helps to sustain them in the water surrounding them, and their general form is perfectly fitted for the kind of movements they are called upon to perform. Their long, thick tail is an oar as powerful as that with which nature has endowed the most vigorous and most active fishes, and the fin which terminates it, in place of being vertical, as in the latter, is placed horizontally, a position which is singularly favorable for raising them to the surface when they require to breathe the air. Their anterior extremities, as we have said, are transformed into fins. Nevertheless, these organs possess the basis of the same structure as the arm of man, the paw of a dog, or the wing of a bat. We find in them the same bones, except that the humerus and bones of the forearm are shortened, and those of the hand flattened and enveloped in a tendinous membrane, which confines motion almost exclusively to the articulation of the shoulder. Sometimes the phalanges are more numerous than in other mammals. In other respects, these oars only serve the animal in preserving his equilibrium and changing his course, the tail being his true organ of motion. The posterior extremities are entirely wanting, but we find at the posterior part of the abdomen two or three rudimentary bones suspended in the flesh, which are the vestiges of the pelvis. Beneath the caudal vertebrae, there are bones in the form of the letter V, which afford points of attachment to the flexor muscles of the tail and increase their strength. It is to be remarked also that the cervical vertebrae, although seven in number, are very short and generally almost entirely soldered together. Finally, the petrous bone, that part of the cranium which encloses the internal ear, in place of being confounded with other parts of the temporal bone, is separated from the rest of the head and adheres to it by ligaments. The senses generally seem to be obtuse in these animals. They never have an external ear, they often want the olfactory nerves, the tongue is almost immovable, 
and their skin is generally covered with the thickest kind of epidermic layer. They display but little intelligence. Their brain is nevertheless large and its hemispheres are well developed. In the Cetaceae, the apparatus of respiration possesses peculiarities of structure, the utility of which is evident. The nares in general open externally on the top of the head, which enables the animal to breathe the air without raising his muzzle out of the water, and the larynx is advanced to the posterior nares so as to establish, independently of the pharynx, a communication between the nasal fossae and the lungs and permit him to fill his mouth with water and swallow his food without interrupting respiration. The stomach of the cetacea generally presents as great if not greater complication in its structure than that of the ruminants. There is no large intestine recognized and their teeth, when they exist, are all alike. This order is composed of two families which are distinguished by their regimen their teeth, and several other peculiarities of organization, and may be recognized by the position of their nares. They are, first, the herbivorous cetacea, cetacea herbivora, the nares of which open externally at the extremity of the muzzle. Second, the ordinary cetacea or blowers, cetacea ordinaria, the nares of which open on the posterior face of the head. Family of Herbivorous Cetaceae The food of these animals being herbaceous, they possess molar teeth with flat crowns and the faculty of crawling on land. To graze along the seashore, their anterior extremities are more flexible than those of other cetaceae, and they do not frequent the high sea. From the circumstance of grazing like ruminants and being large and massive, Travelers often designate them under the names of sea bull, sea cow, and sea calf. Sometimes they are termed mermaids, sea women, and it is probable these have been in question when some modern navigators said they had met with sirens and tritons, for they have a habit of often raising the anterior part of the body out of the water, and their mammae being on the chest, the hair which surrounds the snout might at a distance appear like female tresses, and then the adroitness with which they sometimes use their fins to carry their young gives them in certain points some remote resemblance to the human species. Their stomach is divided into four pouches, two of which are lateral. The principal genera of this family are the lamantins and dugongs. The lamantins, manatus, have an oblong body terminated by an elongated oval fin. Vestiges of nails are found on their paws, which, having a coarse resemblance to hands, have obtained for these animals the name of manatus, which has been corrupted into lamantin. Their head is terminated by a fleshy muzzle furnished with hair, and they have eight molars with square crowns throughout. They inhabit the warm regions of the Atlantic Ocean, near the mouths of rivers, which they sometimes ascend to a considerable distance. They live in troops, often land, and are readily approached. They display the greatest attachment for their companions. The lamantin is sometimes fifteen feet in length. The flesh is eaten. Dugongs, Halicore dugong, inhabit the Indian seas and are distinguished from the lamantins by their elongated body the crescent form of their caudal fins, and the pointed tusks that protrude from the upper jaw. End of Lesson 11, Part 1 Lesson 14 Family of Cetacea, Ordinaria, or Blowers The Cetacea of this group differ from those of the preceding by having their mammae near the anus instead of being on the chest, by the garniture of the mouth, the teeth, when they exist, being pointed, by their earnest regimen, by the position of the nares, etc. But what especially distinguishes them is the singular apparatus which has obtained for them the name of blowers. 31. The great masses of water that these animals take into their vast mouth with their prey are thrown out through the nasal fossae. 
in the form of jets which may be perceived at a long distance. For the purpose, the blowers move their tongue and jaws as if they would swallow the liquid, while at the same time the commencement of the esophagus closes with so much force as to prevent its descent to the stomach, and retains it in the pharynx. The veil of the palate at once intercepts the communication between the mouth and the swallow, and the powerful muscles which surround this latter cavity, by contracting, expel the water, which, finding no outlet except through the posterior nares, passes through them and accumulates in two great membranous pouches, situate between the extremity of the bony portion of the nasal canal and the skin. A fleshy valve, arranged as to rise up when the water presses from below upwards, and to intercept all communication between these cavities and the nasal fossae, when pressed in a contrary direction, prevents the water forced into the reservoirs just described from descending into the nasal fossae. Then the fleshy fibers, which come in the form of rays from all the neighboring parts of the cranium to be attached to the two bags, by contracting, compress them violently, and expel the water, which escapes externally through the narrow opening of the nares, called spiracle, vent, or blowhole, and forms a jet which sometimes ascends as high as nearly 40 feet. These animals do not chew their food, but swallow it rapidly. Their stomach consists of from five to seven distinct pouches. Many of them have on the back a vertical fin, formed of tendinous matter, but which is not sustained by bones. The skin is smooth and generally without a vestige of hair. This family is divided into four principal genera, which may be recognized by the following characters. The head is in proportion to the rest of the body, the mouth, furnished with small conical teeth in bone jaws, dolphins, without ordinary teeth but armed with a great horizontal tusk, narwhals, the head equal to a third or one half of the whole length, teeth in the lower jaw, no whalebone, cachalots, without teeth, whalebone in the upper jaw, whales. 34. Dolphins are divided according to the form of of the head in the presence of or absence of a dorsal fin into dolphins, properly so-called porpoises, etc. 35. Dolphins, properly so-called dolphinus, are recognized by a sort of beak formed by the muzzle, which is more splendor than the rest of the head, abruptly separating from the convex forehead. They have a dorsal fin and a considerable number of conical teeth placed along both jaws. They count in all from 168 to 190, according to the species. These animals are most carnivorous, and in proportion to their size, the most cruel all the cetacea. Their skin, which is smooth, is ordinarily bluish black above and white or whitish below. The vent, directed vertically, is sometimes in the form of a crescent, sometimes of a straight line, and is often found on a line with the eyes. Most of them have a triangular fin on the back. Their brain is generally remarkable for its development and the depth of its convolutions. These animals are celebrated for their swiftness, as well as on account of the fables and ancients have mingled with their history, and on account of a species of religious worship they received amongst the Greeks. They live in numerous troops, of which the strongest seem to be the leaders, and display strong attachment for their young. They often accompany ships to seize upon fishes attracted by the refuse thrown overboard, and sometimes they have known to follow a vessel throughout a long voyage, playing under the bows, while she cleaves the waves with all the rapidity that wind and sails can communicate. It is these peculiar habits, joined to a degree of intelligence far superior to that of fishes, with which the ignorant are always disposed to compare these animals, that have obtained for them their ancient reputation for sociability. The poetic imagination of the Greeks created for the dolphin an assemblage of perfections, moral and physical, which the human species is far from possessing. They placed its image in their temples, impressed it on their coins, on their medals, and made it the attribute or symbol of the god of the sea. They employed its image to recall the memory of a host of events, real or fabulous, and to express moral precepts. Finally, they associated it with a great number of their divinitics, and what is singular, the ancients never represented it with that exactness which they habitually observed in imitating nature but as if they designed to idealize it. 37. 
The species of cetacea which has received so many honors seems to be the common dolphin, Delphinus delphus. It is from 8 to 10 feet long and found in every sea. It is black above and white below. It has a depressed beak, which is armed on each side with from 42 to 47 small pointed teeth. Porpoises, Phocena, differ from the preceding in their short muzzle, uniformly convex, which does not resemble a beak. Their name, which signifies hogfish, has been given to them on the count of the quantity of fat beneath the skin. The common porpoise, Delphinus fosana, which is the smallest of all the cetacea, never exceeds four or five feet in length. It lives in numerous troops. Another species of porpoise known under the name of Grampus, Delphinus gladiator, is the largest animal of this tribe of cetacea, often attaining from 20 to 25 feet in length. It is the most relentless enemy of the whale. They attack it in troops and torment it until it opens its mouth when they devour the tongue. 41. The narwhals, monodon, closely resemble porpoises, but they have no teeth properly so called. The mouth is armed with two straight horizontal tusks, one of which generally remains concealed in the alveolus, while the other acquires a very considerable length, sometimes 10 feet, and is generally furrowed spirally. These tusks were for a long time mistaken for the horns of a fabulous quadrupod, the unicorn. Only one species of narwhal is known. It inhabits the North Sea, principally between Greenland and Iceland. Its skin is marbled brown and whitish, and its length is from 15 to 16 feet. Its vent is on the top of the head, and it has no dorsal fin. It swims with great rapidity and is a formidable enemy of the whale, which it attacks in troops, inflicting deep wounds with its tusks. Fishermen seek it for the excellent oil obtained from its fat, a single narwhal yielding from two to three tons. The tusks are also employed for the same purposes as ivory. 42. The cachalots, Phaceter, are cetacea with a very voluminous inflated head, particularly in front, whose lower jaw is armed with a row of cylindrical teeth which, when the mouth is closed, enter into corresponding cavities in the upper jaw, which has neither teeth nor whalebone, balin. The head of these animals is enormous and very much swelled out anteriorly. Its structure is very singular. All above the face and cranium is formed into a large oval basin, the edges of which rise behind six feet above the cranium and gradually diminish in front. The parietes of this great cavity are chiefly formed by a prolongation of the superior maxillary bones, which joins a vertical crest of the occipital bone, and these latter give insertion by their edges to a sort of fibrocartilaginous cover which transforms the basin we have just described into a long cylindrical cavity divided into two stories by a membranous partition also extended from the margin of one maxillary bone to that of the other these two chambers are filled with adipocire a sort of oil which becomes fixed on cooling well known in commerce under the name of spermaceti they communicate with canals which go to different parts of the body and are connected with the subcutaneous fatty tissue or blubber are, and also contain arliposire in proportion as the great upper reservoir is emptied. It refills with this fatty matter. 43. The channel of the vent, spiracle, passes obliquely through this mass of adiposire and opens a little to the left. Near the superior edge of the snout which terminates the head of the cachalot in front. The jets of water spouted from it are directed obliquely forwards. They ascend higher and occur more frequently than in the whale, and are attended with a noise which may be heard at a long distance. The layer of fat which lies beneath the skin, constituting what is called blubber by whalers, is not so thick and does not furnish so much oil as in the whale. The odorous substance known under the name of Ambergris, sometimes met with floating on the surface of the sea, appears to be a morbid concentration formed in the intestines of these animals. 44. The cachalot inhabits, from choice, the equatorial regions of the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. They are met with in pretty numerous bands, composed of females led by two or three males, which are much larger than the former. They seem to feed chiefly on the large mollusca, but we are assured that they do not spare the largest fishes and are objects of terror to all the inhabitants of the sea. 45. 
The different species are not well ascertained. The best known is the common sperm whale, Phaceter macrocephalus, which has a callus prominence in place of a dorsal fin. The muzzle, which is of a cubic form, is truncated in front, and the vent or spiracle, which is double in most other cetacea, is single. The length of this animal is about 70 feet, and the bilobed fin, which terminates the tail, is about 8 feet wide. 46. Whales, Balena, have a head as large as that of the cachalot, though not so much swelled out in front, but their jaws are without teeth, and the upper one, which is keel-shaped, is furnished with whalebone. This name is given to great horny plates of fibrous texture, which are very elastic and fringed at their edges, that are placed transversely like the teeth of a comb, strongly locked one into the other and attached to the jaw at their base, so as to extend from each side of the palate forming a sort of great sleeve through which the water taken into the immense mouth of the animal partly escapes, without, however, carrying with it the small animals it contains. 47. From the size of whales, we should be led to believe that these whales would devour the largest fishes, but it is altogether otherwise. The absence of teeth, the species of armature of their mouth, and the weakness of the muscles of their jaws permit them to seize only small marine animals. Their ordinary food consists of small mollusca, of cretacea a few lines in length, and of zoophytes, whose bodies are soft as jelly, and, as the number of these beings is immense, they have only to open their mouth and swallow them by millions. They are very voracious and eat almost continually. The water which enters their enormous mouth every time it is opened is ejected through their nares, forming a jet above the head that falls in a sort of fine shower. Whales swim with great rapidity, and having no means of defense, and being often embarrassed by the enormous mass of their body, they are incapable of defending themselves successfully against agile and robust enemies. And a consciousness of their weakness renders them fearful and timid, but they nevertheless become occasionally furious and display all their strength in defending themselves or in escaping from their pursuers. When they strike the water with their tail, they produce a commotion equal to that from a cannonball. 48. Several species of whales are known. That which is most sought by whalers is the common whale, Balena mysticitas, which is recognized by having no dorsal fin. It does not often exceed 70 feet in length, yet it is very large and the mass of the body is enormous. It has been estimated that a whale of only 70 feet in length weighs about 70 tons, equal to the weight of 300 fat oxen. The head is about one-third of its whole length. His jaws are from 15 to 20 feet long, and his tail very nearly 20 feet in breadth. His skin, which is black and spongy, is often invaded by a great number of parasites. Some attach themselves to it as to rock, and others puncture its substance and are nourished at its expense. The layer of fat, blubber, which entirely covers the body of this animal, is often several feet in thickness, and yields an immense quantity of oil. Finally, the whale bones are from 3 to 15 feet long, according to the part of the mouth they occupy. 49. The catching of big-headed cetacea, which naturalists separate into cachalots and whales, but which mariners often confound under the latter name, is among the most important of maritime pursuits from the products it affords, and from the influence it exercises of the nautical education of sailors. Whale fishing was pursued in very remote times. The historians of Norway and the account of his voyages related by Otho to Alfred, the great king of England, show that, from the ninth century, the Normans devoted themselves actively to the taking of whales that approached their coasts, and it seems that they made the cordage used in the rude marine of that people, of the skins of those cetacea. And at the period of the invasion of the France by the Normans, whales were seen in great numbers in the British Channel, and they were attacked by the fishermen. From time immemorial, the Basques pursued these animals near the vicinity of the shore, and gradually, as whales became rare to the Bay of Biscay, they pursued them on the high seas. To these hardy mariners belongs the honor of being the first to carry on a regular fishery for whales at a distance. They pursued their prey along the coast of Spain to Cape Finisterre, and upon those shores may still be seen the watchtowers established by the Basque fishermen for the discovery of whales and the ruins of kilns constructed for the rendering or trying out of their blubber. It appears that towards the close of the 10th century, they occupied Oporto, 
by the right of conquest and founded colonies in the vicinity the fishery at first coastwise was afterwards conducted upon the open ocean the mariner's compass being discovered the basques ventured to the northeast in pursuit of whales and it is affirmed that as early as thirteen seventy two they arrived on the grand bank of newfoundland where they continued their voyages to the gulf of st lawrence and the coast of labrador in the fourteenth century the merchants of bordeaux fitted out two whale ships for the frozen ocean which went as far as greenland and even to spitzbergen at this period whale fishing was in a most flourish condition on the coast of Bern and of aunis and continued on the same footing till the commencement of the seventeenth century but then the basques finding no protection under the national flag were disturbed by their jealous rivals who excluded them from the places most favorable for this fishery and extracted from them onerous contributions. This branch of industry then began to decline, and was lost to France, when in 1636, the Spaniards, having taken and sacked Socoa, Siborne, and St. Jean de Luz, seized 14 large ships from Greenland, richly laden with oil and whalebone. The poor Basque fishermen were then forced to serve as guides to their more powerful rivals. They taught the art of harpooning the whale to the Dutch and also to the English, who at that time were ardently devoted to maritime speculations and understood all the advantages that would accrue to them from this distant fishery. The fishing of the Dutch began in 1612 and although thwarted at first by the rivalry of the English, rapidly increased. Rich companies were formed for pursuing this new branch of industry, which continued to be a source of prosperity to the whole country till the beginning of the 19th century, but maritime wars opposed an insurmountable obstacle to it, and since the peace, Holland has made ineffectual efforts to revive the prosperity of her whale fishery, which is doubtless the best school for forming hardy and experienced seamen. While the whale fishery was so productive in the hands of the Dutch, it did not prosper in England, but the enlightened government of that country, appreciating its utility, made efforts to ensure its success. In 1732, it granted high premiums to all vessels fitted out for this fishery, and this encouragement not producing the desired effect in 1749, they were doubled and made nearly equal to one-tenth of the expense of the outfits. From that time, this branch of maritime industry rapidly increased, and now belongs almost exclusively to the English, and their ancient colonies in America the United States which have become their rivals. We have already seen the ground of this fishery moving more and more towards the north, in proportion as the whales were destroyed or learned to fly from the dangers with which they were threatened. Until the 14th or 15th century it was carried on in the waters of England, France, and Spain, but in the 16th whales were no longer met with by fishermen except in the seas of Greenland and Spitsbergen. These animals were then so numerous near the shores and even in the small inlets of the last named island that whaling vessels promptly completed their cargoes lying near the shore and with the object of facilitating their operations the dutch established on a small island in the neighborhood a village called smarenburg where they brought the captured whales and tried out the oil and to be afterwards transported to europe but these animals soon deserted the coast of spitzbergen and the neighboring islands to seek refuge among the great icy banks that bounds the sea of greenland on the northwest the fishermen followed them there as soon as they left the waters of spitzbergen from the middle of the 17th century the whale fishery has been most active about the 78th or 81st degree of north latitude or in davis's straits about the isle of disco but their waters in turn have been depopulated and for three or four years past, the English whalers have almost entirely abandoned those posts to advance in the midst of the ice, in Baffins Bay to Lancaster Sound and Melville Bay. But the voyages of whalers are not confined to the northern seas. At the beginning of the 18th century, the American whalers of Massachusetts began to look towards the south and visited the waters of Cape de Verde, the southwestern coast of Africa, along the coasts of Brazil and Paraguay to the Falkland Islands. From that time, the English have also carried on a fishery to the south, and now the whale ships of both nations plow not only the southern parts of the Atlantic, but the whole expanse of the Pacific Ocean. During the season, they cross to the waters of Japan, then descend to towards the Sandwich, Marquesas, and Galapagos Islands, and if their cargo is not complete, they touch upon the coasts of Chile and Peru, and return by Cape Horn. 
but if they wish to continue their operations they cross the southern hemisphere in the summer to new zealand to return towards the north to visit the seas of japan or the coast of california in this way they sometimes keep at sea for eight months together exposed to the greatest fatigue and privations of all kinds but in general the dangers are less in this vast ocean than in the polar seas where the stoutest vessels are sometimes crushed by the ice and where shipwreck is unfortunately very frequent the northern fishery is for the common whale while that of the south is chiefly for the cachalot or sperm whale the mode of attacking both these immense cetacea is the same as soon as the sailor placed in a lookout at the masthead discovers a whale the fishermen take to their boats and with muffled oars approach him in silence one of them stands erect in the bows holding a harpoon a species of javelin the deeply barbed head of which is attached to a strong cord six or seven hundred feet in length the harpooner of the first boat that arrives within reach of the whale throws his weapon so as to cause it to penetrate deeply and remain firmly in the body of the animal who feeling the wound sometimes turns violently and exerts his powerful tail with so much force as to shatter the boat or hurl it into the air generally however the whale dives immediately dragging after him the cord attached to the iron that has been planted in the flesh this is the critical moment for the fisherman if the cord does not run out with sufficient rapidity or gets hitched the whale sinks the boat and all the crew and sometimes it has happened that sailors by being caught in a loop of the swiftly running cord have been almost cut in two and thrown into the sea never to be seen again on the surface the rapidity with which the animal flies is such that that the cord from rubbing against the side of the boat produces dense smoke and would take fire were it not kept constantly wet when the first line is almost run out the fishermen attach a second then a third and so on until they have in use all they have on board and all that other boats can supply the length of line they let out in this way sometimes exceeds ten thousand feet nevertheless it is not always enough and they are obliged to cut loose and abandon all this mass of cordage as well as their harpoon while the whale prolongs his flight without returning to the surf sometimes the animal remains under water for more than half an hour but the necessity of breathing forces him to come up to the surface and the fishermen who are dispersed about to be more within striking distance endeavor to plant a second harpoon in his body or pierce it with lances when the whale thus rises, he is ordinarily in a state of extreme exhaustion, and in proportion as his blood flows, he becomes more enfeebled. Often when death is near, he yet makes a last and terrible effort, raises his tail above the water, and agitates it with a convulsive movement which can be heard at a distance of several miles. Finally, succumbing altogether, he turns upon his side and expires. The fishermen hasten to pierce his tail and tie it to ropes by means of which they secure the immense carcass to the side of the ship. Then, armed with knives and a sharp instrument in the form of a spade, they get upon it and cut off the blubber in slices which is afterwards tried out. A single whale sometimes yields as much as a hundred to a hundred and sixty barrels of oil, but as a greater number of small than of large whales are taken so large a quantity is not obtained from them all scores by informs us that four hundred and ninety eight whales taken in twenty eight successive voyages in the seas of greenland yielded four thousand two hundred forty six tons of oil making an average of about nine tons to each whale the cachalots as we have said before furnish much less oil and those that are taken within the tropics are much leaner than those of cold seas a male cachalot, 70 feet in length, yields about 14 tons of oil and spermaceti, but six females yield scarcely as much. The northern fishery often occupies more than 150 English ships, and the southern 50 or 60. In 1831, there were dispatched for Davis's Straits and Baffin's Bay 75 ships, which captured 330 whales, and returned with 4,100 tons of oil and 4,000 quintals of whale bones. At the same time, the English fitted out 12 whalers for the Greenland seas, which took 86 whales, 4,100 seals, and returned with 700 tons of oil and 600 quintals of whale bones. The product of the whole English whale fishery for the preceding years was valued at about a half a million dollars. 
the number of whalers belonging to France does not exceed 20. In 1837, the number of vessels belonging to the United States in the whale fishery was 580, and the oil brought home that year is set down at 181,724 bales of sperm oil and 219,138 barrels of common whale oil. This concludes all we have to say at present about mammiferous animals. We next proceed to the consideration of birds, which form the second class of the branch of vertebrata. End of the second book of natural history. End of lesson 14. Glossary A to D. Abdomen. From the Latin abdere, to conceal. The belly. The chief viscera contained in the abdomen are the stomach, intestines, liver, etc. Abdominal, relating to the abdomen. Abomasus, Latin ab, from, without, and omasum, stomach, the fourth stomach of ruminants, the rennet, see page 106. Acacia, from the Greek aki, a point, a tree with a tall trunk that bears leguminous flowers. Acclimate, from the Greek klima, a region, to habituate to a climate. Acephala, from the Greek a, privative, and kephale, head, without a head, the name given to division of molluscous animals that have no apparent head. Aerial, from the Latin aerius, belonging to the air. Egagar, from the Greek ex, a goat, and agrios, wild, wild goat. Egagrus, Latin for egagar, wild goat. See page 116. Adipocere, from the Latin adeps, fat, and cera, wax. An animal substance analogous to wax and fat. Spermaceti. See page 129. Africanus. Latin. African. Agglutinate. From the Latin agglutinare, which is formed from ad, to, and gluten, glue, to join parts together. Agilis. Latin. Agile, supple, light, prompt. I, the sloth, a name derived from the cry of the animal, see page 94. Alces, Latin, an elk, one of the dogs of Acteon was so called, see page 114. Aliment, from the Latin alimentum, which is formed from alere, to nourish. Any substance which, if introduced into the system, is capable of nourishing it and repairing its losses. Food. Alouat, French name of the howling monkey. See page 39. Alpinus, Latin, alpine, relating to the Alps. Alveolus, Latin, the hole in which a tooth is placed. Alveoli, plural of alveolus. Sockets of the teeth. Ambergris, from the Arabic, anibar, or rather anbar, as written in Spanish, and the French gris, grey, which literally rendered means grey amber, to distinguish it from yellow amber of the French, which is a kind of fossil resin of vegetable origin, and generally known under the name of amber. But ambergris originates in the spermaceti whale, and in its essential properties differs altogether from amber, with which substance the derivation of its name might lead us to confound it. Americanus, Latin, American. Amon, from the Greek amos, sand, Grecian ram, see page 117. Amphibia, from the Greek amphi, on two sides, both, double, and bios, life. Animals that are fitted for living both on land and in the water. Amphibious, from the Greek amphi, double, and bios, life, that which partakes of two natures, so as to live in two elements, as in the air and water. Amphibious, Latin, amphibious. 
anatomy from the greek ana through and temno i cut the description of the structure of animals the word anatomy properly signifies dissection but it has been appropriated to the study and knowledge of the number shape situation structure and connection in a word of all the apparent properties of organized matter whether animal or vegetable anatomical relating or belonging to anatomy analogous from the greek ana between and logos reason having some resemblance or relation though differing in essential particulars similar angle from the latin angulus which is derived from the greek angulus a curve the space intercepted between two lines that meet at a point the facial angle is formed by two lines one of which passes vertically along the face from the incisor teeth and the other is drawn horizontally from the external opening of the ear to the same teeth anglicus latin english animal from the latin animalis a name given to every animated being provided with digestive organs animalia latin animals animalcule from the latin animalculum a diminutive animal animalcula plural of animalculum animals that are only perceptible by means of the microscope annelids a class of animals without vertebrae annulated from the latin annulus a ring marked in rings anomaly greek a privative and omalos equal irregularity deviation from the common rule antler from the french andouillet properly the first branch of a stag's horns but it is applied to all the branches anus latin the fundament the inferior opening of the bowels apoplexy from the greek apo from and pliso i strike a disease of the brain an obstruction of the nervous principle which deprives the body suddenly of sensation and motion apparatus latin ad for and parare to prepare a collection of instruments or organs for any operation whatever an assemblage of organs appendix latin ad to and pendere to hang something added any part that adheres to an organ or is continuous with it aquaticus latin aquatic relating or belonging to water archipelago from the greek archi beginning and pelagos sea an extent of sea sprinkled with islands arctos greek a bear arctomis from the greek arctos a bear and mis a mouse the marmot see page eighty argali a wild ram arius latin a ram armadillo spanish diminutive of armado armed see page ninety four the brazilian name of this animal is tattoo arvalis latin relating or belonging to fields arvicola latin arvum a field and colere to cultivate see page eighty three articulate from the latin articulus which is a diminutive of artus a limb which is derived from the greek arthron a joint to join or joined to form words to utter articulata the same derivation as articulate animals whose bodies seem to consist of a series of succession of rings they constitute the third branch of the animal kingdom which includes insects crustacea worms etc articulation a joint asinus latin an ass atelis a kind of monkey see page forty athenians who were exempt from certain taxes were called atelis aukenia from the greek auken the neck the genus of animals to which the llama belongs is so called probably from having a long neck aureus latin golden relating or belonging to gold oracle from the latin auricula 
which is the diminutive of auris, a ear. The two oracles of the heart derive the name from their resemblance to ears. They receive the blood from every part of the body. The two venae cavae open into the right oracle, and four pulmonary veins into the left oracle. See First Book of Natural History, page 35. Auroch, a sort of wild bull. See page 119. Avellanarius, from the Latin Avellana, a filbert, relating or belonging to filberts. See page 81. Aviculatis, from the Latin avicula, which is the diminutive of avis, a bird relating or belonging to birds. Bactrianus, Latin, Bactrian, relating or belonging to Bactria. Balen, from the Latin balena, which is derived from the Greek phalena, a whale. Whale bone, the substance put into ladies' corsets and used to form part of the frame of an umbrella. Balena, Latin, a whale. Baptismal, from the Greek bapto, I plunge into water, relating or belonging to baptism. The name given at the ceremonial baptism is the baptismal or Christian name. Basques, the inhabitants of Biscay, a province of Spain, are so called. Bezoar, from the Persian Bezaha, antidote, a stone formed in the bodies of certain animals to which Arabian physicians have attributed great virtues, chiefly that of resisting the effects of poison, an ancient chemical preparation to which the same properties were attributed. Mineral bazaar, an oxide of antimony. Vegetable bazaar, a stony concretion found in cocoa trees. The word is also applied to other natural stony concretions. Bilobed from the Latin bis, twice, and the Greek lobos, a lobe, having two lobes. By mana, from the Latin bis, twice, and manus, hand, the first family of the class of mammalia. Biped, from the Latin bis, twice, and pes, foot, animals that walk on two feet are biped. Blubber, that part of a whale from which the oil is obtained. Borealis, Latin, Northern. Bos, Latin, an ox, a bull. Bradipus, from the Greek bradis, slow, and pus, foot, the sloth. See page 93. Branch, from the word branca, which is derived from the Latin brachium, an arm. The branches of trees were viewed as their arms. Any member or part of the whole, any section or subdivision. The first division of the animal kingdom is into branches. See page 16. Branchiae, Latin. It is derived from the Greek branchos, the throat, the gills of fishes. They are the respiratory organs of fishes and are very different from lungs, both in their form and structure. Bubalus, Latin, an animal of the genus ox, see page 120. Buffalo, probably derived from the Greek bubalos, the root of which is bus, an ox. Cachalot, French, the spermaceti whale, see page 128. Cayette, French, a name of the fourth stomach of ruminating animals, derived from caille, to cardle. The fourth stomach of a calf is used under the name of rennet for the purpose of cardling or coagulating milk. Callosity, hardness, induration, and thickness of the skin. Callus, from the Latin collus, hardness, that which is hard or indurated. Camelopardalis, from the Greek camelos, a camel, and pardalis, a leopard, the ancient name of the giraffe. Camelus, Latin, camel. Campagnol, French name of the field mouse. Canine, from the Latin canis, a dog, the name of certain teeth. Canis, Latin, dog. Capra, Latin, goat. Carnaria, from the Latin caro, carnis, flesh, the name of an order of animals. 
carnivorous, from the Latin caro, carnis, flesh, and voro, i.e. eat. Animals that feed on flesh are said to be carnivorous. Carnivora, Latin, carnivorous. Castor, Latin, beaver. Castoreum, a substance obtained from the beaver. Catus, Latin, sharp, quick, sly. Caudal, from the Latin cauda, a tail, relating or belonging to the tail. Cephalopoda, from the Greek kephale, head, and podos, which is the genitive case of pus, a foot. Molluscous animals whose mouth is surrounded with fleshy appendices which serve them as feet. Cereal, relating or belonging to Ceres, the goddess of agriculture. Cereal is applied to the various sorts of nutritious corn or grain. Cervical, from the Latin cervix, the neck, belonging or relating to the neck. Cervus, Latin, a stag. Cetacea, in Latin, cetacheus, which is formed from the Greek ketos, a whale. Naturalists use the word to designate pisciform mammals that have fins in place of feet and inhabit the sea. See page 122. Shami, from the Greek chemas, a roebuck, a ruminating animal of the genus of antelope. Chanfrin, from the Latin camus, a bit or curb, and frenum, a bridle that part of the head of a horse which is between the brows from the ears to the nose. Chiroptera, from the Greek kir, hand, and pteron, wing, having winged hands, name of a family of mammals vulgarly called bats. Cinerea, Latin, like ashes, of an ash color. Civeta, Latin, civet, the word is derived from the Arabic zebet or zobat, froth, or the peculiar secretion of the civet. See page 66. Class. In Latin, classis, which comes from the Greek klesis, which is derived from kaleo, I call, the order according to which persons or things are arranged or distributed. Classification. The act of forming classes. Clavicle. From the Latin clavis, a key. The color bone. Con color, Latin, of the same color. Condyle, from the Greek condylos, a knot, an eminence, a joint, a small round eminence of bone entering into the composition of an articulation. Contorted, from the Latin contorqueo, I twist about, twisted. Convolution, from the Latin convolvere, to entwine. The cerebral convolutions are the round, tortuous projections observed on the surface of the brain. Cortical, from the Latin cortex, bark, belonging or relating to bark. Cranium, from the Greek cranon, head, the skull. Cricetus, Latin name of the hamster. Cristata, Latin, tufted, combed, crested, wearing a crest. Crustacea, from the Latin crusta, a crust, a class of animals whose bodies are enclosed in a covering like the crab. Cuniculus, Latin, a rabbit. Cynocephalus, from the Greek kion, a dog, and kephale, head, a species of monkey, so called, because its head resembles that of a dog. It is the baboon of the moderns. Dama, Latin, a fallow deer. Danicus, Latin, Danish, belonging to Denmark. Dasipus, from the Greek dasis, thick, hairy, and pus, foot, hairy foot. Deciduous, from the Latin cadere, to fall, falling, that which falls off, not permanent. Decumanus, Latin, tenth. Huge, fair, of a large size. Delphinus, Latin, a dolphin. Delphis, 
the name of a priestess of the temple of Delphos, which Linnaeus gave to an animal of the order of Cetacea. Dental, from the Latin dens, a tooth, relating or belonging to the teeth. Denticulate, having the edge or border like teeth, armed with teeth. Derma, Greek, the skin. Didelphis, from the Greek dis, twice, or double, and Delphus, a womb, the name of a genus of the order of marsupialia. Digitigrada, from the Latin digitus, a finger or toe, and gradus, a step, name of a tribe of animals that in walking rest only their toes on the ground. Digitigrade, animals that walk on the toes without resting the whole foot on the ground. Diurnal, from the Latin dies, a day, belonging or relating to the day. Doe, a she-deer. Domesticus, Latin, domestic. Dorcas, Greek, a gazelle. Dormouse, from the Latin dormire, to sleep, and miss, a mouse. See page 80. Dorsal, from the Latin dorsum, the back belonging or relating to the back. Down, from the Danish dune, soft wool or tender hair, fur, soft feathers. Dromedarius, barbarous Latin, formed from the Greek dromos, a race, speed. The dromedary, a species of camel with one hump, is thus named from its swiftness. End of glossary A to D Glossary E through M. Echidna, from the Greek, a viper or snake, the name of a monster, the upper part of whose body was in the form of a beautiful woman, and the lower part like that of a hideous serpent, the name of a genus of animals of unusual construction. Echinodermata, from the Greek, echinos, a hedgehog, and derma, skin, animals whose skin is like that of the hedgehog. And dentata, from the Latin, a, privative, and dens, tooth, without teeth, the name of an order of mammiferous animals that are without teeth, and dentate, without teeth, elephus, Latin, an elephant, elephus, Latin, belonging or relating to an elephant, enamel, of the teeth, the substance which covers the crowns of the teeth, it is of a white color, very smooth and polished, and sufficiently hard to strike fire and steel. Enamel is thickest where the teeth are in contact, and thinnest about the neck of the tooth. The fibers of the enamel are perpendicular to the surface of the teeth, on which they seem, as it were, planted. This gives them a velvety appearance when examined by the microscope. The enamel has no blood vessels and is not renewed when removed. Encephalon. From the Greek, egg in and kephala head the brain and spinal marrow entellus a latin name of an ape or guenon of malabar epidermis from the greek epi upon and derma skin the external covering of the derma the cuticle or scarf skin epidermic relating or belonging to the epidermis ephemeral from the greek epi in and emera a day lasting but a day, fleeting, transient, momentary. Equus, Latin, a horse. Erinaceus, Latin, hedgehog. Erminea, Latin, belonging or relating to the ermine. Espalier, French, from the Italian spaliere, trees which are attached to and supported by a wall in a row. Excretion, from the Latin, excrenare to separate the separation or throwing off of those matters from the body of an animal which are supposed to be useless as perspiration etc the matters thrown off from the body as useless are termed excretions excretory belonging or relating to excretion exotic from the greek exotikes strange foreign extremities from the latin extremus extreme the end of a thing the limb the legs and arms Extrarius, Latin, outward, foreign, strange. 
extensors from the latin extendare to stretch out the muscles whose office it is to extend certain parts facial from the latin facius the face belonging or relating to the face facial angle see angle familiaris latin familiar belonging or relating to a family domestic family from the latin familia family all those of the same blood children brothers parents etc the assemblage of several genera of animals that resemble each other in many respects fawn the young deer phallus latin a cat felt a sort of cloth made of wool or fur united without weaving the fabric or foundation of hats fiber latin a beaver fiber from the latin fibra an organic filament of solid consistence and more or less extensible which enters into the composition of every animal and vegetable texture fibrous composed of fibers fibrocartilaginous of the nature of fibrocartilage which is an organic tissue partaking of the nature of fibrous tissue and of that of cartilage it is dense resisting elastic firm supple and flexible filament from the latin filamentum a small thread filiform from the latin filum a thread and formus form having the shape of a thread flex from the latin flectere to bend flexor a muscle whose office it is to bed certain parts foina from the latin fuscina which is formed from fuscus brown the name of a species of martin foliaceous from the latin folium a leaf consisting of laminae or leaves follicle from the latin folliculus which is the diminutive of folis a bag a diminutive glandular sac or bag foramen latin a hole from foro i pierce a cavity pierced through and through also the orifice of a canal foramina the plural of foramen fossa in the plural fasse from the latin fodio i dig a cavity of greater or less depth the entrance to which is always larger than the base the nasal fossae are two large cavities situate between the orbits below the cranium and lined by the pituitary or schneiderian membrane the internal nostrils fricator latin a rubber frugivora from the latin fruges all kinds of fruit serving for food that the earth brings forth and vorare to eat animals that feed exclusively on vegetable substances frugivorous fruit eating animals that feed exclusively on vegetable substances are frugivorous fur soft hair of beasts skin with soft hair with which garments are lined for warmth or covered for ornament see down function from the latin fungor i act or discharge an office the action of an organ or system of organs. Furo, barbarous Latin, formed from fervus, dark, black, dusky, a name given to a species of martin on account of its habit of seeking game in dark holes or burrows. Galeopithecus, from the Greek gale, a weasel, and pithecos, a monkey, the name of a tribe of animals. Gallicus, Latin, galia, French ganglion from the greek goglion a knot nervous ganglions are enlargements or knots in the course of a nerve gastropoda from the greek gaster belly and pus foot name of a genus of molluscous animals that crawl by means of the inferior surface of the body gazelle or gazelle from the arabic al gazal gazelle a species of antelope genus latin a kindred breed, race, stock, lineage, or family. Genera, plural of genus. Generic, belonging or relating to genus. Georicus, from the Greek, G, the earth, and oruso, I dig, the lemming. Glacial, from the Latin, glaciers, ice, belonging or relating to ice. 
Gladiator. Latin, a sword player. A fencer, a swordsman. Gleese. Latin, dormouse. Grais. Latin, Grecian. Grampus. From the French, grand poisson, big fish. Pronounced by the Normans, grepois, whence the English word grampus. An animal of an order of cetacea. Grunians. Latin, grunting like a hog. Gwenon. French, an ape. Gulo. Barbarous Latin, the glutton. Halicor. From the Greek, als, the sea, and core, a maiden. A sea nymph, a mermaid. Halmatorus. From the Greek, alma, a leap, and ura, a tail. The kangaroo was so called from leaping by the aid of its tail. Hemisphere. From the Greek, emesis, half, and sphira, a sphere or globe. One half of a sphere or globe, or globular body. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. Herbaceous. From the Latin, herba, an herb, belonging to herbs. Herbivora. Latin, herbivorous. Herbivorous. From the Latin, herba, herb or plant, and vorare, to eat. Herb eating. Animals that feed chiefly or entirely on herbs or plants are called herbivorous hibernate from the latin hibernare to winter to be in winter quarters animals that retire and sleep throughout the winter are said to hibernate hibernation the act of hibernating being in winter quarters hind a female deer hippopotamus from the greek hippos a horse and potamos, a river, the river horse. Hercus, Latin, a he goat. Humerus, the bone of the arm which is situate between the shoulder joint and the elbow. Hyoid, from the Greek, u, and eidos, resemblance, resembling the shape or form of the letter u. The os hyoides, the hyoid bone, is a very movable bony arch placed horizontally in the substance of the soft parts of the neck at the root of the tongue it does not articulate with any other bone of the skeleton and is only connected to it through the medium of muscles and ligaments hypsy primness from the greek ipsy high and prumnos behind extreme the potoru hystrix from the greek ustrix which is formed of us a hog and thris a bristle the porcupine Incnumen, from the Greek, ichnuo, I pursue, I follow in the track, the mongoose, or pharaoh's rat. Incisor, from the Latin, incido, I cut, the teeth which occupy the anterior part of the upper and lower jaws are called incisors, or incisor teeth, because they are used for cutting the food in the manner of cutting instruments. Index indicator from the latin indicare to point out to indicate the forefinger the index finger indicus latin indian insectivora latin insectivorous insectivorous from the latin insecta insects and vorare to eat insect eating animals that feed on insects are insectivorous Integument, from the Latin, tegare, to cover, the skin. Innuus, one of the names of Pan, the heathen god of shepherds and of flocks. The Barbary ape has received this name. Ischiatic, from the Greek, ischion, the haunch, belonging or relating to the haunch. Nobber, the name of a young stag, when the first rudiments of the horns appear, in the form of a tubercle, or knob. Labyrinth, from the Latin labyrinthus, which is formed from the Greek labyrinthos, a place full of turnings, the exit of which is not easily discoverable. Anatomists have given this name to the aggregate of parts constituting the internal ear. Lacerta, Latin, a lizard. Lamantin, from the barbarous Latin manatus, which is formed from manus, a hand. An animal of the order of Cetacea. 
Lamina, Latin, a plate or thin piece of metal or bone. Lamine, Latin, plural of lamina. Laminar, composed of laminae. Lamella, Latin, a little thin plate or piece. Lamellae, Latin, plural of lamella. Lamellar, composed of lamellae. Lanigera, Latin, lanigerous. Lanigerous, from the Latin lana, wool, and gere, to bear, wool bearing. Larva, Latin, a mask. An insect, after it has left the egg, and before it assumes the form of a chrysalis, is called a larva, because in this state it is, as it were, masked. Larvae, the plural of larva. Larnix, from the Greek larux, a whistle, the apparatus of voice. It is situate at the superior and anterior part of the neck, and at the top of the trachea, with which it communicates. Latitude, from the Latin latitudo, breadth the extent of the earth reckoned from the equator to either pole latitude is measured by degrees and minutes the latitude of any place is its distance from the equator towards either pole lemus barbarous latin a lemming lemur barbarous latin a name given to mammalia of the family of macus and some others leo latin a lion Lepus, Latin, a hare. Lethargy, from the Greek, letha, forgetfulness, and argos, prompt, a profound and unnatural stupor, which deprives the individual of the use of his senses, insensibility or indifference to everything. Lethargic, belonging or relating to lethargy. Ligament, from the Latin ligare, to tie a name given to fibrous structures which serve to unite bones and form articulations line a rope or cord the tenth part of an inch litter a brood of young loris the name of a kind of monkey lungs the organs of respiration in mammiferous animals vulgarly called the lights lupus latin a wolf lutra Latin and otter. Macacus, barbarous Latin, macaque. Macaque, French, the macaco, a species of ape with a tail. Macrocephalus, from the Greek macros, long, big, and kephala, head, long or big head, a name of the spermaceti whale. Majo, French, baboon. Mama, Latin, the breast, pap, or teat. Mame, plural of mama. Mammal, any animal having teats for suckling its young is called a mammal. Mammalia, from mama, a breast, animals that suckle their young. Mammalogy, from the Latin mama, breast, and the Greek logos, discourse or treaty, that part of natural history which treats of the mammiferous animals. Mammary, from the Latin mamma, a breast, belonging or relating to the breast. Mammiferae, from the Latin mamma, a breast, and ferro, I carry, animals that have teats. Mammiferous, belonging or relating to the mammiferae. Mammoth, an extinct animal of the family of Proboscidiana. Manatus, barbarous Latin, formed from manos, a hand, the lamantin. Manatee, plural of manatus. Maniplies, the third stomach of ruminating animals. Maritimus, Latin, maritime, relating to the sea. Marsupialia, from the Latin marsupium, a purse, pouch, or bag. Animals that have on the anterior surface of the body a pouch formed from the skin for the accommodation of their young. Marsupials, animals provided with pouches for the accommodation of their young. Martes, Latin, a marten, a ferret. Mastication, from the Greek, masticao, I chew, the act of chewing food, to impregnate it with saliva, and prepare it for the digestion which it has to undergo in the stomach. Mastivus, barbarous Latin, formed from the Italian, mastino, a large dog the mastiff 
Mastodon, an extinct animal of the family of Proboscidiana. Maxillary, from the Latin maxilia, a jaw, belonging or relating to the jaws. Meles, Latin, a badger. Membrana, Latin, a membrane. Membrane, a name given to different thin organs, representing species of supple, more or less elastic webs. Membranous, belonging to membrane. Mephitis, Latin, a stink, an unpleasant smell, a name given to the skunk on account of its odor. Merino, Spanish, wandering or removing from pasture to pasture, the name of a kind of sheep with very fine wool, originally from Spain. Metacarpus, from the Greek meta, after, and karpos, the wrist, that part of the hand which is between the wrist and fingers. Metatarsus, from the Greek meta, after, and tarsos, the instep, that part of the foot which is between the instep and toes. Molar, from the Greek mulos, a millstone or grindstone, or from the Latin molo, I grind, that which bruises or grinds, the name of certain teeth. Molar teeth, the grinders, jaw teeth. Mollusca, from the Latin molis, soft, a class of marine animals without vertebrae, which have blood vessels, a spinal marrow, and simple body, without articulated limbs. Molluscus, relating to mollusca. Mollusus, barbarous Latin, a species of large dog. Maniliform, from the Latin monile, a necklace, and forma, shape, form, in the form of a necklace or string of beads. Monodon, from the Greek monos, single, and odus, odontos, a tooth, the name of the narwhal, from having a single tusk. Monosyllabic, from the Greek monos, single, and syllabe, a syllable, consisting of but one syllable. Monotremata, from the Greek monos, single, and trema, a perforation or hole, the name of a family of animals found in New Holland. Montanus, Latin, mountainous, relating to mountains. Mosaic, from the Greek musion, musion, and mosion, which signify the same thing in Greek of the Middle Ages as a museum opus of the Latins, a museum, a place designed for study. Some add that it is because cabinets or museums were ornamented at first with works of this kind, a work in which, by means of small stones and little pieces of differently colored glass, figures or even entire pictures are represented. Moscus, barbarous Latin, formed from the Arabic mosque, musk. Moscatus, barbarous Latin, belonging or relating to musk, perfumed with musk. Moscivarus, Latin, from moscus and ferro i bear musk bearing motive from the latin moveo i move that which excites motion motor from the latin moveo i move that which causes motion a mover mulo french a sort of field mouse mousse latin a mouse musculus latin a little mouse Musk, an animal substance of a very diffusible odor, bitter taste, and deep brown color. It is used as a medicine and perfume. The name of an animal. Mustella, Latin, a weasel. Muzzle, that part of the head of the dog and certain other animals which comprises the mouth and nose. Myoxus, from the Greek mus, a mouse, and oxus, sharp pointed, a rat with a pointed nose. Myrmecophaga, from the Greek, myrmix, an ant, and phago, I eat, ant eaters. Mysticetus, from the Greek, mustus, a nose, and keti, a bristle, a name given to a species of cetacea that has a whalebone. End of section 16. Glossary N to Z. Naris, Latin, the nostrils. Nasal, from the Latin nasus, a nose, belonging or relating to the nose. Nasal fossa, C fossa. Natation, from the Latin natatio, swimming, 
the act of swimming or supporting oneself or moving upon the water. Nictitans, Latin, winking. The membrana nictitans is a sort of internal eyelid found in many mammals. Nitella, Latin, a sort of field mouse. Nocturnal, from the Latin nox, the night, belonging or relating to the night. Nocturnal animals are those which sleep during the day and are active only in the night. Occiput, the back part of the head, the hind head in opposition to the forehead. Occipital, relating or belonging to the occiput. Ocellata, from the Latin oculus, an eye, having marks of an eye. Odoriferous, from the Latin odor, a scent, and ferro, I bear, sand or odor bearing. Esophagus, from the Greek, iso, I carry, and phagin, to eat, the gullet, the membranous canal which conveys food from the mouth to the stomach. Olfactory, from the Latin olfactus, the smell, belonging or relating to smell. Omasum, Latin, the many plies or third stomach of ruminants. Omnivorous, from the Latin omnis, all, and vorare, to eat, applied to animals that eat all kinds of food, both animal and vegetable. Onaga, probably from the Greek onos, an ass, and agrios, wild, the mountain horse, or a wild ass. Order, an arrangement, disposition. Ordinaria, Latin, ordinary, common. Orillard, French, having long ears, the name of a kind of bat. Organ, from the Greek organon, an instrument, part of an organized being, destined to exercise some particular function. For example, the ears are the organs of hearing, the muscles are organs of motion, and so on. Organic, relating to an organ, composed of organs. Organization, the mode or manner of structure of an organized being. Ornithology, from the Greek ornis, in the genitive case ornithos, a bird, and logos, a discourse, the natural history of birds. Ornithorhynchus, from the Greek ornis, ornithos, a bird, and rhynchos, a beak or muzzle, the name of an animal. See page 96. Orangutan, from the Malay orang, a reasonable being, a man, and utang, wild, the wild man. Oviparous, from the Latin ovum, an egg, and parere, to bring forth. Animals that multiply by means of eggs are oviparous. Ovis, Latin, a sheep. Pachydermata, from the Greek pachys, thick, and derma, skin. The name of a family of animals. Palmar, from the Latin palma, the palm, belonging or relating to the palm of the hand. Palmate, having the toes united by a membrane. Papilla, Latin, a nipple, a name given to small eminences which appear to be formed by the ultimate expansion of the vessels and nerves. Papille, plural of papilla. Parachute, from the Greek para, against, and the French chute, a fall. A machine, somewhat in the form of the top of an umbrella, used to moderate the descent of those who ascend in balloons and guarantee them against the effects of a sudden fall. Paradoxus, Latin, strange, wonderful, unusual. Parasite, from the Greek para, near, and citos, corn, one who is near the food, a hanger-on. Pardus, Latin, a panther. Parietes, from the Latin parius, a wall, a name given to parts which form the enclosure, the limits of different cavities of the body. Parietal, protuberances, the eminences in the middle part of the parietal bones, which form the upper and lateral parts of the head. Paunch, the first stomach of ruminants. Pedimana, from the Latin pes, pedis, a foot, and manus, a hand, a family of mammals that have a thumb on the hind feet which fits them to perform the office of hands. Pegasus, in Greek, Pegasus, 
formed from piggy a fountain the celebrated winged horse of the poets which by a single kick caused the fountain of hippocrene to gush forth on mount helicon the genius of poetic inspiration peltry from the latin pelis a skin a hide a name given to designate all kinds of skins collectively that are dressed with the hair and fur upon them pelvis latin a basin the name of the bony structure at the lower part of the trunk which forms the inferior boundary of the abdomen gives support or place a foundation to the spinal column and affords points of articulation for the thigh bones constituting the hip joint pemmican the name given by certain north american indians to the muscular fibre of beasts after it has been dried and powdered without the addition of any salt this article has the quality of remaining good and fresh for a long time and is used by voyagers and travellers as a convenient article of diet forming when boiled in water a fresh nutritious soup the best pemmican is made of the flesh of the buffalo the flesh of the musk ox is also prepared in this way pendant or pendant from the latin pendo i hang hanging petrus from the greek petra a rock a stone a part of the temporal bone which contains the internal organs of hearing is so called from resembling a stone in hardness phalanges the plural of phalanx phalanx from the greek phalanx a file of soldiers the bones composing the fingers and toes they are named first second and third phalanges phalanger the name of an animal which is remarkable for the singular conformation of its phalanges see page seventy four phalangista latin phalangers pharaonis latin relating or belonging to pharaoh pharynx from the greek pharynx the pharynx the swallow the superior opening of the esophagus phasolomys from the greek phasolos a pouch the name of a genus of marsupials phoca latin a seal phasina the systematic name of porpoises thesis from the greek theo i dry up i waste away usually applied to consumption or wasting away from a particular diseased condition of the lungs philostoma from the greek philon a leaf and stoma a mouth the name of a kind of bat see page forty five physita from the greek physao i blow the name of a kind of whale pisciform from the latin piscis a fish and forma form of the shape or form of a fish pipistrellus the name of a kind of bat plantigrada plantigrade animals plantigrade from the latin planta the sole of the foot and gradi to walk applied to certain mammiferous animals that in walking rest the entire sole upon the ground polyp from the greek polis many and pus foot a sort of aquatic animal whose membranous and tubular body is terminated by many filaments which serve it both as feet and arms for seizing its prey polypus latin polyp polypi plural of polypus pomeranus latin relating or belonging to pomerania a province of prussia porcupine from the latin porcus a hog and spicatus from spica a head of weed a spine an animal resembling a hog with a skin armed with spines pork epic french a porcupine porcellus latin the diminutive of porcus a hog a pig porpoise from the latin porcus a hog and piscis a fish hogfish prehensile from the latin prendere to lay hold of the prehension of aliment consists in laying hold of and conveying food into the mouth proboscidian from the greek proboscis a proboscis or trang the name applied to animals of the family that includes the elephant proboscidiana the name of the family of animals that includes the elephant process 
a natural eminence or projection of bone. Procyon, Latin, a raccoon. Progression, from the Latin progressio, which is formed from pro, before, and gradus, a pace or step. A movement in advance, a going forward. The movement of progression is peculiar to animals. Salterium, a name of the third stomach of ruminants. Pteromis, from the Greek pteron, a wing, and mis, a mouse. The systematic name of the flying squirrels. Pulmonary, belonging or relating to the lungs. Putorius, Latin, from putor, a sting. The systematic name of the polecat. Quadrumana, from the Latin quadrinus, formed from quator, four, and manus, hand. The name of the order of mammals that possess four hands. Quadruped, from the Latin quadrinus and pes, a foot, having four feet. Radiata, from the Latin radius, a spoke, the name given to the fourth branch of the animal kingdom on account of their configuration. Ramuscule, from the Latin ramus, a branch, a diminutive branch. Ratus, barbarous Latin, a rat. Recurved, bent backward. Regimen, from the Latin regere, to govern, the rational and methodical use of food and of everything essential to life, both in a state of health and disease. It is often restricted in its meaning to diet. Regurgitate, from the Latin re, again, and gurgis, a gulf, whirlpool, or stream, to throw back. The word is used to describe the return of food to the mouth in ruminants after it has been once swallowed. Regurgitation, the act of throwing back into the mouth food that has been swallowed. Rennet, the fourth stomach of ruminants. When the fourth stomach of the calf is salted and dried, it possesses the property of coagulating milk, when a portion of it is soaked in water and the infusion is added to the milk. Reptile, from the Latin repere, to crawl. An animal that crawls, that draws itself along on its belly, like worms and serpents. By extension, an animal that has feet so short that it seems to crawl rather than walk. Respiration, from the Latin respiro, I take breath. A function proper to animals, the object of which is to place the materials of the blood in contact with atmospheric air, in order that it may acquire the vivifying qualities that belong to arterial blood. Reticulum, the second stomach of ruminants. Rhinoceros, from the Greek rhin, a nose, in the genitive rhinos, and keras, a horn, the name of an animal from its having a horn on the nose. Rhinolophus, from the Greek rhin, in the genitive rhinos, a nose, and lophos, a tuft or crest, the name of a kind of bat. Redans, a word employed to designate the refuse matter thrown out by animals in digging their burrows, the matter thrown out or delivered by a saw, in its passage through any substance, may perhaps be thus designated. Rodentia, from the Latin rodere, to gnaw, the systematic name of an order of mammals. Rumen, the paunch or first stomach of ruminants. Ruminate, to chew the cud. Rumination, from the Latin ruminatio, the act of chewing the cud. Ruminant, an animal that chews the cud. Ruminantia, the systematic name of animals that ruminate. Rupicapra, from the Latin rupus, a rock, and capra, a goat, the systematic name of the chamois. Saguin, French, a marmoset, a sort of monkey. All American monkeys whose tails are not prehensile are so called. Sajou, French, a species of marmoset. Saki, a sort of monkey. Saliva, formed from the Latin sal salt, spittle, an inodorous, transparent, slightly viscid fluid, which is secreted by several glands and poured into the mouth through their respective ducts. It consists of water, mucus, a particular animal matter, and salts of soda and potash. Its use is to assist in the process of digestion by mixing with the alimentary bowl during mastication. Salivary, belonging or relating to saliva. Sapajou, French, a species of monkey. Sarig, French, an opossum. Soria, from the Greek sauros, a lizard, 
the name of an order of reptiles with long scaly bodies and long tails resembling a lizard scapula the shoulder blade sciurus latin a squirrel scrofa or scrofa latin a sow semnopithecus from the greek semnos venerable and pithecus a monkey see page thirty eight serotinus latin belonging or relating to the evening simia latin a monkey sinuous relating or belonging to a sinus partaking of the nature of a sinus sinus any cavity the interior of which is more expanded than the entrance siren or siren from the greek syra a chain from the supposed strength of its charms a fabulous monster skeleton from the greek skelo i dry the aggregate of the hard parts of the body or the bones soliped from the latin solidipes which is formed from solidus solid and pes a foot the term is applied to those animals that have but one hoof on each foot as the horse sorex latin a shrew or field rat spalax the name of a species of rodentia specific relating or belonging to species spiracle from the latin spirare to breathe the breathing hole or nostril of the cetacea sternum the breastbone sus latin a hog a sow surmulo french name of a kind of large rat sylvaticus latin sylvan wild synopsis from the greek sin with together and optome i see that which is seen at a glance or at one view synoptical belonging or relating to a synopsis partaking of the nature of a synopsis talpa latin a mole tarandus barbarous latin formed from tarande a name of the reindeer tardigrada from the latin tardus slow and gradus a step the systematic name of the sloths tardigrade same derivation as the above slow stepping tarsus from the greek tarsos any row the sole of the foot the posterior part of the foot which in man consists of seven bones and forms the heel and instep taurus latin a bull tegumentary from the latin tegumen a covering belonging or relating to the tegument or skin temporal from the latin tempus time the temple so called it is said because on this part the hair begins to turn white and indicate age belonging or relating to the temples the temporal bone is placed at the lateral and lower part of the skull of which it forms a part and contains within it the organs essential to the sense of hearing tendon from the greek tino i stretch strong white fibrous cords which connect the muscles to the bones which they move the tendons may be considered as so many cords for transmitting the motion of the muscles to the bones or livers tendinous belonging to or partaking of the nature of tendon termites the name of a species of insect white ants terrarius barbarous latin a terrier dog terra nova latin name of newfoundland thorax from the greek thorax the chest it is bounded posteriorly by the vertebrae laterally by the ribs and scapula anteriorly by the sternum above by the clavicle and below by the diaphragm it is destined to lodge and protect the chief organs of respiration and circulation the lungs and heart tigris latin a tiger timidus latin timid trachea from the greek trachus rough and arteria an artery which is formed from aer air and tyrin to keep the canal which conveys the air to the lungs the windpipe trenchant cutting trichecus barbarous latin formed from the greek trix hair systematic name of the moors tridactylus from the greek tris three and dactylos a finger three fingered tripod from the greek tris three and pus a foot having three feet triton from the greek tris three 
and tonus a tome the name of a fabulous god that accompanied neptune blowing a shell as a trumpet most sea gods are called tritons and are generally represented in the act of blowing shells trunk the body without including the head or extremities the proboscis of an elephant truncated cut short cut abruptly or square off tubercle from the latin tuber a knot a small knot or projection anguiculata from the latin unguis a fingernail animals that have small nails on their fingers or toes anguiculate having small nails angulata animals having large nails or hoofs angulate having hoofs unicorn from the latin unus one and cornu a horn having one horn the name of a fabulous animal ursus latin a bear urus latin a buffalo ventricle from the latin ventriculus a little belly formed from venter a belly a name given in anatomy to various parts vermiform from the latin vermis a worm and forma form worm shaped an epithet applied to certain carnivorous animals on account of their ability to pass through narrow openings vertagus latin name of a particular kind of dog vertebra from the latin vertere to turn this name has been given to each of the bones which by their union form the vertebral or spinal column vulgarly called the backbone vertebrae the plural of vertebra vertebral belonging or relating to vertebrae vertebrata animals that possess vertebrae the first branch of the animal kingdom see page eighteen vertex latin the top or crown of the head vespertilio latin a bat vetch a kind of bean vicuna barbarous latin a vicuna virginiana latin belonging to virginia viridis latin green vivera latin a ferret viviparis from the latin vivus alive and pario i bring forth animals whose young are born without being hatched are said to be viviparis vulgaris latin common vulpes latin a fox when a kind of tumor withers the joining of the shoulder bones at the bottom of the neck and mane towards the upper part of the shoulder zibelina modern latin relating to the sable zoological belonging or relating to zoology zoology from the greek zoon an animal and logos a discourse that part of natural history which treats of animals zoologist one devoted to the study of zoology zoophyte from the greek zoon an animal and phyton a plant an animal without vertebrae or extremities that attaches itself to solid bodies and seems to live and vegetate like a plant end of glossary and to z end of the elements of mammalogy by william rushenberger